Section Zero of Mark Twain's Autobiography, with an introduction by Albert Bigelow Payne, Volume One, read by John Greenman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mark Twain's Autobiography, Volume One, introduction by Albert Bigelow Payne, and preface by Mark Twain. Early fragments. 1870 to 1877. Note, the various divisions and chapters of this work, in accordance with the author's wish, are arranged in the order in which they were written, regardless of the chronology of events. I will construct a text. What a wee little part of a person's life are his acts and his words. His real life is led in his head, and is known to none but himself. All day long, and every day, the mill of his brain is grinding, and his thoughts, not those other things, are his history. His acts and his words are merely the visible, thin crust of his world, with its scattered snow summits and its vacant wastes of water, and they are so trifling a part of his bulk, a mere skin enveloping it. The mass of him is hidden. It and its volcanic fires that toss and boil and never rest, night nor day. These are his life, and they are not written, and cannot be written. Every day would make a whole book of eighty thousand words, three hundred and sixty-five books a year. Biographies are but the clothes and buttons of the man, the biography of the man himself, cannot be written. M. T. Introduction Mark Twain had been a celebrity for a good many years before he could be persuaded to regard himself as anything more than an accident, a news writer to whom distinction had come as a matter of good fortune rather than as a tribute to genius. Sooner or later his vein would be worked out, when he would of necessity embark in other pursuits. He had already owned a newspaper, and experimented, more or less casually and unfortunately, with a variety of other enterprises, when, in 1884, he capitalized a publishing concern, primarily to produce his own works, but not without a view to the establishment of something more dependable than authorship. It probably never occurred to him during those years that he had achieved anything like a permanent place in literary history. If the idea of an autobiography had intruded itself now and then, it had not seriously troubled him. Note, most of Mark Twain's work up to this time, Roughing It, Tom Sawyer, Life on the Mississippi, etc., had been of an autobiographical nature. Also, as early as 1870, he had jotted down an occasional reminiscent chapter for possible publication, though apparently with no idea of a continuous narrative. Such of these chapters as have survived are included in Volume I of the present work, ABP. But a year later, when the publication by his firm of The Memoirs of General U. S. Grant brought him into daily association with the dying conqueror, the thought came that the story of this episode might be worthy of preservation. It was not, for the present at least, to be an autobiography, but no more than a few chapters built around a great historic figure. General Grant's own difficulties in setting down his memories suggested prompt action. Mark Twain's former lecture agent, James Redpath, was visiting him at this time, and with a knowledge of shorthand became his amanuensis. The work they did together was considerable, covering in detail the story of the Grant publishing venture. Clemens may have planned other chapters of a personal sort, but, unaccustomed to dictation, he found the work tedious, with a result, as it seemed to him, unsatisfactory. A number of important things happened to Mark Twain during the next dozen years, among them his business failure, which left him with a load of debt, dependent entirely upon authorship and the lecture platform for rehabilitation and support. 
the story of his splendid victory the payment to the last dollar of his indebtedness has been widely told he was in vienna when he completed this triumph and whatever he had been before he was now unquestionably a world figure with a recognized place in history realization of this may have prompted him to begin during those busy vienna winters eighteen ninety seven to eighteen ninety nine something in the nature of an autobiography recollections of his missouri childhood a picture as primitive and far removed from today as anything of the colonial period these chapters were handwritten his memory was fresh and eager and in none of his work is there a greater charm as he proceeded he did not confine himself to his earlier years but traveled back and forth setting down whatever was in his mind at the moment he worked incidentally at this record for two or three years eventually laying it aside for more immediate things five years later in florence where he had taken mrs clemens for her health he again applied himself to what he now definitely termed his autobiography as in that earlier day he dictated and this time found it quite to his liking he completed some random memories of more or less importance and might have carried the work further but for his wife's rapidly failing health her death and his return to america followed and there was an interval of another two years before the autobiographical chapters were again resumed it was in january nineteen o six that the present writer became associated with mark twain as his biographer elsewhere i have told of that arrangement and may omit most of the story here it had been agreed that i should bring a stenographer to whom he would dictate notes for my use but a subsequent inspiration prompted him to suggest that he might in this way continue his autobiography from which i would be at liberty to draw material for my own undertaking we began with this understanding and during two hours of the forenoon on several days of each week he talked pretty steadily to a select audience of two wandering up and down the years as inclination led him relating in his inimitable way incidents episodes conclusions whatever the moment presented to his fancy it was his custom to stay in bed until noon and he remained there during most of the earlier dictations clad in a handsome dressing-gown propped against great snowy pillows he loved this loose luxury and ease and found it conducive to thought on the little table beside him where lay his cigars papers pipes and various knick-knacks shone a reading lamp making more brilliant his rich coloring and the gleam of his shining hair there was daylight too but it was north light and the winter days were dull the walls of the room a deep unreflecting red his bed was a vast carved antique affair its outlines blending into the luxuriant background the whole focusing to the striking central figure made a picture of classic value his talk was absorbingly interesting it never failed to be that even when it left something to be desired as history mark twain's memory had become capricious and his vivid imagination did not always supply his story with details of crystal accuracy but always it was a delightful story amusing tragic or instructive and it was likely to be one of these things at one instant and another at the next often he did not know until the moment of beginning what was to be his subject for the day then he was likely to go drifting among his memories in a quite irresponsible fashion the fashion of table conversation as he said the methodless method of the human mind he had concluded that this was the proper way to write autobiography or as he best conveys it in his own introductory note start at no particular time of your life wander at your free will all over your life talk only about the things which interest you for the moment drop it the moment its interest threatens to pale and turn your talk upon the new and more interesting thing that has intruded itself into your mind meantime certainly there is something to be said in favor of his plan 
and I often thought it the best plan for his kind of autobiography, which was really not autobiography at all, in the meaning generally conveyed by that term, but a series of entertaining stories and opinions, dinner-table talks, in fact, such as he had always delivered in his own home and elsewhere, and with about the same latitude and elaboration. I do not wish to convey that his narrative is in any sense a mere fairy tale. Many of the chapters, especially the earlier ones, are vividly true in their presentation. The things he told of Mrs. Clemens and Susie are marvelously and beautifully true in spirit and aspect and the story as a whole is amazingly faithful in the character picture it presents of the man himself. It was only when he relied upon his memory for details of general history, or when his imagination responded to old prejudice, or when lifelong habit prompted a good story, that he went wandering into fields of elaboration and gathered there such flowers and thorns as his fancy or feelings seemed to require. Mark Twain's soul was built of the very fabric of truth, so far as moral intent was concerned, but memory often betrayed him, even when he tried most to be accurate. He realized this himself, and once said, plaintively, When I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. But I am getting old, and soon I shall remember only the latter. And at another time, paraphrasing Josh Billings, it isn't so astonishing the things that I can remember as the number of things I can remember that aren't so. Perhaps it is proper to assure the reader that positive mistakes of date and occurrence have been corrected, while, for the rest, the matter of mere detail is of less importance than that the charm of the telling should remain undisturbed. Our work, begun in the New York house at 21 Fifth Avenue, continued with considerable regularity during a period of about two years, and intermittently during another two. When the first spring came it was transferred to the Upton house, on the slopes of Monadnock near Dublin, New Hampshire, a perfect setting for the dictations. He no longer remained in bed, but, clad in creamy white flannels and loose Morocco slippers, bareheaded, he paced up and down the long veranda against a background of far-lying forest and distant hill. As I think of that time now, I can still hear the ceaseless slippered shuffling walk and see the white figure with its rocking, rolling movement that preternaturally beautiful landscape behind it, and hear his deliberate speech, always deliberate, except at rare intervals, always impressive, whatever the subject might be. In September we returned to the New York house, and the work was continued there, that winter and the next. It reached its conclusion at Stormfield, the new home which he had built at Reading, Connecticut, and it was here that he died, April 21, 1910. In the beginning it was Mark Twain's frequently expressed command that the autobiography was not to be published until he had been dead at least a hundred years. But as the months passed he modified this idea, and himself selected a number of chapters for use in the North American Review. Discussing the matter later, he expressed a willingness that any portions of the work not dealing too savagely with living persons or their immediate descendants should be published sooner, either serially or in book form. The manuscript in time became very large and very inclusive. He even incorporated in it articles and stories which he had written and laid aside, among them Captain Stormfield's visit to heaven. Is Shakespeare Dead was originally a part of the autobiography, but he published it separately in a small volume. The Death of Jean, written, not dictated, immediately following that tragic event, was to be the closing chapter, and such in time it will become. He wished, however, that it should have separate publication, and it is for the present included in another volume. It was his last complete writing of any sort, and in all his work from beginning to end there is nothing more perfect, nothing 
more beautiful. Albert Bigelow Payne I am writing from the grave. On these terms only can a man be approximately frank. He cannot be straightly and unqualifiedly frank, either in the grave or out of it. Preface As from the Grave In this autobiography I shall keep in mind the fact that I am speaking from the grave. I am literally speaking from the grave, because I shall be dead when the book issues from the press. I speak from the grave rather than with my living tongue, for a good reason. I can speak thence freely. When a man is writing a book dealing with the privacies of his life, a book which is to be read while he is still alive, he shrinks from speaking his whole frank mind. All his attempts to do it fail. He recognizes that he is trying to do a thing which is wholly impossible to a human being. The frankest and freest and privatest product of the human mind and heart is a love letter. The writer gets his limitless freedom of statement and expression from his sense that no stranger is going to see what he is writing. Sometimes there is a breach of promise case, by and by, and when he sees his letter in print it makes him cruelly uncomfortable, and he perceives that he never would have unbosomed himself to that large and honest degree if he had known that he was writing for the public. He cannot find anything in the letter that was not true, honest, and respectworthy, but no matter, he would have been very much more reserved if he had known he was writing for print. It has seemed to me that I could be as frank and free and unembarrassed as a love letter if I knew that what I was writing would be exposed to no eye until I was dead and unaware and indifferent. Mark Twain End of Section Zero Introduction and Preface Section One of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. The Tennessee Land. Written about 1870. Note The Tennessee Land is an important feature in a novel by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner, The Gilded Age. The monster tract of land which our family own in Tennessee was purchased by my father a little over forty years ago. He bought the enormous area of seventy-five thousand acres at one purchase. The entire lot must have cost him somewhere in the neighborhood of four hundred dollars. That was a good deal of money to pass over at one payment in those days. At least it was considered so away up there in the pineries and the knobs of the Cumberland Mountains of Fentress County, East Tennessee, when my father paid down that great sum and turned and stood in the courthouse door of Jamestown and looked abroad over his vast possessions, he said, Whatever befalls me, my heirs are secure. I shall not live to see these acres turn to silver and gold, but my children will. Thus, with the very kindest intentions in the world toward us, he laid the heavy curse of prospective wealth upon our shoulders. He went to his grave in the full belief that he had done us a kindness. It was a woeful mistake, but fortunately he never knew it. He further said, Iron ore is abundant in this tract, and there are other minerals. There are thousands of acres of the finest yellow pine timber in America, and it can be rafted down Obed's River to the Cumberland, down the Cumberland to the Ohio, down the Ohio to the Mississippi, and down the Mississippi 
to any community that wants it. There is no end to the tar, pitch, and turpentine which these vast pineries will yield. This is a natural wine district, too. There are no vines elsewhere in America, cultivated or otherwise, that yield such grapes as grow wild here. There are grazing lands, corn lands, wheat lands, potato lands. There are all species of timber. There is everything in and on this great tract of land that can make land valuable. The United States contain fourteen millions of inhabitants. The population has increased eleven millions in forty years, and will henceforth increase faster than ever. My children will see the day that immigration will push its way to Fentress County, Tennessee, and then, with seventy-five thousand acres of excellent land in their hands, they will become fabulously wealthy. Everything my father said about the capabilities of the land was perfectly true, and he could have added, with like truth, that there were inexhaustible mines of coal on the land, but the chances are that he knew very little about the article, for the innocent Tennesseans were not accustomed to digging in the earth for their fuel. And my father might have added to the list of eligibilities that the land was only a hundred miles from Knoxville, and right where some future line of railway leading south from Cincinnati could not help but pass through it. But he never had seen a railway, and it is barely possible that he had not even heard of such a thing. Curious as it may seem, as late as eight years ago, there were people living close to Jamestown who never had heard of a railroad and could not be brought to believe in steamboats. They do not vote for Jackson in Fentress County. They vote for Washington. My eldest brother was four or five years old when the great purchase was made, and my eldest sister was an infant in arms. The rest of us, and we formed the great bulk of the family, came afterward, and were born along from time to time during the next ten years. Four years after the purchase came the great financial crash of thirty-four, and in that storm my father's fortunes were wrecked. From being honored and envied as the most opulent citizen of Fentress County, for outside of his great landed possessions he was considered to be worth not less than three thousand five hundred dollars, he suddenly woke up and found himself reduced to less than one-fourth of that amount. He was a proud man, a silent, austere man, and not a person likely to abide among the scenes of his vanished grandeur and be the target for public commiseration. He gathered together his household and journeyed many tedious days through wilderness solitudes toward what was then the far west, and at last pitched his tent in the little town of Florida, Monroe County, Missouri. He kept store there several years, but had no luck except that I was born to him. He presently removed to Hannibal, and prospered somewhat, rose to the dignity of Justice of the Peace, and had been elected to the clerkship of the Surrogate County, when the summons came which no man may disregard. He had been doing tolerably well for that age of the world during the first years of his residence in Hannibal, but ill fortune tripped him once more. He did the friendly office of going security for Ira blank, and Ira walked off and deliberately took the benefit of the new bankrupt law a deed which enabled him to live easily and comfortably along till death called for him, but a deed which ruined my father, sent him poor to his grave, 
and condemned his heirs to a long and discouraging struggle with the world for a livelihood but my father would brighten up and gather heart even upon his deathbed when he thought of the tennessee land he said that it would soon make us all rich and happy and so believing he died we straightway turned our waiting eyes upon tennessee through all our wanderings and all our ups and downs for thirty years they have still gazed thitherward over intervening continents and seas and at this very day they are yet looking toward the same fixed point with the hope of old habit and a faith that rises and falls but never dies after my father's death we reorganized the domestic establishment but on a temporary basis intending to arrange it permanently after the land was sold my brother borrowed five hundred dollars and bought a worthless weekly newspaper believing as we all did that it was not worth while to go at anything in serious earnest until the land was disposed of and we could embark intelligently in something we rented a large house to live in at first but we were disappointed in a sale we had expected to make the man wanted only a part of the land and we talked it over and decided to sell all or none and we were obliged to move to a less expensive one end of section one the tennessee land section two of mark twain's autobiography this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman early years in florida missouri written in eighteen seventy seven i was born the thirtieth of november eighteen thirty five in the almost invisible village of florida monroe county missouri i suppose florida had less than three hundred inhabitants it had two streets each a couple of hundred yards long the rest of the avenues mere lanes with rail fences and cornfields on either side both the streets and the lanes were paved with the same material tough black mud in wet times deep dust in dry most of the homes were of logs all of them indeed except three or four these latter were frame ones there were none of brick and none of stone there was a log church with a puncheon floor and slab benches a puncheon floor is made of logs whose upper surfaces have been chipped flat with the adze the cracks between the logs were not filled there was no carpet consequently if uh, you dropped anything smaller than a peach it was likely to go through the church was perched upon short sections of logs which elevated it two or three feet above the ground hogs slept under there and whenever the dogs got after them during services the minister had to wait till the disturbance was over in winter there was always a refreshing breeze up through the puncheon floor in summer there were fleas enough for all a slab bench is made of the outside cut of a saw log with the bark side down it is supported on four sticks driven into auger holes at the ends it has no back and no cushions the church was twilighted with yellow tallow candles in tin sconces hung against the walls weekdays the church was a schoolhouse there were two stores in the village my uncle john a quarles was proprietor of one of them it was a very small establishment with a few rolls of bit calicoes on half a dozen shelves a few barrels of salt mackerel coffee 
and Norland's sugar behind the counter. Stacks of brooms, shovels, axes, hoes, rakes, and such things here and there. A lot of cheap hats, bonnets, and tinware strung on strings and suspended from the walls. And at the other end of the room was another counter with bags of shot on it, a cheese or two, and a keg of powder. In front of it a row of nail kegs and a few pigs of lead, and behind it a barrel or two of Norland's molasses and native corn whiskey on tap. If a boy bought five or ten cents worth of anything, he was entitled to half a handful of sugar from the barrel. If a woman bought a few yards of calico, she was entitled to a spool of thread in addition to the usual gratis trimmings. If a man bought a trifle, he was at liberty to draw and swallow as big a drink of whiskey as he wanted. Everything was cheap. Apples, peaches, sweet potatoes, Irish potatoes, and corn, ten cents a bushel. Chickens, ten cents apiece. Butter, six cents a pound. Eggs, three cents a dozen. Coffee and sugar, five cents a pound. Whiskey, ten cents a gallon. I do not know how prices are out there in interior Missouri now, but I know what they are here in Hartford, Connecticut. To wit, apples, three dollars a bushel, peaches, five dollars, Irish potatoes, choice Bermudas, five dollars, chickens, a dollar to a dollar and a half apiece, according to weight, butter, forty-five to sixty cents a pound, eggs, fifty to sixty cents a dozen, coffee, forty-five cents a pound, native whiskey, four or five dollars a gallon, I believe, but I can only be certain concerning the sort which I use myself, which is scotch and costs ten dollars a gallon, when you take two gallons, more when you take less. Thirty to forty years ago, out yonder in Missouri, the ordinary cigar cost thirty cents a hundred, but most people did not try to afford them, since smoking a pipe cost nothing in that tobacco-growing country. Connecticut is also given up to tobacco-raising today, yet we pay ten dollars a hundred for Connecticut cigars, and fifteen to twenty-five dollars a hundred for the imported article. At first my father owned slaves, but by and by he sold them and hired others by the year from the farmers. For a girl of fifteen he paid twelve dollars a year and gave her two linsey woolsey frocks and a pair of stodgy shoes, cost a modification of nothing. For a negro woman of twenty-five, as general house servant he paid twenty-five dollars a year and gave her shoes and the aforementioned linsey woolsey frocks for a strong negro woman of forty as cook washer etc he paid forty dollars a year and the customary two suits of clothes and for an able-bodied man he paid from seventy-five to a hundred dollars a year and gave him two suits of jeans and two pairs of stodgy shoes, an outfit that cost about three dollars. But times have changed. We pay our German nursemaid a hundred and fifty-five dollars a year, Irish housemaid a hundred and fifty dollars, Irish laundress a hundred and fifty dollars, Negro woman a cook two hundred and forty dollars, young negro man, to wait on door and table, three hundred and sixty dollars, Irish coachman, six hundred dollars a year, 
with gas, hot and cold water, and dwelling consisting of parlor, kitchen, and two bedrooms connected with the stable, free. Note, these prices of 1877 are as interesting today as those of forty years earlier. End of section two. Early years in Florida, Missouri, written in 1877. Section three of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. The Grant Dictations, 1885, the Chicago G.A.R. Festival, dictated in 1885. The first time I ever saw General Grant was in the fall or winter of 1866 at one of the receptions at Washington when he was general of the army. I merely saw and shook hands with him along with the crowd but had no conversation. It was there, also, that I first saw General Sheridan. I next saw General Grant during his first term as president. Senator Bill Stewart of Nevada proposed to take me in and see the president. We found him in his working costume, with an old short linen duster on, and it was well spattered with ink. I had acquired some trifle of notoriety through some letters which I had written in the New York Tribune during my trip round about the world in the Quaker City expedition. I shook hands, and then there was a pause and silence. I couldn't think of anything to say, so I merely looked into the general's grim, immovable countenance a moment or two in silence, and then I said, Mr. President, I am embarrassed. Are you? He smiled a smile which would have done no discredit to a cast-iron image, and I got away under the smoke of my volley. I did not see him again for some ten years. In the meantime, I had become very thoroughly notorious. Then, in 1879, the general had just returned from his journey through the European and Asiatic world, and his progress from San Francisco eastward had been one continuous ovation, and now he was to be feasted in Chicago by the veterans of the Army of the Tennessee, the first army over which he had had command. The preparations for this occasion were in keeping with the importance of it. The toast committee telegraphed me and asked me if I would be present and respond at the grand banquet to the toast to the ladies. I telegraphed back that the toast was worn out. Everything had been said about the ladies that could be said at a banquet, but there was one class of the community that had always been overlooked upon such occasions, and if they would allow me, I would take that class for a toast. The babies! They were willing, so I prepared my toast and went out to Chicago. There was to be a prodigious procession. General Grant was to review it from a rostrum which had been built out for the purpose from the second-story window of the Palmer House. The rostrum was carpeted and otherwise glorified with flags and so on. The best place of all to see the procession was, of course, from this rostrum, so I sauntered upon that rostrum while as yet it was empty, in the hope that I might be permitted to sit there. It was rather a conspicuous place, since upon it the public gaze was fixed and there was a countless multitude below. Presently two gentlemen came upon that platform from the window of the hotel and stepped forward to the front. 
a prodigious shout went up from the vast multitude below, and I recognized in one of these two gentlemen General Grant. The other was Carter Harrison, the mayor of Chicago, with whom I was acquainted. He saw me, stepped over to me, and said, wouldn't I like to be introduced to the general? I said I should. So he walked over with me and said, General, let me introduce Mr. Clemens. We shook hands. There was the usual momentary pause, and then the general said, I am not embarrassed, are you? It showed that he had a good memory for trifles as well as for serious things. That banquet was by all odds the most notable one I was ever present at. There were six hundred persons present, mainly veterans of the Army of the Tennessee, and that in itself would have made it a most notable occasion of the kind in my experience but there were other things which contributed. General Sherman, and in fact nearly all of the surviving great generals of the war, sat in a body on a day's round about General Grant. The speakers were of a rare celebrity and ability. That night I heard for the first time a slang expression which had already come into considerable vogue but I had not myself heard it before. When the speaking began about ten o'clock, I left my place at the table and went away over to the front side of the great dining room where I could take in the whole spectacle at one glance. Among others, Colonel Villas was to respond to a toast, and also Colonel Ingersoll, the silver-tongued infidel, who had begun life in Illinois and was exceedingly popular there. Villas was from Wisconsin and was very famous as an orator. He had prepared himself superbly for this occasion. He was about the first speaker on the list of fifteen toasts, and Bob Ingersoll was the ninth. I had taken a position upon the steps in front of the brass band which lifted me up and gave me a good general view. Presently I noticed, leaning against the wall near me, a simple-looking young man wearing the uniform of a private and the badge of the Army of the Tennessee. He seemed to be nervous and ill at ease about something. Presently, while the second speaker was talking, this young man said, Do you know Colonel Villas? I said I had been introduced to him. He sat silent a while and then said, They say he is hell when he gets started. I said, In what way? What, what do you mean? Speaking, speaking, they say he is lightning. Yes, I said, I have heard that he is a great speaker. The young man shifted about uneasily for a while, and then he said, Do you reckon he can get away with Bob Ingersoll? I said, I don't know. Another pause. Occasionally he and I would join in the applause when a speaker was on his legs, but this young man seemed to applaud unconsciously. Presently he said, Here in Illinois we think there can't nobody get away with Bob Ingersoll. I said, Is that so? He said, Yes, we don't think anybody can lay over Bob Ingersoll. Then he added sadly, But they do say that Villas is pretty nearly hell. At last Villas rose to speak, and this young man pulled himself together and put on all his anxiety. Villas began to warm up, and the people began to applaud, 
He delivered himself of one especially fine passage, and there was a general shout, Get up on the table! Get up on the table! Stand up on the table! We can't see you! So a lot of men standing there picked Villas up and stood him on the table in full view of the whole great audience, and he went on with his speech. The young man applauded with the rest, and I could hear the young fellow mutter without being able to make out what he said. But presently, when Villas thundered out something especially fine, there was a tremendous outburst from the whole house, and then this young man said in a sort of despairing way, It ain't no use. Bob can't climb up to that. During the next hour he held his position against the wall in a sort of dazed abstraction, apparently unconscious of place or anything else. And at last, when Ingersoll mounted the supper table, his worshipper merely straightened up to an attitude of attention, but without manifesting any hope. Ingersoll, with his fair and fresh complexion, handsome figure, and graceful carriage, was beautiful to look at. He was to respond to the toast of the volunteers, and his first sentence or two showed his quality. As his third sentence fell from his lips, the house let go with a crash, and my private looked pleased, and for the first time hopeful, but he had been too much frightened to join in the applause. Presently, when Ingersoll came to the passage in which he said that these volunteers had shed their blood and periled their lives in order that a mother might own her own child, the language was so fine, whatever it was, for I have forgotten, and the delivery was so superb that the vast multitude rose as one man and stood on their feet, shouting, stamping, and filling all the place with such a waving of napkins that it was like a snowstorm. This prodigious outburst continued for a minute or two, Ingersoll standing and waiting, and now I happened to notice my private. He was stamping, clapping, shouting, gesticulating like a man who had gone truly mad. At last, when quiet was restored once more, he glanced up at me with the tears in his eyes and said, "'Ye God, he didn't get left!' My own speech was granted the perilous distinction of the place of honor. It was the last speech on the list, an honor which no person probably has ever sought. It was not reached until two o'clock in the morning, but when I got on my feet I knew that there was, at any rate, one point in my favor. The text was bound to have the sympathy of nine-tenths of the men present, and of every woman, married or single, of the crowds of the sex who stood huddled in the various doorways. I expected the speech to go off well, and it did. In it I had a drive at General Sheridan's comparatively new twins, and various other things calculated to make it go. There was only one thing in it that I had fears about, and that one thing stood where it could not be removed in case of disaster. It was the last sentence in the speech. I had been picturing the America of fifty years hence, with a population of two hundred million souls, and was saying that the future president, admiral, and so forth, of that great coming time, were now lying in their various cradles, 
scattered abroad over the vast expanse of this country, and then said, and now in his cradle somewhere under the flag the future illustrious commander-in-chief of the american armies is so little burdened with his approaching grandeur and responsibilities as to be giving his whole strategic mind at this moment to trying to find some way to get his big toe into his mouth something meaning no disrespect to the illustrious guest of this evening which he turned his entire attention to some fifty-six years ago and here as i had expected the laughter ceased and a sort of shuddering silence took its place for this was apparently carrying the matter too far I waited a moment or two to let this silence sink well home, then, turning toward the general, I added, And if the child is but the father of the man, there are mighty few who will doubt that he succeeded. Which relieved the house, for when they saw the general break up in good-sized pieces, they followed suit with great enthusiasm. End of section three. The Chicago GAR Festival. Section four of Mark Twain's autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Grant and the Chinese, dictated in eighteen eighty five. Early in 1884, or late in 1883, if my memory serves me, I called on General Grant with Yung Wing, late Chinese minister at Washington, to introduce Wing and let him lay before General Grant a proposition. Li Hong Chang, one of the greatest and most progressive men in China since the death of Prince Kung, had been trying to persuade the imperial government to build a system of military railroads in china and had so far succeeded in his persuasions that a majority of the government were willing to consider the matter provided that money could be obtained for that purpose outside of china this money to be raised upon the customs of the country and by bonding the railway or in some such manner. Yung Wing believed that if General Grant would take charge of the matter here and create the syndicate, the money would be easily forthcoming. He also knew that General Grant was better and more favorably known in China than any other foreigner in the world, and was aware that if his name were associated with the enterprise, the syndicate, it would inspire the Chinese government and people and give them the greatest possible sense of security. We found the general cooped up in his room with a severe rheumatism, resulting from a fall on the ice which he had got some months before. He would not undertake a syndicate, because times were so hard here that people would be loath to invest money so far away. Of course, Yung Wing's proposal included a liberal compensation for a general grant for his trouble, but that was a thing that the general would not listen to for a moment. He said that easier times would come by and by, and that the money could then be raised, no doubt, and that he would enter into it cheerfully and with zeal and carry it through to the very best of his ability, but he must do it without compensation. In no case would he consent to take any money for it. Here again he manifested the very strongest interest in China, an interest which I had seen him evince on previous occasions. He said he had urged the system of railways on Li Hung Chang when he was in China, 
and he now felt so sure that such a system would be a great salvation for the country and also the beginning of the country's liberation from the tartar rule and thraldom that he would be quite willing at a favorable time to do everything he could toward carrying out that project without other compensation than the pleasure he would derive from being useful to china this reminds me of one other circumstance about eighteen seventy nine or eighteen eighty the chinese pupils in hartford and other new england towns had been ordered home by the chinese government there were two parties in the chinese government one headed by li hung chang the progressive party which was striving to introduce western arts and education into china the other was opposed to all progressive measures li hung chang and the progressive party kept the upper hand for some time and during this period the government had sent one hundred or more of the country's choicest youth over here to be educated but now the other party had got the upper hand and had ordered these young people home at this time an old chinaman named chong non-progressionist was the chief china minister at washington and yung wing was his assistant the order disbanding the schools was a great blow to yung wing who had spent many years in working for their establishment this order came upon him with the suddenness of a thunderclap he did not know which way to turn first he got a petition signed by the presidents of various american colleges setting forth the great progress that the chinese pupils had made and offering arguments to show why the pupils should be allowed to remain to finish their education this paper was to be conveyed to the chinese government through the minister at peking but yung wing felt the need of a more powerful voice in the matter and general grant occurred to him he thought that if he could get general grant's great name added to that petition that alone would outweigh the signatures of a thousand college professors so the rev mr twichell and i went down to new york to see the general i introduced mr twichell who had come with a careful speech for the occasion in which he intended to load the general with information concerning the chinese pupils and the chinese question generally but he never got the chance to deliver it the general took the word out of his mouth and talked straight ahead and easily revealed to twichell the fact that the general was master of the whole matter and needed no information from anybody and also the fact that he was brimful of interest in the matter now as always the general was not only ready to do what we asked of him but a hundred times more he said yes he would sign that paper if desired but he would do better than that he would write a personal letter to li hung chang and do it immediately so twichell and i went downstairs into the lobby of the fifth avenue hotel a crowd of waiting and anxious visitors sitting in the anteroom and in the course of half an hour he sent for us again and put into our hands his letter to li hung chang to be sent directly and without the intervention of the american minister or any one else it was a clear compact and admirably written statement of the case of the chinese pupils with some equally clear arguments to show that the breaking up of the schools would be a mistake we shipped the letter and prepared to wait a couple of months to see what the result would be but we had not to wait so long the moment the general's letter reached china a telegram came back from the chinese government which was almost a copy in detail of general grant's letter 
and the cablegram ended with the peremptory command to old minister wong to continue the chinese schools it was a marvelous exhibition of the influence of a private citizen of one country over the councils of an empire situated on the other side of the globe such an influence could have been wielded by no other person in the world outside of that empire in fact the policy of the imperial government had been reversed from room forty five fifth avenue hotel new york by a private citizen of the united states End of section four Grant and the Chinese dictated in eighteen eighty five. Section five of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. A call with W. D. Howells on General Grant, dictated in eighteen eighty five. Howells wrote me that his old father, who was well along in the seventies, was in great distress about his poor little consulate up in Quebec. Somebody, not being satisfied with the degree of poverty already conferred upon him by a thoughtful and beneficent providence, was anxious to add to it by acquiring the Quebec consulate. So Howells thought if we could get general grant to say a word to president arthur it might have the effect of stopping this effort to oust old mr howells from his position therefore at my suggestion howells came down and we went to new york to lay the matter before the general we found him at number two wall street in the principal office of grant and ward brokers I stated the case and asked him if he wouldn't write a word on a card which Howells could carry to Washington and hand to the President. But as usual, General Grant was his natural self, that is to say, ready and also determined to do a great deal more for you than you could possibly have the effrontery to ask him to do. Apparently he never meets anybody halfway. He comes nine-tenths of the way himself voluntarily. No, he said, he would do better than that, and cheerfully. He was going to Washington in a couple of days to dine with the President, and he would speak to him and make it a personal matter. Now, as General Grant not only never forgets a promise, but never even the shadow of a promise, he did as he said he would do, and within a week came a letter from the Secretary of State, Mr. Frelinghuysen, to say that in no case would old Mr. Howells be disturbed. And he wasn't. He resigned a couple of years later. But to go back to the interview with General Grant, he was in a humor to talk. In fact, he was always in a humor to talk when no strangers were present, and he resisted all our efforts to leave him. He forced us to stay and take luncheon in a private room, and continued to talk all the time. It was bacon and beans. Nevertheless, how he sits and towers, howls, quoting from Dante. He remembered Squibob Derby at West Point very well. He said that Derby was forever drawing caricatures of the professors and playing jokes of all kinds on everybody. He also told of one thing, which I had heard before, but which I have never seen in print. At West Point, the professor was instructing and questioning a class concerning certain particulars of a possible siege, and he said this, as nearly as I can remember, I cannot quote General Grant's words, given that a thousand men are besieging a fortress whose equipment of men, provisions, etc., are so-and-so, it is a military axiom that at the end of forty-five days the fort will surrender. Now, young men, 
If any of you were in command of such a fortress, how would you proceed? Derby held up his hand in token that he had an answer for that question. He said, I would march out, let the enemy in, and at the end of forty-five days I would change places with him. I tried very hard to get General Grant to write his personal memoirs for publication, but he would not listen to the suggestion. His inborn diffidence made him shrink from voluntarily coming forward before the public and placing himself under criticism as an author. He had no confidence in his ability to write well, whereas everybody else in the world, excepting himself, is aware that he possesses an admirable literary gift and style. He was also sure that the book would have no sale, and of course that would be a humiliation too. He instanced the fact that General Badeau's military history of General Grant had had but a trifling sale, and that John Russell Young's account of General Grant's trip around the globe had hardly any sale at all. But I said that these were not instances in point, that what another man might tell about General Grant was nothing, while what General Grant should tell about himself with his own pen was a totally different thing. I said that the book would have an enormous sale, that it should be in two volumes sold in cash at three dollars and fifty cents apiece, and that the sale in two volumes would certainly reach half a million sets. I said that, from my experience, I could save him from making unwise contracts with publishers, and could also suggest the best plan of publication, the subscription plan, and find for him the best men in that line of business. I had in mind at that time the American Publishing Company of Hartford, and while I suspected that they had been swindling me for ten years, I was well aware that I could arrange the contract in such a way that they could not swindle General Grant. But the General said that he had no necessity for any addition to his income. I knew that he meant by that that his investments, through the firm in which his sons were partners, were paying him all the money he needed. So I was not able to persuade him to write a book. He said that some day he would make very full notes and leave them behind him, and then, if his children chose to make them into a book, that would answer. End of section 5 a call with w d howells on general grant dictated in eighteen eighty five section six of mark twain's autobiography this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman about general grant's memoirs dictated in eighteen eighty five i want to set down somewhat of a history of General Grant's memoirs. By way of preface, I will make a remark or two indirectly connected therewith. During the Garfield campaign, Grant threw the whole weight of his influence and endeavor toward the triumph of the Republican Party. He made a progress through many of the states, chiefly the doubtful ones, and this progress was a daily and nightly ovation, as long as it lasted. He was received everywhere by prodigious multitudes of enthusiastic people, and, to strain the facts a little, one might almost tell what part of the country the general was in for the moment by the red reflections on the sky caused by the torch processions and fireworks. He was to visit Hartford from Boston, and I was one of the committee sent to Boston to bring him down here. 
I was also appointed to introduce him to the Hartford people, when the population and the soldiers should pass in review before him. On our way from Boston in the palace car, I fell to talking with Grant's eldest son, Colonel Fred Grant, whom I knew very well, and it gradually came out that the general, so far from being a rich man, as was commonly supposed, had not even income enough to enable him to live as respectably as a third-rate physician. Colonel Grant told me that the general left the White House, at the end of his second term, a poor man, and I think he said he was in debt, but I am not positively sure. I know he was in debt $45,000 at the end of one of his terms. Friends had given the general a couple of dwelling houses, but he was not able to keep them or live in either of them. This was all so shameful and such a reproach to Congress that I proposed to take the general's straitened circumstances as my text in introducing him to the people of Hartford. I knew that if this nation, which was rising up daily to do its chief citizen unparalleled honor, had it in its power, by its vote, to decide the matter, it would turn his poverty into immeasurable wealth in an instant. Therefore, the reproach lay not with the people, but with their political representatives in Congress, and my speech could be no insult to the people. I clove to my plan, and in introducing the general, I referred to the dignities and emoluments lavished upon the Duke of Wellington by England, and contrasted with that conduct our far finer and higher method toward the Savior of our country, to wit, the simple carrying him in our hearts without burdening him with anything to live on. In his reply the general, of course, said that this country had more than sufficiently rewarded him, and that he was well satisfied. He could not have said anything else, necessarily. A few months later I could not have made such a speech, for by that time certain wealthy citizens had privately made up a purse of a quarter of a million dollars for the general, and had invested it in such a way that he could not be deprived of it either by his own want of wisdom or the rascality of other people. Later, still, the firm of Grant & Ward, brokers and stock dealers, was established at No. 2 Wall Street, New York City. This firm consisted of General Grant's sons and a brisk young man by the name of Ferdinand Ward, the general was also in some way a partner, but did not take any active part in the business of the house. In a little time the business had grown to such proportions that it was apparently not only profitable, but it was prodigiously so. The truth was, however, that Ward was robbing all the grants and everybody else that he could get his hands on, and the firm was not making a penny. The general was unsuspicious, and supposed that he was making a vast deal of money, whereas, indeed, he was simply losing such as he had, for Ward was getting it. About the 5th of May, I think it was, 1884, the crash came, and the several Grant families found themselves absolutely penniless. Ward had even captured the interest due on the quarter of a million dollars of the Grant Fund, which interest had fallen due only a day or two before the failure. General Grant told me that that month, for the first time in his life, he had paid his domestic bills with checks. They came back upon his hands dishonored. He told me that Ward had spared no one connected with the Grant name, however remote, 
that he had taken all that the general could scrape together and forty-five thousand dollars that the general had borrowed on his wife's dwelling-house in new york that he had taken sixty-five thousand dollars the sum for which mrs grant had sold recently one of the houses which had been presented to the general that he had taken seven thousand dollars which some poverty-stricken nieces of his in the west had recently received by bequest and which was all the money they had in the world that in a word ward had utterly stripped everybody connected with the grant family it was necessary that something be immediately done toward getting bread the bill to restore to general grant the title and emoluments of a full general in the army on the retired list had been lagging for a long time in congress in the characteristic contemptible and stingy congressional fashion no relief was to be looked for from that source mainly because congress chose to avenge on general grant the veto of the fitz john porter bill by president arthur the editors of the century magazine some months before conceived the excellent idea of getting the surviving heroes of the late civil war on both sides to write out their personal reminiscences of the war and publish them now in the magazine but the happy project had come to grief for the reason that some of these heroes were quite willing to write out these things only under one condition that they insisted was essential they refused to write a line unless the leading actor of the war should also write note august eighteen eighty five they deny this now but i go bail i got that statement from gilder himself s l c all persuasions and arguments failed on general grant he would not write so the scheme fell through now however the complexion of things had changed and general grant was without bread not figuratively but actually the century people went to him once more and now he assented eagerly a great series of war articles was immediately advertised by the century publishers i knew nothing of all this although i had been a number of times to the general's house to pass half an hour talking and smoking a cigar however i was reading one night in chickering hall early in november eighteen eighty four and as my wife and i were leaving the building we stumbled over mr gilder the editor of the century and went home with him to a late supper at his house we were there an hour or two and in the course of the conversation gilder said that general grant had written three war articles for the century and was going to write a fourth i pricked up my ears note in a statement made somewhat later mr clemens said that he had first heard gilder mention this fact as they were leaving chickering hall gilder went on to describe how eagerly general grant had entertained the proposition to write when it had last been put to him and how poor he evidently was and how eager to make some trifle of bread and butter money and how the handing him a check for five hundred dollars for the first article had manifestly gladdened his heart and lifted from it a mighty burden the thing which astounded me was that admirable man as gilder certainly is and with a heart which is in the right place it had never seemed to occur to him that to offer general grant five hundred dollars for a magazine article was not only the monumental injustice of the nineteenth century but of all centuries he ought to have known that if he had given general grant a check for ten thousand dollars the sum would still have been trivial 
that if he had paid him twenty thousand dollars for a single article the sum would still have been inadequate that if he had paid him thirty thousand dollars for a single magazine war article it still could not be called paid for that if he had given him forty thousand dollars for a single magazine article he would still be in general grant's debt gilder went on to say that it had been impossible months before to get general grant to write a single line but that now that he had once got started it was going to be as impossible to stop him again that in fact general grant had set out deliberately to write his memoirs in full and to publish them in book form i went straight to general grant's house next morning and told him what i had heard he said it was all true i said i had foreseen a fortune in such a book when i had tried as early as eighteen eighty one to get him to write it that the fortune was just as sure to fall now i asked him who was to publish the book and he said doubtless the century company i asked him if the contract had been drawn and signed he said it had been drawn in the rough but not signed yet i said i had had a long and painful experience in bookmaking and publishing and that if there would be no impropriety in his showing me the rough contract i believed i might be useful to him he said there was no objection whatever to my seeing the contract since it had proceeded no further than a mere consideration of its details without promises given or received on either side he added that he supposed that the century offer was fair and right and that he had been expecting to accept it and conclude the bargain or contract he read the rough draft aloud and i didn't know whether to cry or laugh whenever a publisher in the trade thinks enough of the chances of an unknown author's book to print it and put it on the market he is willing to risk paying the man ten per cent royalty and that is what he does pay him he can well venture that much of a royalty but he cannot well venture any more if that book shall sell three thousand or four thousand copies there is no loss on any ordinary book and both parties have made something but whenever the sale shall reach ten thousand copies the publisher is getting the lion's share of the profits and would continue to get the lion's share as long thereafter as the book should continue to sell when such a book is sure to sell thirty five thousand copies an author ought to get fifteen per cent that is to say one half of the net profit when a book is sure to sell eighty thousand or more he ought to get twenty per cent royalty that is two-thirds of the total profits now here was a book that was morally bound to sell several hundred thousand copies in the first year of its publication and yet the century people had had the hardihood to offer general grant the very same ten per cent royalty which they would have offered to any unknown comanche indian whose book they had reason to believe might sell three thousand or four thousand or five thousand copies if i had not been acquainted with the century people i should have said that this was a deliberate attempt to take advantage of a man's ignorance and trusting nature to rob him but i do know the century people therefore i know that they had no such base intentions as these but were simply making their offer out of their boundless resources of ignorance they were anxious to do book publishing as well as magazine publishing and had tried one book already but owing to their inexperience had made a failure of it so i suppose they were anxious 
and had made an offer which in the general's instance commended itself as reasonable and safe, showing that they were lamentably ignorant, and that they utterly failed to rise to the size of the occasion. This was sufficiently shown in the remark of the head of that firm to me a few months later, a remark which I shall refer to and quote in its proper place. I told General Grant that the century offer was simply absurd and should not be considered for an instant. I forgot to mention that the rough draft made two propositions, one at ten percent royalty and the other the offer of half the profits on the book, after subtracting every sort of expense connected with it, including office rent, clerk hire, advertising, and everything else, a most complicated arrangement, and one which no business-like author would accept in preference to a ten percent royalty. They manifestly regarded ten percent and half profits as the same thing, which shows that these innocent geese expected the book to sell only 12,000 or 15,000 copies. I told the general that I could tell him exactly what he ought to receive, that if he accepted a royalty, it ought to be 20% on the retail price of the book, or if he preferred the partnership policy, then he ought to have 70% of the profits on each volume over and above the mere cost of making that volume. I said that if he would place these terms before the century people, they would accept them, but if they were afraid to accept them, he would simply need to offer them to any great publishing house in the country, and not one would decline them. If any should decline them, let me have the book. I was publishing my own book under the business name of Charles L. Webster & Company, I being the company and Webster being my business man on a salary with a one-tenth interest, and I had what I believed to be much the best equipped subscription establishment in the country. I wanted the general's book, and I wanted it very much, but I had very little expectation of getting it. I supposed that he would lay these new propositions before the century people, that they would accept immediately, and that there the matter would end, for the general evidently felt under great obligations to the century people for saving him from the grip of poverty by paying him $1,500 for three magazine articles, which were well worth $100,000 and he seemed wholly unable to free himself from this sense of obligation, whereas, to my mind, he ought rather to have considered the century people under very high obligations to him, not only for making them a present of one hundred thousand dollars, but for procuring for them a great and desirable series of war articles from the other heroes of the war which, according to Gilder, they could never have got their hands on if he had declined to write. I now went away on a long western tour on the platform, but Webster continued to call at the general's office and watch the progress of events. Colonel Fred Grant was strongly opposed to letting the century people have the book, and was at the same time as strongly in favor of my having it. The general's first magazine article had immediately added fifty thousand names to their list of subscribers, and thereby established the fact that the century people would still have been the gainers if they had paid General Grant fifty thousand dollars for the articles, for the reason that they could expect to keep the most of these subscribers for several years, and consequently get a profit out of them in the end of one hundred thousand dollars at least. Besides this increased circulation, the number of the century's advertising pages at once doubled, a huge addition to the magazine's cash income in itself. 
an addition of twenty-five thousand dollars a month, as I estimate it from what I have paid them for one-fifth of a page for six months, one thousand eight hundred dollars. The Century people had eventually added to the original check of one thousand five hundred dollars a check for a thousand dollars after perceiving that they were going to make a fortune out of the first of the three articles. This seemed a fine liberality to General Grant, who was the most simple-hearted of all men, but to me it seemed merely another exhibition of incomparable nonsense, as the added check ought to have been for thirty thousand dollars instead of one thousand dollars. Colonel Fred Grant looked upon the matter just as I did, and had determined to keep the book out of the century people's hands if possible. This action merely confirmed and hardened him in his purpose. While I was in the West, propositions from publishers came to General Grant daily, and these propositions had a common form, to wit, only tell us what your best offer is, and we stand ready to make a better one. These things had their effect. The general began to perceive, from these various views, that he had narrowly escaped making a very bad bargain for his book, and now he began to incline toward me, for the reason, no doubt, that I had been the accidental cause of stopping that bad bargain. He called in George W. Childs of Philadelphia, and laid the whole matter before him and asked his advice. Mr. Child said to me afterward that it was plain to be seen that the general, on the score of friendship, was so distinctly inclined toward me that the advice which would please him best would be advice to turn the book over to me. He counseled the general to send competent people to examine into my capacity to properly publish the book and into the capacity of the other competitors for the book, and, this was done at my own suggestion, Fred Grant being present, if they found that my house was as well equipped in all ways as the others, that he give the book to me. The general sent persons selected by a couple of great law firms, Clarence Seward's was one, to make examinations and Colonel Fred Grant made similar examinations for himself, personally. The verdict in these several cases was that my establishment was as competent to make a success of the book as was that of any of the firms competing. The result was that the contract was drawn, and the book was placed in my hands. In the course of one of my business talks with General Grant, he asked me if I felt sure I could sell 25,000 copies of his book, and he asked the question in such a way that I suspected that the Century people had intimated that that was about the number of the books that they thought ought to sell. Note, this had occurred during their first interview. I replied that the best way for a man to express an opinion in such a case was to put it in money. Therefore, I would make this offer. If he would give me the book, I would advance him the sum of $25,000 on each volume the moment the manuscript was placed in my hands, adding that I would draw the first check immediately. If I never got the $50,000 back again, out of the future copyrights due, I would never ask him to return any part of the money to me. The suggestion seemed to distress him. He said he could not think of taking in advance any sum of money, large or small, which the publisher would not be absolutely sure of getting back again. Some time afterward, when the contract was being drawn and the question was whether it should be twenty per cent royalty or seventy per cent of the profits, he inquired which of the two propositions would be the best all round. I sent Webster to tell him that the twenty per cent royalty would be the best for him, 
for the reason that it was the surest, the simplest, the easiest to keep track of, and, better still, would pay him a trifle more, no doubt, than with the other plan. He thought the matter over and then said in substance that by the twenty per cent plan he would be sure to make while the publisher might possibly lose. Therefore he would not have the royalty plan, but the seventy per cent profit plan, since if there were profits he could not then get them all, but the publisher would be sure to get thirty per cent of it. This was just like General Grant. It was absolutely impossible for him to entertain for a moment any proposition which might prosper him at the risk of any other man. After the contract had been drawn and signed, I remembered I had offered to advance the general some money, and that he had said he might possibly need ten thousand dollars before the book issued. The circumstance had been forgotten and was not in the contract, but I had the luck to remember it before leaving town. So I went back and told Colonel Fred Grant to draw upon Webster for ten thousand dollars whenever it should be wanted. That was the only thing forgotten in the contract, and it was now rectified, and everything was smooth. And now I come to a circumstance which I have never spoken of, and which cannot be known for many years to come, for this paragraph must not be published until the mention of so private a matter cannot offend any living person. The contract was drawn by the great law firm of Alexander and Green on my part, and Clarence Seward, son of Mr. Lincoln's Secretary of State, on the part of General Grant. Appended to the contract was a transfer of the book to General Grant's wife, and the transfer from her to my firm for the consideration of one thousand dollars in hand paid. This was to prevent the General's creditors from seizing the proceeds of the book. Webster had said yes when the sum named was a thousand dollars, and after he had signed the contract and was leaving the law office, he mentioned incidentally that the thousand dollars was of course a mere formality in such a paper, and meant nothing. But Mr. Seward took him privately aside and said, No, it means just what it says, for the General's family have not a penny in the house, and they are waiting at this moment with lively anxiety for that small sum of money. Webster was astonished. He drew a check at once, and Mr. Seward gave it to a messenger boy, and told him to take it swiftly, by the speediest route, to General Grant's house, and not let the grass grow under his feet. It was a shameful thing that the man who had saved this country and its government from destruction should still be in a position where so small a sum, so trivial an amount as one thousand dollars, could be looked upon as a godsend. Everybody knew that the general was in reduced circumstances, but what a storm would have gone up all over the land if the people could have known that his poverty had reached such a point as this. The newspapers all over the land had been lauding the princely generosity of the century people in paying General Grant the goodly sum of $1,500 for three magazine articles, whereas if they had paid him the amount which was his just due for them, he would still have been able to keep his carriage and not have been worrying about $1,000. Neither the newspapers nor the public were probably aware that fifty-five years earlier the publishers of an annual in London had offered little Tom Moore twice $1,500 for two articles, and had told him to make them long or short, and to write about whatever he pleased. 
the difference between the financial value of any article written by tom moore in his best day and a war article written by general grant in these days was about as one to fifty to go back a while after being a month or two in the west during the winter of eighteen eighty four eighty five i returned to the east reaching new york about the twentieth of february no agreement had at that time been reached as to the contract but i called at general grant's house simply to inquire after his health for i had seen reports in the newspapers that he had been sick and confined to his house for some time the last time i had been at his house he told me that he had stopped smoking because of the trouble in his throat which the physicians had said would be quickest cured in that way but while i was in the west the newspapers had reported that this throat affection was believed to be in the nature of a cancer however on the morning of my arrival in new york the newspapers had reported that the physicians had said that the general was a great deal better than he had been and was getting along very comfortably so when i called at the house i went up to the general's room and shook hands and said i was very glad he was so much better and so well along the road to perfect health again he smiled and said if it were only true of course i was both surprised and discomfited and asked his physician dr douglas if the general were in truth not progressing as well as i had supposed he intimated that the reports were rather rose-colored and that this affection was no doubt a cancer i am an excessive smoker and i said to the general that some of the rest of us must take warning by his case but dr douglas spoke up and said that this result must not be attributed altogether to smoking he said it was probable that it had its origin in excessive smoking but that was not the certain reason of its manifestation itself at this time that more than likely the real reason was the general's distress of mind and year-long depression of spirit arising from the failure of the grant and ward firm this remark started the general at once to talking and i found then and afterward that when he did not care to talk about any other subject he was always ready and willing to talk about that one he told what i have before related about the robberies perpetrated upon him and upon all the grant connection by this man ward whom he had so thoroughly trusted but he never uttered a phrase concerning ward which an outraged adult might not have uttered concerning an offending child he spoke as a man speaks who has been deeply wronged and humiliated and betrayed but he never used a venomous expression or one of a vengeful nature as for myself i was inwardly boiling all the time i was scalping ward flaying him alive breaking him on the wheel pounding him to jelly and cursing him with all the profanity known to the one language that i am acquainted with and helping it out in times of difficulty and distress with odds and ends of profanity drawn from the two other languages of which i have a limited knowledge he told his story with deep feeling in his voice but with no betrayal upon his countenance of what was going on in his heart he could depend upon that countenance of his in all emergencies it always stood by him it never betrayed him july first or second at mount mcgregor eighteen eighty five about three weeks before the general's death buck grant and i sat talking an hour to each other across the general's lap just to keep him company he had only to listen 
the news had just come that that marine bank man ward's pal what was that scoundrel's name had been sent up for ten years buck grant said the bitterest things about him he could frame his tongue to i was about as bitter myself the general listened for some time then reached for his pad and pencil and wrote he was not as bad as the other meaning ward it was his only comment even his writing looked gentle while he was talking colonel grant said father is letting you see that the grant family are a pack of fools mr clemens the general combated that statement he said in substance that facts could be produced which would show that when ward laid siege to a man that man would turn out to be a fool too as much of a fool as any grant that all men were fools if the being successfully beguiled by ward was proof by itself that the man was a fool he began to present instances he said in effect that nobody would call the president of the erie railroad a fool yet ward beguiled him to the extent of eight hundred thousand dollars robbed him of every cent of it he mentioned another man who could not be called a fool yet ward had beguiled that man out of more than half a million dollars and had given him nothing in return for it he instanced a man with a name something like fisher though that was not the name whom he said nobody could call a fool on the contrary a man who had made himself very rich by being sharper and smarter than other people and who always prided himself upon his smartness and upon the fact that he could not be fooled he could not be deceived by anybody but what did ward do in his case he fooled him into buying a portion of a mine belonging to ex-senator chaffee a property which was not for sale which ward could produce no authority for selling yet he got out of that man three hundred thousand dollars in cash without the passage of a single piece of paper or a line of writing to show that the sale had been made this man came to the office of grant and ward every day for a good while and talked with ward about the prospects of that rich mine and it was very rich and these two would pass directly to mr chaffee and go into the next room and talk you would think that a man of his reputation for shrewdness would at some time or other have concluded to ask mr chaffee a question or two but no ward had told this man that chaffee did not want to be known in the transaction at all that he must seem to be at grant and ward's office on other business and that he must not venture to speak to chaffee or the whole business would be spoiled there was a man who prided himself on being a smart business man and yet ward robbed him of three hundred thousand dollars without giving him a scrap of anything to show that the transaction had taken place and today that man is not among the prosecutors of ward at all for the reason perhaps that he would rather lose all of that money than to have the fact get out that he was deceived in so childish a way general grant mentioned another man who was very wealthy whom no one would venture to call a fool either business-wise or otherwise yet this man came into the office one day and said ward here is my check for fifty thousand dollars i have no use for it at present i am going to make a flying trip to europe turn it over for me see what you can do with it some time afterward i was in the office when this gentleman returned from his trip and presented himself he asked ward if he had accomplished anything with that money ward said just wait a moment went to his books turned over a page mumbled to himself a few moments 
drew a check for $250,000, handed it to this man with the air of a person who had really accomplished nothing worth talking of. The man stared at the check a moment, handed it back to Ward, and said, That is plenty good enough for me. Set that hen again. And he went out of the place. It was the last he ever saw of any of that money. I had been discovering fools all along when the general was talking, but this instance brought me to my senses. I put myself in this fellow's place and confessed that if I had been in that fellow's clothes it was a hundred to one that I would have done the very thing that he had done, and I was thoroughly well aware that at any rate there was not a preacher or a widow in Christendom who would not have done it, for these people are always seeking investments that pay illegitimately large sums, and they never, or seldom, stop to inquire into the nature of the business. When I was ready to go, Colonel Fred Grant went downstairs with me, and stunned me by telling me, confidentially, that the physicians were trying to keep his father's real condition from him but that, in fact, they considered him to be under sentence of death, and that he would not be likely to live more than a fortnight or three weeks longer. This was about the 21st of February, 1885. After the 21st of February, General Grant busied himself daily, as much as his strength would allow, in revising the manuscript of his book, it was read to him by Colonel Grant very carefully, and he made the corrections as he went along. He was losing valuable time because only one half or two-thirds of the second and last volume was had yet written. However, he was more anxious that what was written should be absolutely correct than that he should finish the book in an incorrect form and then find himself unable to correct it. His memory was superb, and nearly any other man with such a memory would have been satisfied to trust it. Not so the general. No matter how sure he was of the fact or the date, he would never let it go until he had verified it with the official records. This constant and painstaking searching of the records cost a great deal of time, but it was not wasted. Everything stated as a fact in General Grant's book may be accepted with entire confidence as being thoroughly trustworthy. Speaking of his memory, what a wonderful machine it was! He told me one day that he never made a report of the battles of the wilderness until they were all over and he was back in Washington. Then he sat down and made a full report from memory, and when it was finished, examined the reports of his subordinates, and found that he had made hardly an error. To be exact, he said he had made two errors. The general lost some more time in one other way. Three century articles had been written and paid for, but he had during the summer before promised to write a fourth one, he had written it in a rough draft, but it had remained unfinished. The century people had advertised these articles and were now fearful that the general would never be able to complete it. By this time news of the general's failing health had got abroad, and the newspapers were full of reports about his perilous condition. The century people called several times to get the fourth article, and this hurt and offended Colonel Fred Grant, because he knew that they were aware, as was all the world, that his father was considered to be in a dying condition. Colonel Grant thought that they ought to show more consideration, more humanity. By fits and starts the general worked at that article whenever his failing strength would permit him, and was determined to finish it if possible because his promise had been given, and he would in no way depart from it while any slight possibility remained of fulfilling it. 
I asked if there was no contract or no understanding as to what was to be paid by the century people for the article. He said there was not. Then I said, charge them twenty thousand dollars for it. It is well worth it, worth double the money. Charge them this sum for it in its unfinished condition and let them have it, and tell them that it will be worth still more in case the general shall be able to complete it. This may modify their ardor somewhat and bring you a rest. He was not willing to put so large a price upon it, but thought that if he gave it to them he might require them to pay five thousand dollars. It was plain that the modesty of the family in money matters was indestructible. Just about this time I was talking to General Badeau there one day when I saw a pile of typewritten manuscript on the table and picked up the first page and began to read it. I saw that it was an account of the siege of Vicksburg. I counted a page, and there were about three hundred words on the page, eighteen thousand or twenty thousand words altogether. General Badeau said it was one of the three articles written by General Grant for the century. I said, then they have no sort of right to require the fourth article, for there is matter enough in this one to make two or three ordinary magazine articles. The copy of this and the other two articles were at this moment in the century's safe. The fourth article agreement was therefore most amply fulfilled already, without an additional article. Yet the century people considered that the contract would not be fulfilled without the fourth article, and so insisted upon having it. At the ordinary price paid me for century articles, this Vicksbury article, if I had written it, would have been worth about seven hundred dollars. Therefore the century people had paid General Grant no more than they would have paid me, and this, including the one thousand dollar gratuity, which they had given him. If the century people knew anything at all, they knew that a single page of General Grant's manuscript was worth more than a hundred of mine. They were honest, honorable, and good-hearted people, according to their lights, and if anybody could have made them see differently, they would have rectified the wrong. But all the eloquence that I was able to pour out upon them went for nothing, utterly nothing. They still thought that they had been quite generous to the general, and were not able to see the matter in any other light. Afterward, at Mount McGregor, they consented to give up half of the Vicksburg article, and they did. They gave up more than half of it, cut it from twenty-two galleys down to nine, and only the nine will appear in the magazine, and they added two thousand five hundred dollars to the two thousand five hundred dollars already paid. Those people could learn to be as fair and liberal as anybody if they had the right schooling. Some time after the contract for General Grant's book was completed, I found that nothing but a verbal understanding existed between General Grant and the Century Company, giving General Grant permission to use his Century articles in his book. There is a law of custom which gives an author the privilege of using his magazine articles in any way he pleases, after it shall have appeared in the magazine, and this law of custom is so well established that an author never expects to have any difficulty about getting a magazine copyright transferred to him whenever he shall ask for it, with the purpose in view of putting the article in a book. But in the present case I was afraid that the Century Company might fall back upon their legal rights and ignore the law of custom, in which case we should be debarred from using General Grant's Century articles in his book, an awkward state of things, 
because he was now too sick a man to rewrite them. It was necessary that something should be done in this matter, and done at once. Mr. Seward, General Grant's lawyer, was a good deal disturbed when he found that there was no writing, but I was not. I believed that the century people could be relied upon to carry out any verbal agreement which they had made. The only thing I feared was that their idea of the verbal agreement and General Grant's idea of it might not coincide. So I went back to the General's house and got Colonel Fred Grant to write down what he understood the verbal agreement to be, and this piece of writing he read to General Grant, who said it was correct, and then signed it with his own hand, a feeble and trembling signature, but recognizable as his. Then I sent for Webster and our lawyer, and we three went to the Century office, where we found Roswell Smith, the head man of the company, and several of the editors. I stated my case plainly and simply, and found that their understanding and General Grant's were identical. So the difficulty was at an end at once, and we proceeded to draw a writing to cover the thing. When the business was finished, or perhaps in the course of it, I made another interesting discovery. I was already aware that the Century people were going to bring out all their war articles in book form eventually, General Grant's among the number, but as I knew what a small price had been paid to the general for his articles, I had a vague notion that he would receive a further payment for the use of them in their book, a remuneration which an author customarily receives in our day by another unwritten law of custom. But when I spoke of this to my astonishment, they told me that they had bought and paid for every one of these war articles with the distinct understanding that that first payment was the last. In confirmation of this amazing circumstance, they brought out a receipt which General Grant had signed, and therein it distinctly appeared that each five hundred dollars not only paid for the use of the article printed in the magazine, but also in the subsequent book. One thing was quite clear to me. If we consider the value of those articles to that book, we must grant that the general was paid very much less than nothing at all for their issue in the magazine. The century people didn't blush, and therefore it is plain that they considered the transaction fair and legitimate, and I believe myself that they had no idea that they were doing an unfair thing. It was easily demonstrable that they were buying ten-dollar gold pieces from General Grant at twenty-five cents apiece, and I think it was as easily demonstrable that they did not know that there was anything unfair about it. Roswell Smith said to me, with the glad air of a man who had stuck a nail in his foot, I'm glad you've got the General's book, Mr. Clemens and glad there was somebody with courage enough to take it under the circumstances. What do you think the general wanted to require of me? What? He wanted me to insure a sale of twenty-five thousand sets of his book. I wouldn't risk such a guarantee on any book that ever was published. Note. This is the remark I have already several times referred to. I've got Smith's exact language from my notebook. It proves that they thought 10% royalty would actually represent half profits on General Grant's book. Note added, September 10, 1885, 250,000 sets, 500,000 single copies have been sold to date and only half the ground canvassed. I did not say anything, but I thought a good deal. This was one more evidence that the century people had no more just idea of the value of the book than as many children might be expected to have. At this present writing, May twenty-fifth, 1885, 
We have not advertised General Grant's book in any way. We have not spent a dollar in advertising of any kind. We have not even given notice by circular or otherwise that we are ready to receive applications from book agents. And yet today we have bona fide orders for 100,000 sets of the book, that is to say 200,000 single volumes, and these orders are from men who have bonded themselves to take and pay for them, and who have also laid before us the most trustworthy evidence that they are financially able to carry out their contracts. The territory which these men have taken is only about one-fourth of the area of the northern states. We have also under consideration applications for fifty thousand sets more, and although we have confidence in the energy and ability of the men who have made these applications, we have not closed with them because, as yet, we are not sufficiently satisfied as to their financial strength. When it became known that the General's book had fallen into my hands, the New York World and a Boston paper, I think the Herald, came out at once with the news, and in both instances the position was taken that, by some sort of superior underhanded smartness, I had taken an unfair advantage of the confiding simplicity of the century people and got the book away from them, a book which they had the right to consider their property, inasmuch as the terms of its publication had been mutually agreed upon, and the contract covering it was on the point of being signed by General Grant when I put in my meddling appearance. None of the statements of these two papers was correct, but the Boston paper's account was considered to be necessarily correct, for the reason that it was furnished by the sister of Mr. Gilder, editor of the Century so there was considerable newspaper talk about my improper methods, but nobody seemed to have wit enough to discover that if one gouger had captured the general's book, here was evidence that he had only prevented another gouger from getting it, since the century's terms were distinctly mentioned in the Boston paper's account as being ten percent royalty. No party observed that, and nobody commented upon it. It was taken for granted all around that General Grant would have signed that 10% contract without being grossly cheated. It is my settled policy to allow newspapers to make as many misstatements about me or my affairs as they like. Therefore I had no mind to contradict either of these newspapers or explain my side of the case in any way. But a reporter came to our house at Hartford, from one of the editors of the Courant, to ask me for my side of the matter for use in the Associated Press dispatches. I dictated a short paragraph in which I said that the statement made in the world that there was a coolness between the Century Company and General Grant and that, in consequence of it, the Century would not publish any more articles by General Grant, notwithstanding the fact that they had advertised them far and wide, was not true. I said there was no coolness and no ground for coolness, that the contract for the book had been open for all competitors, that I had put in my application and had asked the general to state its terms to the other applicants in order that he might thereby be enabled to get the best terms possible, that I had got the book eventually, but by no underhand or unfair method. The statement I made was concise and brief and contained nothing offensive. It was sent over the wires to the Associated Press headquarters in New York but it was not issued by that concern. It did not appear in print. I inquired why, and was told that, although it was a piece of news of quite universal interest, 
It was also more or less of an advertisement for the book, a thing I had not thought of before. I was also told that if I had had a friend round about the Associated Press office, I could have had that thing published all over the country for a reasonable bribe. I wondered if that were true. I wondered if so great and important a concern dealt in that sort of thing. End of section 6 about General Grant's memoirs, dictated in 1885. Section 7 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Gerhardt and the Grant Bust, dictated in 1885. Note, Carl Gerhardt, a young sculptor sent by Mr. and Mrs. Clemens to Paris to perfect himself in his art. I will make a diversion here and get back upon my track again later. While I was away with G. W. Cable, giving public readings in the theaters, lecture halls, skating rinks, jails, and churches of the country, the travel was necessarily fatiguing, and therefore I ceased from writing letters except to my wife and children. This foretaste of heaven, this relief from the fret of letter answering, was delightful but it finally left me in the dark concerning things which I ought to have been acquainted with at the moment. Among these, the affairs of Karl Gerhardt, the young artist, should be mentioned. I had started out on this reading pilgrimage the day after the presidential election, that is to say I had started on the 5th of November, and had visited my home only once between that time and the second of March following. During all these four months Gerhardt had been waiting for a verdict of a dilatory committee concerning a Nathan Hale statue, and had taken it out in waiting, that is to say, he had sat still and done nothing to earn his bread. He had been tirelessly diligent in asking for work in the line of his art, and had used all possible means in that direction. He had written letters to every man he could hear of who was likely to need a mortuary monument for himself or his friends or acquaintances, and had also applied for the chance of a competition for a soldier's monument, for all things of this sort, but always without success. The natural result, as his name was not known, he had no reputation. Once J. Q. A. Ward, in speaking of his early struggles to get a status as a sculptor, had told me that he had made his beginning by hanging around the studios of sculptors of repute, and picking up odd jobs of journey work in them for the sake of the bread he could gain in that way. I may as well say here, and be done with it, that my connection with Gerhardt had very little sentiment in it from my side of the house, and no romance. I took hold of his case in the first place solely because I had become convinced that he had it in him to become a very capable sculptor. I was not adopting a child, I was not adding a member to the family. I was merely taking upon myself a common duty, the duty of helping a man who was not able to help himself. I never expected him to be grateful, I never expected him to be thankful. My experience of men had long ago taught me that one of the surest ways of begetting an enemy was to do some stranger an act of kindness which should lay upon him the irritating sense of an obligation. Therefore my connection with Gerhardt had nothing sentimental or romantic about it. I told him in the first place that if the time should ever come when he could pay back to me the money expended upon him 
and pay it without inconvenience to himself, I should expect it at his hands, and that when it was paid I should consider the account entirely requited, sentiment and all, that that act would leave him free from any obligation to me. It was well all round that things had taken that shape in the beginning, and had kept it, for if the foundation had been sentiment, that sentiment might have grown sour. One evening Gerhardt appeared in the library, and I hoped he had come to say he was getting along very well and was contented. So I was disappointed when he said he had come to show me a small bust he had been making in clay of General Grant from a photograph. I was the more irritated for the reason that I had never seen a portrait of General Grant in oil, watercolors, crayon, steel, wood, photograph, plaster, marble, or any other material that was to me at all satisfactory, and therefore I could not expect that a person who had never even seen the general could accomplish anything worth considering in the way of a likeness of him. However, when he uncovered the bust my prejudices vanished at once. The thing was not correct in its details, yet it seemed to me to be a closer approach to a good likeness of General Grant than any one which I had ever seen before. Before uncovering it, Gerhardt had said he had brought it in the hope that I would show it to some member of the General's family and get that member to point out its chief defects for correction, but I had replied that I could not venture to do that for there was a plenty of people to pester these folks without me adding myself to the number. But a glance at the bust had changed all that in an instant. I said I would go to New York in the morning and ask the family to look at the bust, and that he must come along to be within call in case they took enough interest in the matter to point out the defects. We reached the general's house at one o'clock the next afternoon, and I left Gerhardt and the bust below and went upstairs to see the family. And now, for the first time, the thought came into my mind that perhaps I was doing a foolish thing, that the family must of necessity have been pestered with such matters as this so many times that the very mention of such a thing must be nauseating to them. However, I had started, and so I might as well finish. Therefore, I said I had a young artist downstairs who had been making a small bust of the general from a photograph, and I wished they would look at it, if they were willing to do me that kindness. Jesse Grant's wife spoke up with eagerness and said, Is it the artist who made the bust of you that is in Huckleberry Finn? I said, yes. She said, with great animation, how good it was of you, Mr. Clemens, to think of that. She expressed this lively gratitude to me in various ways until I began to feel, somehow, a great sense of merit in having originated this noble idea of having a bust of General Grant made by so excellent an artist. I will not do my sagacity the discredit of saying that I did anything to remove or modify this impression that I had originated the idea and carried it out to its present state through my own ingenuity and diligence. Mrs. Jesse Grant added, how strange it is! Only two nights ago I dreamed that I was looking at your bust in Huckleberry Finn and thinking how nearly perfect it was, and then I thought that I conceived the idea of going to you 
and asking you if you could not hunt up that artist and get him to make a bust of father. Things were going on very handsomely. The persons present were Colonel Fred Grant, Mrs. Jesse Grant, and Dr. Douglas. I went down for Gerhardt, and he brought up the bust and uncovered it. All of the family present exclaimed over the excellence of the likeness, and Mrs. Jesse Grant expended some more unearned gratitude upon me. The family began to discuss the details, and then checked themselves and begged Gerhardt's pardon for criticizing. Of course he said that their criticisms were exactly what he wanted and begged them to go on. The general's wife said that in that case they would be glad to point out what seemed to them inaccuracies, but that he must not take their speeches as being criticisms upon his art at all. They found two inaccuracies, in the shape of the nose and the shape of the forehead. All were agreed that the forehead was wrong, but there was a lively dispute about the nose. Some of those present contended that the nose was nearly right, the others contended that it was distinctly wrong. The general's wife knelt on the ottoman to get a clearer view of the bust, and the others stood about her, all talking at once. Finally, the general's wife said hesitatingly, with the mien of one who is afraid he is taking a liberty and asking too much, if Mr. Gerhardt could see the general's nose and forehead himself, that would dispose of this dispute at once. Finally, the general is in the next room. Would Mr. Gerhardt mind going in there and making the correction himself? Things were indeed progressing handsomely. Of course Mr. Gerhardt lost no time in expressing his willingness. While the controversy was going on concerning the nose and the forehead, Mrs. Fred Grant joined the group, and then, presently, each of the three ladies in turn disappeared for a few minutes and came back with a handful of photographs and hand-painted miniatures of the general. These pictures had been made in every quarter of the world. One of them had been painted in Japan, but good as many of these pictures were, they were worthless as evidence for the reason that they contradicted one another in every detail. The photograph apparatus had lied as distinctly and as persistently as had the hands of the miniature artists. No two noses were alike, and no two foreheads were alike. We stepped into the general's room, all but General Badeau and Dr. Douglas. The general was stretched out in a reclining chair with his feet supported upon an ordinary chair. He was muffled up in dressing gowns and afghans, with his black woolen skull-cap on his head. The ladies took the skull-cap off and began to discuss his nose and his forehead, and they made him turn this way and that way and the other way, to get different views and profiles of his features. He took it all patiently and made no complaint. He allowed them to pull and haul him about in their own affectionate fashion, without a murmur. Mrs. Fred Grant, who is very beautiful and of the most gentle and loving character, was very active in this service, and very deft, with her graceful hands, in arranging and rearranging the general's head for inspection, and repeatedly called attention to the handsome shape of his head, a thing which reminds me that Gerhardt had picked up an old plug hat of the general's downstairs, and had remarked upon the perfect oval shape of the inside of it this oval being so uniform that the wearer of the hat could never be able to know, by the feel of it, 
whether he had it right end in front or wrong end in front, whereas the average man's head is broad at one end and narrow at the other. The general's wife placed him in various positions, none of which satisfied her, and finally she went to him and said, Ulyss, Ulyss, can't you put your feet to the floor? He did so at once and straightened himself up. During all this time the general's face wore a pleasant, contented, and, I should say, benignant aspect, but he never opened his lips once. As had often been the case before, so now his silence gave ample room to guess at what was passing in his mind, and to take it out in guessing. I will remark, in passing, that the general's hands were very thin, and they showed, far more than did his face, how his long siege of confinement and illness and insufficient food had wasted him. He was at this time suffering great and increasing pain from the cancer at the root of his tongue. But there was nothing ever discoverable in the expression of his face to betray this fact, as long as he was awake. When asleep his face would take advantage of him and make revelations. At the end of fifteen minutes Gerhardt said he believed he could correct the defects now, so we went back to the other room. Gerhardt went to work on the clay image, everybody standing round, observing and discussing with the greatest interest. Presently the general astonished us by appearing there, clad in his wraps and supporting himself in a somewhat unsure way upon a cane. He sat down on the sofa and said he could sit there if it would be for the advantage of the artist, but his wife would not allow that. She said that he might catch cold. She was for hurrying him back at once to his invalid chair. He succumbed and started back, but at the door he turned and said, then can't Mr. Gerhardt bring the clay in here and work? This was several hundred times better fortune than Gerhardt could have dreamed of. He removed his work to the general's room at once. The general stretched himself out in his chair, but said that if that position would not do he would sit up. Gerhardt said it would do very well indeed especially if it were more comfortable to the sitter than any other would be. The general watched Gerhardt's swift and noiseless fingers for some time with manifest interest in his face, and no doubt this novelty was a valuable thing to one who had spent so many weeks that were tedious with sameness and unemphasized with change or diversion. By and by, one eyelid began to droop occasionally. Then everybody stepped out of the room excepting Gerhardt and myself, and I moved to the rear, where I would be out of sight and not be a disturbing element. Harrison, the general's old colored body servant, came in presently and remained a while watching Gerhardt, and then broke out with great zeal and decision. That's the general. Yes, sir, that's the general. Mind, I tell you, that's the general. Then he went away and the place became absolutely silent. Within a few minutes afterward the general was sleeping, and for two hours he continued to sleep tranquilly, the serenity of his face disturbed only at intervals by a passing wave of pain. It was the first sleep he had had for several weeks, uninduced by narcotics. To my mind this bust, completed at this sitting, has in it more of General Grant than can be found in any other likeness of him 
that has ever been made since he was a famous man. I think it may rightly be called the best portrait of General Grant that is in existence. It has also a feature which must always be a remembrancer to this nation of what the general was passing through during the long weeks of that spring, for into the clay image went the pain which he was enduring, but which did not appear in his face when he was awake. Consequently, the bust has about it a suggestion of patient and brave and manly suffering which is infinitely touching. At the end of two hours General Badeau entered abruptly and spoke to the general, and this woke him up. But for this interruption he might have slept as much longer, possibly. Gerhardt worked on as long as it was light enough to work, and then he went away. He was to come again, and did come the following day, but at the last moment Colonel Fred Grant would not permit another sitting. He said that the face was so nearly perfect that he was afraid to allow it to be touched again, lest some of the excellence might be refined out of it, instead of adding more excellence to it. He called attention to an oil painting on the wall downstairs, and asked if we knew that man. We couldn't name him, had never seen his face before. Well, said Colonel Grant, that was a perfect portrait of my father once. It was given up by all the family to be the best that had ever been made of him. We were entirely satisfied with it, but the artist unhappily was not. He wanted to do a stroke or two to make it absolutely perfect, and he insisted on taking it back with him. After he had made those finishing touches, it didn't resemble my father or anyone else. We took it, and have always kept it as a curiosity, but with that lesson behind us, we will save this bust from a similar fate. He allowed Gerhardt to work at the hair, however. He said he might expend as much of his talent on that as he pleased, but must stop there. Gerhardt finished the hair to his satisfaction, but never touched the face again. Colonel Grant required Gerhardt to promise that he would take every pains with the clay bust and then return it to him, to keep, as soon as he had taken a mold from it. This was done. Gerhardt prepared the clay as well as he could for permanent preservation, and gave it to Colonel Grant. Up to the present day, May twenty-second, 1885, no later likeness of General Grant of any kind has been made from life and if it shall chance to remain the last ever made of him from life, coming generations can properly be grateful that one so nearly perfect of him was made after the world learned his name. End of section 7. Gerhardt and the Grant Bust. Dictated in 1885. Section 8 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. The Reverend Dr. N. Visits General Grant. Dictated, 1885. July 4th, 1885. General Grant is still living this morning. Many a person between the two oceans lay hours awake last night, listening for the booming of the fire-bells, which should speak to a nation in simultaneous voice, and tell it its calamity. The bell strokes are to be thirty seconds apart, and there will be sixty-three, the general's age. They will be striking in every town in the United States at the same moment, the first time in the world's history that the bells of a nation have tolled in unison, 
beginning at the same moment and ending at the same moment. More than once during two weeks the nation stood watching with bated breath, expecting the news of General Grant's death. The family, in their distress, desired spiritual help, and one Reverend Dr. N. was sent for to furnish it. N. had lately gone to California, where he had got a $10,000 job to preach a funeral sermon over the son of an ex-governor, a millionaire. And a most remarkable sermon it was, and worth the money. If N. got the facts right, neither he nor anybody else, any ordinary human being, was worthy to preach that youth's funeral sermon, and it was manifest that one of the disciples ought to have been imported into California for the occasion. N. came on from California at once and began his ministration at the general's bedside, and if one might trust his daily reports, the general had conceived a new and perfect interest in spiritual things. It is fair to presume that the most of N.'s daily reports originated in his own imagination. Colonel Fred Grant told me that his father was, in this matter, what he was in all matters and at all times, that is to say, perfectly willing to have family prayers going on, or anything else that could be satisfactory to anybody, or increase anybody's comfort in any way. But he also said that, while his father was a good man, and indeed as good as any man, Christian or otherwise, he was not a praying man. Some of the speeches put into General Grant's mouth were to the last degree incredible to people who knew the general, since they were such gaudy and flowering misrepresentations of that plain-spoken man's utterances. About the 14th or 15th of April, Rev. Mr. N. reported that, upon visiting the general in his sick chamber, the general pressed his hand and delivered himself of this astounding remark. Thrice have I been in the shadow of the valley of death, and thrice have I come out again. General Grant never used flowers of speech, and, dead or alive, he never could have uttered anything like that, either as a quotation or otherwise. Note, the Grant dictations ended here. General Grant died July 25, 1885. More than 300,000 sets of two volumes each of his memoirs were sold. Section 9 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. The Machine Episode. Written in the Closing Days of 1890. This episode has now spread itself over more than one-fifth of my life, a considerable stretch of time, as I am now fifty-five years old. Ten or eleven years ago, Dwight Buell, a jeweler, called at our house and was shown up to the billiard room, which was my study, and the game got more study than the other sciences. He wanted me to take some stock in a typesetting machine. He said it was at the Colt Arms factory and was about finished. I took two thousand dollars of the stock. I was always taking little chances like that, and almost always losing by it, too, a thing which I did not greatly mind, because I was always careful to risk only such amounts as I could easily afford to lose. Some time afterward I was invited to go down to the factory and see the machine. I went, promising myself nothing, for I knew all about typesetting by 
practical experience, and held the settled and solidified opinion that a successful typesetting machine was an impossibility, for the reason that a machine cannot be made to think, and the thing that sets movable type must think, or retire defeated. So the performance I witnessed did most thoroughly amaze me. Here was a machine that was really setting type, and doing it with swiftness and accuracy, too. Moreover, it was distributing its case at the same time. The distribution was automatic. The machine fed itself from a galley of dead matter, and without human help or suggestion, for it began its work of its own accord when the type channels needed filling, and stopped of its own accord when they were full enough. The machine was almost a complete compositor. It lacked but one feature. It did not justify the lines. This was done by the operator's assistant. I saw the operator set at the rate of 3,000 M's an hour, which, counting distribution, was but little short of four casemen's work. Mr. H. was there. I had known him long. I thought I knew him well. I had great respect for him and full confidence in him. He said he was already a considerable owner and was now going to take as much more of the stock as he could afford. Wherefore, I set down my name for an additional three thousand dollars. It is here that the music begins. Note, this was the Farnham machine, so called. Before very long, H. called on me and asked me what I would charge to raise a capital of five hundred thousand dollars for the manufacture of the machine. I said I would undertake it for one hundred thousand dollars. He said, raise six hundred thousand dollars, then, and take one hundred thousand dollars. I agreed. I sent for my partner Webster. He came up from New York and went back with the project. There was some correspondence. H. wrote Webster a letter. I will remark here that James W. Page, the little bright-eyed, alert, smartly-dressed inventor of the machine, is a most extraordinary compound of business thrift and commercial insanity, of cold calculation and jejune sentimentality, of veracity and falsehood, of fidelity and treachery, of nobility and baseness, of pluck and cowardice, of wasteful liberality and pitiful stinginess, of solid sense and weltering moonshine, of towering genius and trivial ambitions, of merciful bowels and a petrified heart, of colossal vanity and... Uh, but there the opposites stop. His vanity stands alone, sky-piercing, as sharp of outline as an Egyptian monolith. It is the only unpleasant feature in him that is not modified, softened, compensated by some converse characteristic. There is another point or two worth mentioning. He can persuade anybody. He can convince nobody. He has a crystal-clear mind as regards the grasping and concreting of an idea which has been lost and smothered under a chaos of baffling legal language, and yet it can always be depended upon to take the simplest half-dozen facts and draw from them a conclusion that will astonish the idiots in the asylum. It is because he is a dreamer, a visionary. His imagination runs utterly away with him. He is a poet, a most great and genuine poet, whose sublime creations are written in steel. 
He is the Shakespeare of mechanical invention. In all the ages he has no peer. Indeed, there is none that even approaches him. Whoever is qualified to fully comprehend his marvelous machine will grant that its place is upon the loftiest summit of human invention, with no kindred between it and the far foothills below. But I must explain these strange contradictions above listed, or the man will be misunderstood and wronged. His business thrift is remarkable, and it is also of a peculiar cut. He has worked at his expensive machine for more than twenty years, but always at somebody else's cost. He spent hundreds and thousands of other folks' money, yet always kept his machine and its possible patents in his own possession, unencumbered by an embarrassing lien of any kind, except once which will be referred to by and by. He could never be beguiled into putting a penny of his own into his work. Once he had a brilliant idea in the way of a wonderfully valuable application of electricity. To test it, he said, would cost but twenty-five dollars. I was paying him a salary of nearly six hundred dollars a month and was spending one thousand two hundred dollars on the machine besides. Yet he asked me to risk the twenty-five dollars and take half of the result. I declined, and he dropped the matter. Another time he was sure he was on the track of a splendid thing in electricity. It would cost only a trifle, possibly two hundred dollars, to try some experiments. I was asked to furnish the money and take half of the result. I furnished money until the sum had grown to about a thousand dollars, and everything was pronounced ready for the grand exposition. The electric current was turned on. The thing declined to go. Two years later the same thing was successfully worked out and patented by a man in the state of New York, and was at once sold for a huge sum of money and a royalty reserve besides. The drawings in the electrical journal showing the stages by which that inventor had approached the consummation of his idea, proving his way step by step as he went, were almost the twins of Page's drawings of two years before. It was almost as if the same hand had drawn both sets. Page said we had had it, and we should have known it, if we had only tried an alternating current after failing with the direct current. Said he had felt sure, at the time, that at cost of a hundred dollars he could apply the alternating test and come out triumphant. Then he added, in tones absolutely sodden with self-sacrifice and just barely touched with reproach, but you had already spent so much money on the thing that I hadn't the heart to ask you to spend any more. If I had asked him why he didn't draw on his own pocket, he would not have understood me. He could not have grasped so strange an idea as that. He would have thought there was something the matter with my mind. I am speaking honestly. He could not have understood it. A cancer of old habit and long experience could as easily understand the suggestion that it bored itself a while. In drawing contracts he is always able to take care of himself. In every instance he will work into the contract's injuries to the other party and advantages to himself, which were never considered or mentioned in the preceding verbal agreement. In one contract he got me to assign to him several hundred thousand dollars worth of property for a certain valuable consideration, said 
valuable consideration being the re-giving to me of another piece of property which was not on his to give, but already belonged to me. I quite understand that I am confessing myself a fool, but that is no matter. The reader would find it out anyway as I go along. H. was our joint lawyer, and I had every confidence in his wisdom and cleanliness. Once, when I was lending money to Page during a few months, I presently found that he was giving receipts to my representative instead of notes. But that man never lived who could catch Page so nearly asleep as to palm off on him a piece of paper which apparently satisfied a debt when it ought to acknowledge a loan. I must throw in a parenthesis here, or I shall do H an injustice. Here and there I have seemed to cast little reflections upon him. Pay no attention to them. I have no feeling about him. I have no harsh words to say about him. He is a great, fat, good-natured, kind-hearted, chicken-livered slave, with no more pride than a tramp, no more sand than a rabbit, no more moral sense than a wax figure, and no more sex than a tapeworm. He sincerely thinks he is honest. He sincerely thinks he is honorable. It is my daily prayer to God that he be permitted to live and die in those superstitions. I gave him a twentieth of my American holding at Page's request. I gave him a twentieth of my foreign holding at his own supplication. I advanced nearly forty thousand dollars in five years to keep these interests sound and valid for him. In return, he drafted every contract which I made with Page in all that time clear up to September 1890, and pronounced them good and fair, and then I signed. Yes, it is as I have said, Page is an extraordinary compound of business thrift and commercial insanity. Instances of his commercial insanity are simply innumerable. Here are some examples. When I took hold of the machine, February 6, 1886, its faults had been corrected, and a setter and a justifier could turn out about 3,500 M's an hour on it, possibly 4,000. There was no machine that could pretend rivalry to it. Business sanity would have said, put it on the market as it was, secure the field, and add improvements later. Page's business insanity said, add the improvements first and risk losing the field. And that is what he set out to do. To add a justifying mechanism to that machine would take a few months and cost $9,000 by his estimate, or $12,000 by Pratt and Whitney's. I agreed to add said justifier to that machine. There could be no sense in building a new machine, yet in total violation of the agreement, Page went immediately to work to build a new machine, although aware, by recent experience, that the cost could not fall below a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that the time consumed would be years instead of months. Well, when four years had been spent and the new machine was able to exhibit a marvelous capacity, we appointed the 12th of January for Senator Jones of Nevada to come and make an inspection. He was not promised a perfect machine, but a machine which could be perfected. He had agreed to invest one or two hundred thousand dollars in its fortunes, and had also said that if the exhibition was particularly favorable, 
he might take entire charge of the elephant. At the last moment Page concluded to add an air blast, afterward found to be unnecessary, wherefore Jones had to be turned back from New York to wait a couple of months and lose his interest in the thing. A year ago Page made what he regarded as a vast and magnanimous concession, and said I might sell the English patent for ten million dollars. A little later a man came along who thought he could bring some Englishmen who would buy that patent, and he was sent off to fetch them. He was gone so long that Page's confidence began to diminish, and with it his price. He finally got down to what he said was his very last and bottom price for that patent, $50,000. This was the only time in five years that I ever saw Page in his right mind. I could furnish other examples of Page's business insanity, enough of them to fill six or eight volumes, perhaps, but I am not writing his history. I am merely sketching his portrait. I went on footing the bills and got the machine really perfected at last at a cost of about a hundred and fifty thousand dollars instead of the original thirty thousand dollars. W. tells me that Page tried his best to cheat me out of my royalties when making a contract with the Connecticut Company. Also, that he tried to cheat me out of all share of Mr. North, inventor of the justifying mechanism, but that North frightened him with a lawsuit threat and is to get a royalty until the aggregate is two million dollars. Page and I always meet on effusively affectionate terms, and yet he knows perfectly well that if I had him in a steel trap I would shut out all human succor and watch that trap till he died. Note, the machine in the end proved a complete failure, being too complicated, too difficult to keep in order. It cost Mark Twain a total of about a hundred and ninety thousand dollars. A. B. P. End of section nine. The machine episode, written in the closing days of eighteen ninety. Section 10 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Chapter is begun in Vienna, early days, written 1897-98. So much for the earlier days and the New England branch of the Clemenses. Note, Mr. Clemens evidently intended to precede this paragraph with some data concerning his New England ancestry, but he never did so. A. B. P. The other brother settled in the South and is remotely responsible for me. He has collected his reward generations ago, whatever it was. He went South with his particular friend Fairfax, and settled in Maryland with him, but afterward went further and made his home in Virginia. This is the Fairfax whose descendants were to enjoy a curious distinction, that of being American-born English earls. The founder of the house was the Lord General Fairfax of the Parliamentary Arm in Cromwell's time. The earldom, which is of recent date, came to the American Fairfaxes through the failure of male heirs in England. Old residents of San Francisco will remember Charlie, the American Earl of the mid-sixties, tenth Lord Fairfax, according to Burke's peerage, and holder of a modest public office of some sort or other in the new mining town of Virginia City, Nevada. He was never out of America. I knew him, but not intimately. He had a golden character, and that was all his fortune. He laid his title aside and gave it a holiday until his circumstances should improve to a degree consonant with his dignity. But that time never came, I think. He was a manly man, and had fine generosities in his makeup. 
a prominent and pestilent creature named Ferguson, who was always picking quarrels with better men than himself, picked one with him one day, and Fairfax knocked him down. Ferguson gathered himself up and went off mumbling threats. Fairfax carried no arms, and refused to carry any now, though his friends warned him that Ferguson was of a treacherous disposition, and would be sure to take revenge by base means sooner or later. Nothing happened for several days. Then Ferguson took the earl by surprise and snapped a revolver at his breast. Fairfax wrenched the pistol from him and was going to shoot him, but the man fell on his knees and begged, and said, "'Don't kill me. I have a wife and children.' Fairfax was in a towering passion, but the appeal reached his heart, and he said, "'They have done me no harm,' and he let the rascal go. Back of the Virginian Clemenses is a dim procession of ancestors stretching back to Noah's time. According to tradition, some of them were pirates and slavers in Elizabeth's time, but this is no discredit to them, for so were Drake and Hawkins and the others. It was a respectable trade then, and monarchs were partners in it. In my time I have had desires to be a pirate myself. The reader, if he will look deep down in his secret heart, will find, but <laughs> never mind what he will find there. I am not writing his autobiography, but mine. Later, according to tradition, one of the procession was ambassador to Spain in the time of James I, or of Charles I, and married there and sent down a strain of Spanish blood to warm us up. Also, according to tradition, this one or another, Geoffrey Clement, by name, helped to sentence Charles to death. I have not examined into these traditions myself, partly because I was indolent, and partly because I was so busy polishing up this end of the line and trying to make it showy, but the other Clementses claim that they have made the examination and that it stood the test. Therefore I have always taken for granted that I did help Charles out of his troubles by ancestral proxy. My instincts have persuaded me, too. Whenever we have a strong and persistent and ineradicable instinct, we may be sure that it is not original with us, but inherited, inherited from away back, and hardened and perfected by the petrifying influence of time. Now, I have been always and unchangingly bitter against Charles, and I am quite certain that this feeling trickled down to me through the veins of my forebears, from the heart of that judge, for it is not my disposition to be bitter against people on my own personal account. I am not bitter against Jeffreys. I ought to be, but I am not. It indicates that my ancestors of James the Second's time were indifferent to him. I do not know why. I never could make it out, but that is what it indicates. And I have always felt friendly toward Satan. Of course, that is ancestral. It must be in the blood, for I could not have originated it. And so, by the testimony of instinct, backed by the assertions of the Clemenses, who said they had examined the records, I have always been obliged to believe that Geoffrey Clement, the martyr-maker, was an ancestor of mine, and to regard him with favor, and in fact pride. This has not had a good effect upon me, for it has made me vain, and that is a fault. It has made me set myself above people who were less fortunate in their ancestry than I and has moved me to take them down a peg, upon occasion, and say things to them which hurt them before company. A case of the kind happened in Berlin several years ago. William Walter Phelps was our minister at the Emperor's court then, and one evening he had me to dinner to meet Count S., a cabinet minister. This nobleman was of long and illustrious descent, 
Of course I wanted to let out the fact that I had some ancestors, too, but I did not want to pull them out of their graves by the ears, and I never could seem to get the chance to work them in in a way that would look sufficiently casual. I suppose Phelps was in the same difficulty. In fact, he looked distraught now and then, just as a person looks who wants to uncover an ancestor purely by accident and cannot think of a way that will seem accidental enough. But at last, after dinner, he made a try. He took us about his drawing-room, showing us the pictures, and finally stopped before a rude and ancient engraving. It was a picture of the court that tried Charles I. There was a pyramid of judges in Puritan slouch hats, and below them three bareheaded secretaries seated at a table. Mr. Phelps put his finger upon one of the three and said, with exulting indifference, an ancestor of mine. I put my finger on a judge and retorted with scathing languidness, ancestor of mine, but it is a small matter. I have others. It was not noble in me to do it. I have always regretted it since but it landed him. I wonder how he felt. However, it made no difference in our friendship, which shows that he was fine and high, notwithstanding the humbleness of his origin. And it was also creditable in me, too, that I could overlook it. I made no change in my bearing toward him, but always treated him as an equal. But it was a hard night for me in one way. Mr. Phelps, thought I was the guest of honor, and so did Count S., but I didn't, for there was nothing in my invitation to indicate it. It was just a friendly off-hand note on a card. By the time dinner was announced, Phelps was himself in a state of doubt. Something had to be done, and it was not a handy time for explanations. He tried to get me to go out with him, but I held back, then he tried S, and he also declined. There was another guest, but there was no trouble about him. We finally went out in a pile. There was a decorous plunge for seats, and I got the one at Mr. Phelps' left. The Count captured the one facing Phelps, and the other guest had to take the place of honor, since he could not help himself. We returned to the drawing-room in the original disorder. I had new shoes on, and they were tight. At eleven I was privately crying. I couldn't help it. The pain was so cruel. Conversation had been dead for an hour. S. had been due at the bedside of a dying official ever since half-past nine. At last we all rose by one blessed impulse, and went down to the street door without explanations, in a pile, and no precedence and so parted. The evening had its defects. Still I got my ancestor in, and was satisfied. Among the Virginian Clemenses were Jerry and Sherard. Jerry Clemens had a wide reputation as a good pistol shot, and once it enabled him to get on the friendly side of some drummers when they wouldn't have paid any attention to mere smooth words and arguments. He was out stumping the state at the time. The drummers were grouped in front of the stand, and had been hired by the opposition to drum while he made his speech. When he was ready to begin, he got out his revolver and laid it before him, and said in his soft, silky way, I do not wish to hurt anybody, and shall try not to, but I have got just a bullet apiece for those six drums, and if you should want to play on them, don't stand behind them. Sherard Clemens was a Republican congressman from West Virginia in the war days, and then went out to St. Louis, where the James Clemens branch lived, and still lives, and there he became a warm rebel. This was after the war. At the time that he was a Republican, I was a rebel. But by the time he had become a rebel, 
I was become, temporarily, a Republican. The Clemenses have always done the best they could to keep the political balances level, no matter how much it might inconvenience them. I did not know what had become of Sherard Clemens, but once I introduced Senator Hawley to a Republican mass meeting in New England, and then I got a bitter letter from Sherard from St. Louis. He said that the Republicans of the North, no, the Mudsills of the North, had swept away the old aristocracy of the South with fire and sword, and it ill became me, an aristocrat by blood, to train with that kind of swine. Did I forget that I was a Lambton? That was a reference to my mother's side of the house. My mother was a Lambton. Lambton with a P, for some of the American Lamptons could not spell very well in early times, and so the name suffered at their hands. She was a native of Kentucky, and married my father in Lexington in 1823, when she was twenty years old and he twenty-four. Neither of them had an overplus of property. She brought him two or three negroes, but nothing else, I think. They removed to the remote and secluded village of Jamestown in the mountain solitudes of East Tennessee. There their first crop of children was born, but as I was of a later vintage I do not remember anything about it. I was postponed, postponed to Missouri. Missouri was an unknown new state, and needed attractions. I think my eldest brother, Orion, my sisters Pamela and Margaret, and my brother Benjamin, were born in Jamestown. There may have been others, but as to that I am not sure. It was a great lift for that little village to have my parents come there. It was hoped that they would stay, so that it would become a city. It was supposed that they would stay. And so there was a boom. But by and by they went away, and prices went down, and it was many years before Jamestown got another start. I have written about Jamestown in The Gilded Age, a book of mine, but it was from hearsay, not from personal knowledge. My father left a fine estate behind him in the region round about Jamestown, seventy-five thousand acres. Note, correction, 1906, it was above one hundred thousand, it appears. When he died in 1847, he had owned it about twenty years. The taxes were almost nothing, five dollars a year for the whole, and he had always paid them regularly and kept his title perfect. He had always said that the land would not become valuable in his time, but that it would be a commodious provision for his children some day. It contained coal, copper, iron, and timber, and he said that in the course of time railways would pierce to that region, and then the property would be property in fact as well as in name. It also produced a wild grape of a promising sort. He had sent some samples to Nicholas Longworth of Cincinnati to get his judgment upon them, and Mr. Longworth had said that they would make as good wine as his Catawbas. The land contained all these riches, and also oil, but my father did not know that, and of course in those early days he would have cared nothing about it if he had known it. The oil was not discovered until about 1895. I wish I owned a couple of acres of the land now, in which case I would not be writing autobiographies for a living. My father's dying charge was, cling to the land and wait, let nothing beguile it away from you. My mother's favorite cousin, James Lampton, who figures in The Gilded Age as Colonel Sellers, always said of that land, and said it with blazing enthusiasm, too, there's millions in it, millions. It is true that he always said that about everything, and was always mistaken, too, but this time he was right, which shows that a man who goes around with a prophecy gun 
ought never to get discouraged. If he will keep up his heart and fire at everything he sees, he is bound to hit something by and by. Many persons regarded Colonel Sellers as a fiction, an invention, an extravagant impossibility, and did me the honor to call him a creation, but they were mistaken. I merely put him on paper as he was. He was not a person who could be exaggerated. The incidents which looked most extravagant, both in the book and on the stage, were not inventions of mine, but were facts of his life, and I was present when they were developed. John T. Raymond's audiences used to come near to dying with laughter over the turnip-eating scene, but, extravagant as the scene was, it was faithful to the facts in all its absurd details. The thing happened in Lampton's own house, and I was present. In fact, I was myself the guest who ate the turnips. In the hands of a great actor, that piteous scene would have dimmed any manly spectator's eyes with tears, and racked his ribs apart with laughter at the same time. But Raymond was great in humorous portrayal only. In that he was superb, he was wonderful, in a word, great. In all things else he was a pygmy of pygmies. The real Colonel Sellers, as I knew him in James Lampton, was a pathetic and beautiful spirit, a manly man, a straight and honorable man, a man with a big, foolish, unselfish heart in his bosom, a man born to be loved. And he was loved by all his friends, and by his family worshipped. It is the right word. To them he was but little less than a god. The real Colonel Sellers was never on the stage. Only half of him was there. Raymond could not play the other half of him. It was above his level. There was only one man who could have played the whole of Colonel Sellers, and that was Frank Mayo. Note, Raymond was playing Colonel Sellers in 1876 and along there. About twenty years later, Mayo dramatized Puddinhead Wilson and played the title role delightfully. It is a world of surprises. They fall, too, where one is least expecting them. When I introduced Sellers into the book, Charles Dudley Warner, who was writing the story with me, proposed a change of Sellers' Christian name. Ten years before, in a remote corner of the West, he had come across a man named Eshal Sellers, and he thought that Eshal was just the right and fitting name for our Sellers, since it was odd and quaint and all that. I liked the idea, but I said that that man might turn up and object. But Warner said it couldn't happen, that he was doubtless dead by this time, and be he dead or alive, we must have the name. It was exactly the right one, and we couldn't do without it. So the change was made. Warner's man was a farmer in a cheap and humble way. When the book had been out a week, a college-bred gentleman of courtly manners and ducal upholstery arrived in Hartford in a sultry state of mind, and with a libel suit in his eye, and his name was Eshal Sellers. He had never heard of the other one, and had never been within a thousand miles of him. This damaged aristocrat's program was quite definite and businesslike. The American Publishing Company must suppress the edition as far as printed and change the name in the plates, or stand a suit for ten thousand dollars. He carried away the company's promise and many apologies, and we changed the name back to Colonel Mulberry Sellers in the plates. Apparently there is nothing that cannot happen. Even the existence of two unrelated men wearing the impossible name of Eshal Sellers is a possible thing. James Lampton floated all his days in a tinted mist of magnificent dreams and died at last without seeing one of them realized. I saw him last in 1884, when it had been 
twenty-six years since I ate the basin of raw turnips and washed them down with a bucket of water in his house. He was become old and white-headed, but he entered to me in the same old breezy way of his earlier life, and he was all there yet, not a detail wanting, the happy light in his eye, the abounding hope in his heart, the persuasive tongue, the miracle-breeding imagination, they were all there. And before I could turn around he was polishing up his Aladdin's lamp and flashing the secret riches of the world before me. I said to myself, I did not overdraw him by a shade. I set him down as he was, and he is the same man today. Cable will recognize him. I asked him to excuse me a moment and ran into the next room, which was Cable's. Cable and I were stumping the Union on a reading tour. I said, I am going to leave your door open so that you can listen. There is a man in there who is interesting. I went back and asked Lampton what he was doing now. He began to tell me of a small venture he had begun in New Mexico through his son. Only a little thing, a mere trifle, partly to amuse my leisure, partly to keep my capital from lying idle, but mainly to develop the boy, develop the boy. Fortune's wheel is ever revolving. He may have to work for his living some day, as strange things have happened in this world, but it's only a little thing, a mere trifle, as I said. And so it was, as he began it. But under his deft hands it grew and blossomed and spread, oh, beyond imagination. At the end of half an hour he finished, finished with the remark uttered in an adorably languid manner. Yes, it is but a trifle, as things go nowadays, a bagatelle, but amusing. It passes the time. The boy thinks great things of it, but he is young, you know, and imaginative, lacks the experience which comes of handling large affairs, and which tempers the fancy and perfects the judgment. I suppose there's a couple of millions in it, possibly three, but not more, I think. Still, for a boy, you know, just starting in life, it is not bad. I should not want him to make a fortune, let that come later. It could turn his head at his time of life, and in many ways be a damage to him. Then he said something about his having left his pocket-book lying on the table in the main drawing-room at home, and about its being after banking hours now, and I stopped him there and begged him to honor Cable and me by being our guest at the lecture, with as many friends as might be willing to do us the like honor. He accepted, and he thanked me, as a prince might, who had granted us a grace. The reason I stopped his speech about the tickets was because I saw that he was going to ask me to furnish them to him and let him pay next day, and I knew that if he made the debt he would pay it if he had to pawn his clothes. After a little further chat he shook hands heartily and affectionately and took his leave. Cable put his head in at the door and said, That was Colonel Sellers. As I have said, that vast plot of Tennessee land was held by my father twenty years, intact. When he died in 1847, we began to manage it ourselves. Forty years afterward, we had managed it all the way except ten thousand acres, and gotten nothing to remember the sales by. About 1887, possibly it was earlier, the ten thousand went. My brother found a chance to trade it for a house and lot in the town of Corey, in the oil regions of Pennsylvania. About 1894 he sold this property for $250. That ended the Tennessee land. If any penny of cash ever came out of my father's wise investment but that, 
I have no recollection of it. No, I am overlooking a detail. It furnished me a field for sellers and a book. Out of my half of the book I got $20,000, perhaps something more. Out of the play I got $75,000, just about a dollar an acre. It is curious. I was not alive when my father made the investment, therefore he was not intending any partiality, yet I was the only member of the family that ever profited by it. I shall have occasion to mention this land again now and then as I go along, for it influenced our life in one way or another during more than a generation. Whenever things grew black, it rose and put out its hopeful seller's hand and cheered us up and said, Do not be afraid. Trust in me. Wait. It kept us hoping and hoping during forty years and forsook us at last. It put our energies to sleep and made visionaries of us, dreamers and indolent. We were always going to be rich next year, no occasion to work. It is good to begin life poor. It is good to begin life rich. These are wholesome. But to begin it poor and prospectively rich, the man who has not experienced it cannot imagine the curse of it. My parents removed to Missouri in the early thirties. I do not remember just when, for I was not born then and cared nothing for such things. It was a long journey in those days, and must have been a rough and tiresome one. The home was made in the wee village of Florida, in Monroe County, and I was born there in 1835. The village contained a hundred people, and I increased the population by one per cent. It is more than many of the best men in history could have done for a town. It may not be modest in me to refer to this, but it is true. There is no record of a person doing as much, not even Shakespeare. But I did it for Florida, and it shows that I could have done it for any place, even London, I suppose. Recently someone in Missouri has sent me a picture of the house I was born in. Heretofore I have always stated that it was a palace, but I shall be more guarded now. I used to remember my brother Henry walking into a fire outdoors when he was a week old. It was remarkable in me to remember a thing like that, and it was still more remarkable that I should cling to the delusion for thirty years that I did remember it, for, of course, it never happened. He would not have been able to walk at that age. If I had stopped to reflect, I should not have burdened my memory with that impossible rubbish so long. It is believed by many people that an impression deposited in a child's memory within the first two years of its life cannot remain there five years, but that is an error. The incident of Benvenuto Cellini and the Salamander must be accepted as authentic and trustworthy, and then that remarkable and indisputable instance in the experience of Helen Keller. However, I will speak of that at another time. For many years I believed that I remembered helping my grandfather drink his whiskey toddy when I was six weeks old, but I do not tell about that any more now. I am grown old, and my memory is not as active as it used to be. When I was younger I could remember anything, whether it had happened or not. But my faculties are decaying now, and soon I shall be so I cannot remember any but the things that never happened. It is sad to go to pieces like this, but we all have to do it. My uncle, John A. Quarles, was a farmer, and his place was in the country four miles from Florida. He had eight children and fifteen or twenty negroes, and was also fortunate in other ways, particularly in his character. I have not come across a better man than he was. I was his guest for two or three months every year, 
from the fourth year after we removed to Hannibal till I was eleven or twelve years old. I have never consciously used him or his wife in a book, but his farm has come very handy to me in literature once or twice. In Huck Finn and in Tom Sawyer, detective, I moved it down to Arkansas. It was all of six hundred miles, but it was no trouble. It was not a very large farm, five hundred acres, perhaps, but I could have done it if it had been twice as large. And as for the morality of it, I cared nothing for that. I would move a state if the exigencies of literature required it. It was a heavenly place for a boy, that farm of my Uncle John's. The house was a double log one, with a spacious floor roofed in, connecting it with the kitchen. In the summer the table was set in the middle of that shady and breezy floor, and the sumptuous meals, well, it makes me cry to think of them. Fried chicken, roast pig, wild and tame turkeys, ducks and geese, venison just killed, squirrels, rabbits, pheasants, partridges, prairie chickens, biscuits, hot batter cakes, hot buckwheat cakes, hot wheat bread, hot rolls, hot corn pone, fresh corn boiled on the ear, succotash, butter beans, string beans, tomatoes, peas, Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes, buttermilk, sweet milk, clabber, watermelons, muskmelons, cantaloupes, all fresh from the garden, apple pie, peach pie, pumpkin pie, apple dumplings, peach cobbler, I can't remember the rest. The way that the things were cooked was perhaps the main splendor, particularly a certain few of the dishes. For instance, the cornbread, the hot biscuits, and wheat bread, and the fried chicken. These things have never been properly cooked in the North. In fact, no one there is able to learn the art so far as my experience goes. The North thinks it knows how to make cornbread, but this is mere superstition. Perhaps no bread in the world is quite so good as southern cornbread and perhaps no bread in the world is quite so bad as the northern imitation of it. The North seldom tries to fry chicken, and this is well. The art cannot be learned north of the line of Mason and Dixon, nor anywhere in Europe. That is not hearsay, it is experience that is speaking. In Europe it is imagined that the custom of serving various kinds of bread blazing hot is American, but that is too broad a spread. It is custom in the South, but is much less than that in the North. In the North and in Europe hot bread is considered unhealthy. This is probably another fussy superstition, like the European superstition that ice water is unhealthy. Europe does not need ice water and does not drink it, and yet, notwithstanding this, its word for it is better than ours because it describes it, whereas ours doesn't. Europe calls it iced water. Our word describes water made from melted ice, a drink which has a characterless taste and which we have but little acquaintance with. It seems a pity that the world should throw away so many good things merely because they are unwholesome. I doubt if God has given us any refreshment which, taken in moderation, is unwholesome, except microbes. Yet there are people who strictly deprive themselves of each and every edible, drinkable, and smokable which has in any way acquired a shady reputation. They pay this price for health, and health is all they get for it. How strange it is! It is like paying out your whole fortune for a cow that has gone dry. The farmhouse stood in the middle of a very large yard, and the yard was fenced on three sides with rails and on the rear side with high palings. Against these stood the smokehouse, 
Beyond the palings was the orchard. Beyond the orchard were the negro quarters and the tobacco fields. The front yard was entered over a stile made of sawed-off logs of graduated heights. I do not remember any gate. In a corner of the yard were a dozen lofty hickory trees and a dozen black walnuts, and in the nutting season riches were to be gathered there. Down a piece, abreast the house, stood a little log cabin against the rail fence, and there the woody hill fell sharply away, past the barns, the corn crib, the stables, and the tobacco curing house, to a limpid brook which sang along over its gravelly bed, and curved and frisked in and out, and here and there and yonder, in the deep shade of overhanging foliage and vines, a divine place for wading, and it had swimming pools, too, which were forbidden to us, and therefore much frequented by us. For we were little Christian children, and had early been taught the value of forbidden fruit. In the little log cabin lived a bedridden, white-headed slave woman, whom we visited daily and looked upon with awe, for we believed she was upward of a thousand years old, and had talked with Moses. The younger negroes credited these statistics, and had furnished them to us in good faith. We accommodated all the details which came to us about her, and so we believed that she had lost her health in the long desert trip coming out of Egypt, and had never been able to get it back again. She had a round, bald place on the crown of her head, and we used to creep around and gaze at it in reverent silence, and reflect that it was caused by fright through seeing Pharaoh drowned. We called her Aunt Hannah, southern fashion. She was superstitious, like the other negroes. Also like them she was deeply religious. Like them she had great faith in prayer and employed it in all ordinary exigencies but not in cases where a dead certainty of result was urgent. Whenever witches were around, she tied up the remnant of her wool in little tufts with white thread, and this promptly made the witches impotent. All the negroes were friends of ours, and with those of our own age we were in effect comrades. I say in effect, using the phrase as a modification, we were comrades, and yet not comrades color and condition interposed a subtle line which both parties were conscious of and which rendered complete fusion impossible we had a faithful and affectionate good friend ally and adviser in uncle dan'l a middle-aged slave whose head was the best one in the negro quarter whose sympathies were wide and warm and whose heart was honest and simple and knew no guile he has served me well these many, many years. I have not seen him for more than half a century, and yet, spiritually, I have had his welcome company a good part of that time, and have staged him in books under his own name and as Jim, and carted him all around to Hannibal, down the Mississippi on a raft, and even across the desert of Sahara in a balloon and he has endured it all with the patience and friendliness and loyalty which were his birthright. It was on the farm that I got my strong liking for his race and my appreciation of certain of its fine qualities. This feeling and this estimate have stood the test of sixty years and more, and have suffered no impairment. The black face is as welcome to me now as it was then." In my schoolboy days I had no aversion to slavery. I was not aware that there was anything wrong about it. No one arraigned it in my hearing. The local papers said nothing against it. The local pulpit taught us that God approved it, that it was a holy thing, and that the doubter need only look in the Bible if he wished to settle his mind, and then the texts were read aloud to us, to make the matter sure. If the slaves themselves had an aversion to slavery, they were wise and said nothing. 
In Hannibal we seldom saw a slave misused. On the farm, never. There was, however, one small incident of my boyhood days which touched this matter, and it must have meant a good deal to me, or it would not have stayed in my memory, clear and sharp, vivid and shallowless, all these slow drifting years. We had a little slave boy whom we had hired from someone there in Hannibal. He was from the eastern shore of Maryland, and had been brought away from his family and his friends halfway across the American continent and sold. He was a cheery spirit, innocent and gentle, and the noisiest creature that ever was, perhaps. All day long he was singing, whistling, yelling, whooping, laughing. It was maddening, devastating, unendurable. At last one day I lost all my temper and went raging to my mother and said Sandy had been singing for an hour without a single break and I couldn't stand it and wouldn't she please shut him up. The tears came into her eyes and her lip trembled and she said something like this, Poor thing, when he sings it shows that he is not remembering and that comforts me, but when he is still I am afraid he is thinking, and I cannot bear it. He will never see his mother again. If he can sing, I must not hinder it, but be thankful for it. If you were older you would understand me. Then that friendless child's noise would make you glad." It was a simple speech, and made up of small words, but it went home and Sandy's noise was not a trouble to me any more. She never used large words, but she had a natural gift for making small ones do effective work. She lived to reach the neighborhood of ninety years, and was capable with her tongue to the last, especially when a meanness or an injustice roused her spirit. She has come handy to me several times in my books, where she figures as Tom Sawyer's Aunt Polly. I fitted her out with a dialect and tried to think up other improvements for her, but did not find any. I used Sandy once also. It was in Tom Sawyer. I tried to get him to whitewash the fence, but it did not work. I do not remember what name I called him by in the book. I can see the farm yet, with perfect clearness. I can see all its belongings, all its details. The family room of the house, with a trundle bed in one corner and a spinning wheel in another, a wheel whose rising and falling wail heard from a distance was the mournfulest of all sounds to me, and made me homesick and low-spirited, and filled my atmosphere with the wandering spirits of the dead. The vast fireplace, piled high on winter nights, with flaming hickory logs from whose ends a sugary sap bubbled out, but did not go to waste, for we scraped it off and ate it. The lazy cat spread out on the rough hearthstones, the drowsy dogs braced against the jams and blinking, my aunt in one chimney corner knitting, my uncle in the other smoking his corn-cob pipe the slick and carpetless oak floor faintly mirroring the dancing flame-tongues and freckled with black indentations where fire-coals had popped out and died a leisurely death, half a dozen children romping in the background twilight, split-bottomed chairs here and there, some with rockers, a cradle out of service but waiting with confidence. In the early cold mornings a snuggle of children in shirts and chemises occupying the hearthstone and procrastinating, they could not bear to leave that comfortable place and go out on the wind-swept floor space between the house and kitchen where the general tin basin stood, and wash. Along outside of the front fence ran the country road, dusty in the summer time, and a good place for snakes. They liked to lie in it and sun themselves. When they were rattlesnakes or puff adders, we killed them. When they were black snakes or racers, or belonged to the fabled hoop breed, we fled without shame. 
when they were house snakes or garters we carried them home and put them in aunt patsy's work basket for a surprise for she was prejudiced against snakes and always when she took the basket in her lap and they began to climb out of it it disordered her mind she never could seem to get used to them her opportunities went for nothing and she was always cold toward bats too and could not bear them and yet i think a bat is as friendly a bird as there is my mother was aunt patsy's sister and had the same wild superstitions a bat is beautifully soft and silky i do not know any creature that is pleasanter to the touch or is more grateful for caressings if offered in the right spirit i know all about these coleoptera because our great cave three miles below hannibal was multitudinously stocked with them and often i brought them home to amuse my mother with it was easy to manage if it was a school day because then i had ostensibly been to school and hadn't any bats she was not a suspicious person but full of trust and confidence and when i said there's something in my coat pocket for you she would put her hand in but she always took it out again herself i didn't have to tell her it was remarkable the way she couldn't learn to like private bats the more experience she had the more she could not change her views i think she was never in the cave in her life but everybody else went there many excursion parties came from considerable distance up and down the river to visit the cave it was miles in extent and was a tangled wilderness of narrow and lofty clefts and passages it was an easy place to get lost in anybody could do it including the bats i got lost in it myself along with a lady and our last candle burned down to almost nothing before we glimpsed the search party's lights winding about in the distance injun joe the half-breed got lost in there once and would have starved to death if the bats had run short but there was no chance of that there were myriads of them he told me all his story in the book called tom sawyer i starved him entirely to death in the cave but that was in the interest of art it never happened general gaines who was our first town drunkard before jimmy finn got the place was lost in there for the space of a week and finally pushed his handkerchief out of a hole in a hilltop near saverton several miles down the river from the cave's mouth and somebody saw it and dug him out there is nothing the matter with his statistics except the handkerchief i knew him for years and he hadn't any but it could have been his nose that would attract attention the cave was an uncanny place for it contained a corpse the corpse of a young girl of fourteen it was in a glass cylinder enclosed in a copper one which was suspended from a rail which bridged a narrow passage the body was preserved in alcohol and it was said that loafers and rowdies used to drag it up by the hair and look at the dead face the girl was the daughter of a st louis surgeon of extraordinary ability and wide celebrity he was an eccentric man and did many strange things he put the poor thing in that forlorn place himself beyond the road where the snakes sunned themselves was a dense young thicket and through it a dim lighted path led a quarter of a mile then out of the dimness one emerged abruptly upon a level great prairie which was covered with wild strawberry plants vividly starred with prairie pinks and walled in on all sides by forests the strawberries were fragrant and fine and in the season we were generally there in the crisp freshness of the early morning while the dew beads still sparkled upon the grass and the woods were ringing with the first songs of the birds down the forest slopes to the left were the swings they were made of bark stripped from hickory saplings 
when they became dry they were dangerous they usually broke when a child was forty feet in the air and this was why so many bones had to be mended every year i had no ill luck myself but none of my cousins escaped there were eight of them and at one time and another they broke fourteen arms among them but it cost next to nothing for the doctor worked by the year twenty-five dollars for the whole family i remember two of the florida doctors chowning and meredith they not only tended an entire family for twenty-five dollars a year but furnished the medicines themselves good measure too only the largest persons could hold a whole dose castor oil was the principal beverage the dose was half a dipperful with half a dipperful of norland's molasses added to help it down and make it taste good which it never did the next standby was calomel the next rhubarb and the next jalap then they bled the patient and put mustard plasters on him it was a dreadful system and yet the death rate was not heavy the calomel was nearly sure to salivate the patient and cost him some of his teeth there were no dentists when teeth became touched with decay or were otherwise ailing the doctor knew of but one thing to do he fetched his tongs and dragged them out if the jaw remained it was not his fault doctors were not called in cases of ordinary illness the family grandmother attended to those every old woman was a doctor and gathered her own medicines in the woods and knew how to compound doses that would stir the vitals of a cast-iron dog and then there was the indian doctor a grave savage remnant of his tribe deeply read in the mysteries of nature and the secret properties of herbs and most backwoodsmen had high faith in his powers and could tell of wonderful cures achieved by him in mauritius away off yonder in the solitudes of the indian ocean there is a person who answers to our indian doctor of the old times he is a negro and has had no teaching as a doctor yet there is one disease which he is master of and can cure and the doctors can't they send for him when they have a case it is a child's disease of a strange and deadly sort and the negro cures it with a herb medicine which he makes himself from a prescription which has come down to him from his father and grandfather he will not let any one see it he keeps the secret of its components to himself and it is feared that he will die without divulging it then there will be consternation in mauritius i was told these things by the people there in eighteen ninety six we had the faith doctor too in those early days a woman her specialty was toothache she was a farmer's old wife and lived five miles from hannibal she would lay her hand on the patient's jaw and said believe and the cure was prompt mrs utterbeck i remember her very well twice i rode out there behind my mother horseback and saw the cure performed my mother was the patient dr meredith removed to hannibal by and by and was our family physician there and saved my life several times still he was a good man and meant well let it go i was always told that i was a sickly and precarious and tiresome and uncertain child and lived mainly on allopathic medicines during the first seven years of my life i asked my mother about this in her old age she was in her eighty-eighth year and said i suppose that during all that time you were uneasy about me yes the whole time afraid i wouldn't live after a reflective pause ostensibly to think out the facts no afraid you would the country schoolhouse was three miles from my uncle's farm 
It stood in a clearing in the woods and would hold about twenty-five boys and girls. We attended the school with more or less regularity, once or twice a week in summer, walking to it in the cool of the morning by the forest paths, and back in the glooming at the end of the day. All the pupils brought their dinners in baskets, corn dodger, buttermilk, and other good things, and sat in the shade of the trees at noon and ate them. It is the part of my education which I look back upon with the most satisfaction. My first visit to the school was when I was seven, a strapping girl of fifteen, in the customary sunbonnet and calico dress, asked me if I used tobacco. Meaning, did I chew it? I said no. It roused her scorn. She reported me to all the crowd and said, Here is a boy, seven years old, who can't chew tobacco. By the looks and comments which this produced, I realized that I was a degraded object and was cruelly ashamed of myself. I determined to reform, but I only made myself sick. I was not able to learn to chew tobacco. I learned to smoke fairly well, but that did not conciliate anybody, and I remained a poor thing and characterless. I longed to be respected, but I never was able to rise. Children have but little charity for one another's defects. As I have said, I spent some part of every year at the farm, until I was twelve or thirteen years old. The life which I led there with my cousins was full of charm, and so is the memory of it yet. I can call back the solemn twilight and mystery of the deep woods, the earthy smells, the faint odors of the wild flowers, the sheen of rain-washed foliage, the rattling clatter of drops when the wind shook the trees, the far-off hammering of woodpeckers and the muffled drumming of wood pheasants in the remoteness of the forest, the snapshot glimpses of disturbed wild creatures scurrying through the grass, I can call it all back and make it as real as it ever was and as blessed. I can call back the prairie and its loneliness and peace and a vast hawk hanging motionless in the sky with his wings spread wide and the blue of the vault showing through the fringe of their end feathers. I can see the woods in their autumn dress, the oaks purple, the hickories washed with gold, the maples and the sumacs luminous with crimson fires, and I can hear the rustle made by the fallen leaves as we plowed through them. I can see the blue clusters of wild grapes hanging among the foliage of the saplings, and I remember the taste of them and the smell. I know how the wild blackberries looked and how they tasted, and the same with the pawpaws, the hazelnuts, and the persimmons, and I can feel the thumping rain upon my head of hickory nuts and walnuts when we were out in the frosty dawn to scramble for them with the pigs, and the gusts of wind loosed them and sent them down. I know the stain of blackberries, and how pretty it is, and I know the stain of walnut hulls, and how little it mines soap and water, also what grudged experience it had of either of them. I know the taste of maple sap, and when to gather it, and how to arrange the troughs and the delivery tubes, and how to boil down the juice and how to hook the sugar after it is made, also how much better hooked sugar tastes than any that is honestly come by, let bigots say what they will. I know how a prize watermelon looks when it is sunning its fat rotundity among pumpkin vines and cymblins. I know how to tell when it is ripe without plugging it. I know how inviting it looks when it is cooling itself in a tub of water under the bed, waiting. 
I know how it looks when it lies on the table in the sheltered great floor space between house and kitchen, and the children gathered for the sacrifice, and their mouths watering. I know the crackling sound it makes when the carving knife enters its end, and I can see the split fly along in front of the blade as the knife cleaves its way to the other end. I can see its halves fall apart and display the rich red meat and the black seeds and the heart standing up, a luxury fit for the elect. I know how a boy looks behind a yard-long slice of that melon, and I know how he feels, for I have been there. I know the taste of the watermelon which has been honestly come by, and I know the taste of the watermelon which has been acquired by art. Both taste good, but the experienced know which tastes better. I know the look of green apples and peaches and pears on the trees, and I know how entertaining they are when they are inside of a person. I know how ripe ones look when they are piled in pyramids under the trees, and how pretty they are and how vivid their colors. I know how a frozen apple looks in a barrel down cellar in the winter time, and how hard it is to bite, and how the frost makes the teeth ache, and yet how good it is notwithstanding. I know the disposition of elderly people to select the specked apples for the children, and I once knew ways to beat the game. I know the look of an apple that is roasting and sizzling on a hearth on a winter's evening, and I know the comfort that comes of eating it hot, along with some sugar and a drench of cream. I know the delicate art and mystery of so cracking hickory nuts and walnuts on a flat iron with a hammer that the kernels will be delivered whole, and I know how the nuts taken in conjunction with winter apples, cider, and doughnuts make old people's old tales and old jokes sound fresh and crisp and enchanting, and juggle an evening away before you know what went with the time. I know the look of Uncle Dan'l's kitchen, as it was on the privileged nights when I was a child, and I can see the white and black children grouped on the hearth, with the firelight playing on their faces, and the shadows flickering upon the walls, clear back toward the cavernous gloom of the rear, and I can hear Uncle Dan'l telling the immortal tales which Uncle Remus Harris was to gather into his book, and charm the world with by and by, and I can feel again the creepy joy which quivered through me when the time for the ghost story was reached, and the sense of regret, too, which came over me, for it was always the last story of the evening, and there was nothing between it and the unwelcome bed. I can remember the bare wooden stairway in my uncle's house, and the turn to the left above the landing, and the rafters, and the slanting roof over my bed, and the squares of moonlight on the floor, and the white cold world of snow outside, seen through the curtainless window. I can remember the howling of the wind, and the quaking of the house on stormy nights, and how snug and cozy one felt under the blankets listening, and how the powdery snow used to sift in around the sashes, and lie in little ridges on the floor, and make the place look chilly in the morning, and curb the wild desire to get up, in case there was any. I can remember how very dark that room was, in the dark of the moon, and how packed it was with ghostly stillness when one woke up by accident away in the night, and forgotten sins came flocking out of the secret chambers of the memory, and wanted a hearing, and how ill-chosen the time seemed for this kind of business, and how dismal was the hoo-hooing of the owl, and the wailing of the wolf sent mourning by on the night wind. I remember the raging of the rain on that roof, summer nights, 
and how pleasant it was to lie and listen to it and enjoy the white splendor of the lightning and the majestic booming and crashing of the thunder it was a very satisfactory room and there was a lightning rod which was reachable from the window an adorable and skittish thing to climb up and down summer nights when there were duties on hand of a sort to make privacy desirable i remember the coon and possum hunts nights with the negroes and the long marches through the black gloom of the woods and the excitement which fired everybody when the distant bay of an experienced dog announced that the game was treed then the wild scramblings and stumblings through briars and bushes and over roots to get to the spot then the lighting of a fire and the felling of the tree the joyful frenzy of the dogs and the negroes and the weird picture it all made in the red glare i remember it all well and the delight that every one got out of it except the coon i remember the pigeon seasons when the birds would come in millions and cover the trees and by their weight break down the branches they were clubbed to death with sticks guns were not necessary and were not used i remember the squirrel hunts and prairie chicken hunts and wild turkey hunts and all that and how we turned out mornings while it was still dark to go on these expeditions and how chilly and dismal it was and how often i regretted that i was well enough to go a toot on a tin horn brought twice as many dogs as were needed and in their happiness they raced and scampered about and knocked small people down and made no end of unnecessary noise at the word they vanished away toward the woods and we drifted silently after them in the melancholy gloom but presently the gray dawn stole over the world the birds piped up then the sun rose and poured light and comfort all around and everything was fresh and dewy and fragrant and life was a boon again after three hours of tramping we arrived back wholesomely tired overladen with game very hungry and just in time for breakfast end of section ten chapters begun in vienna early days written eighteen ninety seven ninety eight section eleven of mark twain's autobiography this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman jane lampton clemens this was my mother when she died in october eighteen ninety she was well along in her eighty-eighth year a mighty age a well-contested fight for life for one who at forty was so delicate of body as to be accounted a confirmed invalid and destined to pass soon away i knew her well during the first twenty-five years of my life but after that i saw her only at wide intervals for we lived many days journey apart i am not proposing to write about her but merely to talk about her not give her formal history but merely make illustrative extracts from it so to speak furnish flashlight glimpses of her character not a processional view of her career technically speaking she had no career but she had a character and it was of a fine and striking and lovable sort what becomes of the multitudinous photographs which one's mind takes of people out of the millions which my mental camera must have taken of this first and closest friend only one clear and strongly defined one of her early date remains it dates back forty-seven years she was forty years old then and i was eight she held me by the hand and we were kneeling by the bedside of my brother two years older than i who lay dead and the tears were flowing down her cheeks 
unchecked, and she was moaning. That dumb sign of anguish was perhaps new to me, since it made upon me a very strong impression, an impression which holds its place still with the picture which it helped to intensify and make memorable. She had a slender, small body, but a large heart, a heart so large that everybody's grief and everybody's joys found welcome in it, and hospitable accommodation. The greatest difference which I find between her and the rest of the people whom I have known is this, and it is a remarkable one. Those others felt a strong interest in a few things, whereas to the very day of her death she felt a strong interest in the whole world and everything and everybody in it. In all her life she never knew such a thing as a half-hearted interest in affairs and people, or an interest which drew a line and left out certain affairs, and was indifferent to certain people. The invalid who takes a strenuous and indestructible interest in everything and everybody but himself, and to whom a dull moment is an unknown thing and an impossibility, is a formidable adversary for disease and a hard invalid to vanquish. I am certain that it was this feature of my mother's makeup that carried her so far toward ninety. Her interest in people and other animals was warm, personal, friendly. She always found something to excuse, and as a rule to love in the toughest of them, even if she had to put it there herself. She was the natural ally and friend of the friendless. It was believed that, Presbyterian as she was, she could be beguiled into saying a soft word for the devil himself, and so the experiment was tried. The abuse of Satan began. One conspirator after another added his bitter word, his malign reproach, his pitiless censure, till at last, sure enough, the unsuspecting subject of the trick walked into the trap. She admitted that the indictment was sound, that Satan was utterly wicked and abandoned, just as these people had said, but would any claim that he had been treated fairly? A sinner was but a sinner. Satan was just that, like the rest. What saves the rest? Their own efforts alone? No, or none might ever be saved. To their feeble efforts is added the mighty help of pathetic, appealing, imploring prayers that go up daily out of all the churches in Christendom and out of myriads upon myriads of pitying hearts. But who prays for Satan? Who in eighteen centuries has had the common humanity to pray for the one sinner that needed it most, our one fellow and brother who most needed a friend yet had not a single one, the one sinner among us all who had the highest and clearest right to every Christian's daily and nightly prayers for the plain and unassailable reason that his was the first and greatest need, he being among the sinners the supremest. This friend of Satan was a most gentle spirit and an unstudied and unconscious pathos was her native speech. When her pity or her indignation was stirred by hurt or shame inflicted upon some defenseless person or creature, she was the most eloquent person I have heard speak. 
it was seldom eloquence of a fiery or violent sort but gentle pitying persuasive appealing and so genuine and so nobly and simply worded and so touchingly uttered that many times i have seen it win the reluctant and splendid applause of tears whenever anybody or any creature was being oppressed the fears that belonged to her sex and her small stature retired to the rear and her soldierly qualities came promptly to the front one day in our village i saw a vicious devil of a corsican a common terror in the town chasing his grown daughter past cautious male citizens with a heavy rope in his hand and declaring he would wear it out on her my mother spread her door wide to the refugee and then instead of closing and locking it after her stood in it and stretched her arms across it barring the way the man swore cursed threatened her with his rope but she did not flinch or show any sign of fear she only stood straight and fine and lashed him shamed him derided him defied him in tones not audible to the middle of the street but audible to the man's conscience and dormant manhood and he asked her pardon and gave her his rope and said with a most great and blasphemous oath that she was the bravest woman he ever saw and so went his way without other word and troubled her no more he and she were always good friends after that for in her he had found a long-felt want somebody who was not afraid of him one day in st louis she walked out into the street and greatly surprised a burly cartman who was beating his horse over the head with the butt of his heavy whip for she took the whip away from him and then made such a persuasive appeal in behalf of the ignorantly offending horse that he was tripped into saying he was to blame and also into volunteering a promise which of course he couldn't keep for he was not built in that way a promise that he wouldn't ever abuse a horse again that sort of interference in behalf of abused animals was a common thing with her all her life and her manner must have been without offense and her good intent transparent for she always carried her point and also won the courtesy and often the friendly applause of the adversary all the race of dumb animals had a friend in her by some subtle sign the homeless hunted bedraggled and disreputable cat recognized her at a glance as the born refuge and champion of his sort and followed her home his instinct was right he was as welcome as the prodigal son we had nineteen cats at one time in eighteen forty five and there wasn't one in the lot that had any character not one that had any merit except the cheap and tawdry merit of being unfortunate they were a vast burden to us all including my mother but they were out of luck and that was enough they had to stay however better these than no pets at all children must have pets and we were not allowed to have caged ones an imprisoned creature was out of the question my mother would not have allowed a rat to be restrained of its liberty in the small town of hannibal missouri when i was a boy everybody was poor but didn't know it and everybody was comfortable and did know it and there were grades of society 
people of good family, people of unclassified family, people of no family. Everybody knew everybody, and was affable to everybody, and nobody put on any visible airs, yet the class lines were quite clearly drawn, and the familiar social life of each class was restricted to that class. It was a little democracy which was full of liberty, equality, and Fourth of July, and sincerely so, too. Yet you perceived that the aristocratic taint was there. It was there, and nobody found fault with the fact, or ever stopped to reflect that its presence was an inconsistency. I suppose that this state of things was mainly due to the circumstance that the town's population had come from slave states and still had the institution of slavery with them in their new home. My mother, with her large nature and liberal sympathies, was not intended for an aristocrat, yet through her breeding she was one. Few people knew it, perhaps, for it was an instinct, I think, rather than a principle. So its outward manifestation was likely to be accidental, not intentional, and also not frequent. But I knew of that weak spot. I knew that privately she was proud that the Lamptons, now Earls of Durham, had occupied the family lands for nine hundred years, that they were feudal lords of Lampton Castle, and holding the high position of ancestors of hers when the Norman conqueror came over to divert the Englishry. I argued, cautiously and with mollifying circumlocutions, for one had to be careful when he was on that holy ground, and mustn't cavort that there was no particular merit in occupying a piece of land for nine hundred years with the friendly assistance of an entail anybody could do it with intellect or without therefore the entail was the thing to be proud of just the entail and nothing else consequently she was merely descended from an entail and she might as well be proud of being descended from a mortgage, whereas my own ancestry was quite a different and superior thing, because it had the addition of an ancestor, one Clemens, who did something, something which was very creditable to him, and satisfactory to me, in that he was a member of the court that tried Charles I and delivered him over to the executioner. Ostensibly this was chaff, but at the bottom it was not. I had a very real respect for that ancestor, and this respect has increased with the years, not diminished. He did what he could toward reducing the list of crowned shams of his day. However, I can say this for my mother, that I never heard her refer in any way to her gilded ancestry when any person not a member of the family was present, for she had good American sense. But with other Lamptons, whom I have known, it was different. Colonel Sellers was a Lampton, and a tolerably near relative of my mother's and when he was alive, poor old airy soul, one of the earliest things a stranger was likely to hear from his lips was some reference to the head of our line, flung off with a painful casualness that was wholly beneath criticism as a work of art. It compelled inquiry, of course. It was intended to compel it, then followed the whole disastrous history of how the Lambton heir came to this country a hundred and fifty years or so ago, disgusted with that foolish fraud, hereditary aristocracy, and married, and shut himself away from the world in the remoteness of the wilderness, 
and went to breeding ancestors of future American claimants. While at home in England, he was given up as dead, and his titles and estates turned over to his younger brother, usurper, and personally responsible for the perverse and unseatable usurpers of our day. And the colonel always spoke with studied and courtly deference of the claimant of his day, a second cousin of his, and referred to him with entire seriousness as the earl. The earl was a man of parts, and might have accomplished something for himself but for the calamitous accident of his birth. He was a Kentuckian, and a well-meaning man, but he had no money and no time to earn any, for all his time was taken up in trying to get me and others of the tribe to furnish him capital to fight his claim through the House of Lords with. He had all the documents, all the proofs he knew he could win, and so he dreamed his life away, always in poverty, sometimes in actual want, and died at last far from home, and was buried from a hospital by strangers who did not know he was an earl, for he did not look it. That poor fellow used to sign his letters Durham, and in them he would find fault with me for voting the Republican ticket, for the reason that it was unaristocratic, and by consequence unlamptonian and presently along would come a letter from some red-hot Virginian, some of my other branch, and abuse me bitterly for the same vote, on the ground that the Republican was an aristocratic party, and it was not becoming in the descendant of a regicide to train with that kind of animal. And so I used to almost wish I hadn't any ancestors, they were so much trouble to me. As I have said, we lived in a slaveholding community. Indeed, when slavery perished, my mother had been in daily touch with it for sixty years. Yet, kind hearted and compassionate as she was, I think she was not conscious that slavery was a bald, grotesque, and unwarrantable usurpation. She had never heard it assailed in any pulpit, but had heard it defended and sanctified in a thousand. Her ears were familiar with Bible texts that proved it, but if there were any that disapproved it, they had not been quoted by her pastors. As far as her experience went, the wise and the good and the holy were unanimous in the conviction that slavery was right, righteous, sacred, the peculiar pet of the deity, and a condition which the slave himself ought to be daily and nightly thankful for. Manifestly, training and association can accomplish strange miracles. As a rule, our slaves were convinced and content so doubtless are the far more intelligent slaves of a monarchy. They revere and approve their masters, the monarch and the noble, and recognize no degradation in the fact that they are slaves, slaves with the name blinked and less respectworthy than were our black ones, if to be a slave by meek consent is baser than to be a slave by compulsion, and doubtless it is. However, there was nothing about the slavery of the Hannibal region to rouse one's dozing humane instincts to activity. It was the mild domestic slavery, not the brutal plantation article. Cruelties were very rare, and exceedingly and wholesomely unpopular to separate and sell the members of a slave family to different masters was a thing not well liked by the people, and so it was not often done, except in the settling of estates. I have no recollection of ever seeing a slave auction in that town, 
but I am suspicious that that is because the thing was a common and commonplace spectacle, not an uncommon and impressive one. I vividly remember seeing a dozen black men and women chained to one another once and lying in a group on the pavement awaiting shipment to the southern slave market. Those were the saddest faces I have ever seen. Chained slaves could not have been a common sight, or this picture would not have made so strong and lasting an impression upon me. The nigger trader was loathed by everybody. He was regarded as a sort of human devil who bought and conveyed poor helpless creatures to hell for to our whites and blacks alike the southern plantation was simply hell. No milder name could describe it. If the threat to sell an incorrigible slave down the river would not reform him, nothing would. His case was past cure. It is commonly believed that an infallible effect of slavery was to make such as lived in its midst hard-hearted. I think it had no such effect, speaking in general terms. I think it stupefied everybody's humanity as regarded the slave, but stopped there. There were no hard-hearted people in our town. I mean, there were no more than would be found in any other town of the same size in any other country. And in my experience, hard-hearted people are very rare everywhere. End of section 11. Jane Lampton Clemens. Section 12 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Playing Bear, Herrings, Jim Wolf and the Cats, written about 1898. This was in 1849. I was 14 years old then. We were still living in Hannibal, Missouri, on the banks of the Mississippi, in the new frame house built by my father five years before. That is, some of us lived in the new part, the rest in the old part back of it and attached to it. In the autumn my sister gave a party and invited all the marriageable young people of the village. I was too young for this society and was too bashful to mingle with young ladies anyway. Therefore I was not invited, at least not for the whole evening. Ten minutes of it was to be my whole share. I was to do the part of a bear in a small fairy tale. I was to be disguised all over in a close-fitting brown hairy stuff proper for a bear. About half-past ten I was told to go to my room and put on this disguise, and be ready in half an hour. I started, but changed my mind, for I wanted to practice a little, and that room was very small. I crossed over to the large unoccupied house on the corner of Main Street, unaware that a dozen of the young people were also going there to dress for their parts. I took the little black boy, Sandy, with me, and we selected a roomy and empty chamber on the second floor. We entered it talking, and this gave a couple of half-dressed young ladies an opportunity to take refuge behind a screen undiscovered. Their gowns and things were hanging on hooks behind the door, but I did not see them. It was Sandy that shut the door but all his heart was in the theatricals, and he was unlikely to notice them as I was myself. This was a rickety screen with many holes in it, but as I did not know there were girls behind it, I was not disturbed by that detail. If I had known, I could not have undressed in the flood of cruel 
moonlight that was pouring in at the curtainless windows. I should have died of shame. Untroubled by apprehensions, I stripped to the skin and began my practice. I was full of ambition. I was determined to make a hit. I was burning to establish a reputation as a bear and get further engagements. So I threw myself into my work with an abandon that promised great things. I capered back and forth from one end of the room to the other on all fours, Sandy applauding with enthusiasm. I walked upright and growled and snapped and snarled. I stood on my head. I flung handsprings. I danced a lubberly dance with my paws bent and my imaginary snout sniffing from side to side. I did everything a bear could do, and many things which no bear could ever do, and no bear with any dignity would want to do anyway. And, of course, I never suspected that I was making a spectacle of myself to anyone but Sandy. At last, standing on my head, I paused in that attitude to take a minute's rest. There was a moment's silence, then Sandy spoke up with excited interest and said, "'Ma Sam, has you ever seen a dried herring?' "'No. What is that?' "'It's a fish.' "'Well, what of it? Anything peculiar about it?' "'Yes, sir. You bet you day is. Day eats em innards and all.' There was a smothered burst of feminine snickers from behind the screen. All the strength went out of me, and I toppled forward like an undermined tower, and brought the screen down with my weight, burying the young ladies under it. In their fright they discharged a couple of piercing screams, and possibly others, but I did not wait to count. I snatched my clothes and fled to the dark hall below, Sandy following. I was dressed in half a minute and out the back way. I swore Sandy to eternal silence, then we went away and hid until the party was over. The ambition was all out of me. I could not have faced that giddy company after my adventure, for there would be two performers there who knew my secret and would be privately laughing at me all the time. I was searched for, but not found, and the bear had to be played by a young gentleman in his civilized clothes. The house was still and everybody asleep when I finally ventured home. I was very heavy-hearted and full of a bitter sense of disgrace. Pinned to my pillow, I found a slip of paper which bore a line which did not lighten my heart, but only made my face burn. It was written in a laboriously disguised hand, and these were its mocking terms. You probably couldn't have played bear, but you played bear very well, oh, very, very well. We think boys are rude, unsensitive animals, but it is not so in all cases. Each boy has one or two sensitive spots, and if you can find out where they are located, you have only to touch them and you can scorch him as with fire. I suffered miserably over that episode. I expected that the facts would be all over the village in the morning, but it was not so. The secret remained confined to the two girls and Sandy and me. That was some appeasement of my pain, but it was far from sufficient. The main trouble remained. I was under four mocking eyes, and it might as well have been a thousand, for I suspected all girls' eyes of being the ones I so dreaded. During several weeks 
I could not look any young lady in the face. I dropped my eyes in confusion when any one of them smiled upon me and gave me greeting. I said to myself, that is one of them, and got quickly away. Of course I was meeting the right girls everywhere, but if they ever let slip any betraying sign I was not bright enough to catch it. When I left Hannibal four years later the secret was still a secret. I had never guessed those girls out, and was no longer hoping or expecting to do it. One of the dearest and prettiest girls in the village at the time of my mishap was one whom I will call Mary Wilson, because that was not her name. She was twenty years old. She was dainty and sweet, peach-blooming and exquisite, gracious and lovely in character. I stood in awe of her, for she seemed to me to be made out of angel clay and rightfully unapproachable by just any unholy, ordinary kind of boy like me. I probably never suspected her. But the scene changes to Calcutta forty-seven years later. It was in 1896. I arrived there on a lecturing trip. As I entered the hotel, a vision passed out of it, clothed in the glory of the Indian sunshine, the Mary Wilson of my long-vanished boyhood. It was a startling thing. Before I could recover from the pleasant shock and speak to her, she was gone. I thought maybe I had seen an apparition, but it was not so. She was flesh. She was the granddaughter of the other Mary. The other Mary, now a widow, was upstairs, and presently sent for me. She was old and gray-haired, but she looked young and was very handsome. We sat down and talked. We steeped our thirsty souls in the reviving wine of the past, the pathetic past, the beautiful past, the dear and lamented past. We uttered the names that had been silent upon our lips for fifty years, and it was as if they were made of music. With reverent hands we unburied our dead, the mates of our youth, and caressed them with our speech. We searched the dusty chambers of our memories, and dragged forth incident after incident, episode after episode, folly after folly, and laughed with such good laughs over them, with the tears running down. And finally Mary said, suddenly and without any leading up, Tell me, what is the special peculiarity of dried herrings? It seemed a strange question at such a hallowed time as this, and so inconsequential, too. I was a little shocked, and yet I was aware of a stir of some kind away back in the deeps of my memory somewhere. It set me to musing, thinking, searching. Dried herrings? Dried herrings? The peculiarity of dry... I glanced up. Her face was grave, but there was a dim and shadowy twinkle in her eye which, all of a sudden, I knew, and far away down in the hoary past I heard a remembered voice murder, "'Day eat some innards and all!' "'At last I found one of you, anyway. Who was the other girl?' But she drew the line there. She wouldn't tell me. But a boy's life is not all comedy. Much of the tragic enters into it. The drunken tramp, mentioned elsewhere, who was burned up in the village jail, lay upon my conscience a hundred nights afterward, and filled them with hideous dreams, dreams in which I saw his appealing face as I had seen it, 
in the pathetic reality pressed against the window bars with the red hell glowing behind him a face which seemed to say to me if you had not given me the matches this would not have happened you are responsible for my death i was not responsible for it for i had meant him no harm but only good when i let him have the matches but no matter mine was a trained presbyterian conscience and knew but the one duty to hunt and harry its slave upon all pretexts and on all occasions particularly when there was no sense nor reason in it the tramp who was to blame suffered ten minutes i who was not to blame suffered three months the shooting down of poor old smar in the main street at noonday supplied me with some more dreams and in them i always saw again the grotesque closing picture the great family bible spread open on the profane old man's breast by some thoughtful idiot and rising and sinking to the labored breathings and adding the torture of its leaden weight to the dying struggles we are curiously made in all the throng of gaping and sympathetic onlookers there was not one with common sense enough to perceive that an anvil would have been in better taste there than the bible less open to sarcastic criticism and swifter in its atrocious work in my nightmares i gasped and struggled for breath under the crush of that vast book for many a night all within the space of a couple of years we had two or three other tragedies and i had the ill luck to be too near by on each occasion there was the slave man who was struck down with a chunk of slag for some small offense i saw him die and the young californian immigrant who was stabbed with a bowie knife by a drunken comrade i saw the red life gush from his breast and the case of the rowdy young brothers and their harmless old uncle one of them held the old man down with his knees on his breast while the other one tried repeatedly to kill him with an allen revolver which wouldn't go off i happened along just then of course then there was the case of the young californian immigrant who got drunk and proposed to raid the welshman's house all alone one dark and threatening night this house stood halfway up holliday's hill and its sole occupants were a poor but quite respectable widow and her blameless daughter the invading ruffian woke the whole village with his ribald yells and coarse challenges and obscenities i went up there with a comrade john briggs i think to look and listen the figure of the man was dimly visible the women were on their porch not visible in the deep shadow of its roof but we heard the elder woman's voice she had loaded an old musket with slugs and she warned the man that if he stayed where he was while she counted ten it would cost him his life she began to count slowly he began to laugh he stopped laughing at six then through the deep stillness in a steady voice followed the rest of the tale seven eight nine a long pause we holding our breaths ten a red spout of flame gushed out into the night and the man dropped with his breast riddled to rags then the rain and the thunder burst loose and the waiting town swarmed up the hill in the glare of the lightning like an invasion of ants 
those people saw the rest. I had had my share and was satisfied. I went home to dream and was not disappointed. My teaching and training enabled me to see deeper into these tragedies than an ignorant person could have done. I knew what they were for. I tried to disguise it from myself, but down in the secret deeps of my troubled heart I knew, and I knew I knew. They were inventions of providence to beguile me to a better life. It sounds curiously innocent and conceited now, but to me there was nothing strange about it. It was quite in accordance with the thoughtful and judicious ways of providence as I understood them. It would not have surprised me, nor even overflattered me, if providence had killed off that whole community in trying to save an asset like me. Educated as I had been, it would have seemed just the thing, and well worth the expense. Why Providence should take such an anxious interest in such a property, that idea never entered my head, and there was no one in that simple hamlet who would have dreamed of putting it there. For one thing, no one was equipped with it. It is quite true I took all the tragedies to myself and tallied them off in turn as they happened, saying to myself in each case, with a sigh, another one gone, and on my account. This ought to bring me to repentance. The patience of God will not always endure. And yet privately I believed it would. That is, I believed it in the daytime, but not in the night. With the going down of the sun my faith failed, and the clammy fears gathered about my heart. It was then that I repented. Those were awful nights, nights of despair, nights charged with the bitterness of death. After each tragedy I recognized the warning and repented, repented and begged, begged like a coward, begged like a dog, and not in the interest of those poor people who had been extinguished for my sake, but only in my own interest. It seems selfish when I look back on it now. My repentances were very real, very earnest, and after each tragedy they happened every night for a long time. But as a rule they could not stand the daylight. They faded out and shredded away and disappeared in the glad splendor of the sun. They were the creatures of fear and darkness, and they could not live out of their own place. The day gave me cheer and peace, and at night I repented again. In all my boyhood life I am not sure that I ever tried to lead a better life in the daytime, or wanted to. In my age I should never think of wishing to do such a thing, but in my age, as in my youth, night brings me many a deep remorse. I realize that from the cradle up I have been like the rest of the race, never quite sane in the night, when Injun Joe died, but never mind. Somewhere I have already described what a raging hell of repentance I passed through then. I believe that for months I was as pure as the driven snow after dark. Jim Wolf and the Cats it was back in those far distant days, 1848 or 49, that Jim Wolfe came to us. He was from a hamlet thirty or forty miles back in the country, and he brought all his native sweetnesses and gentlenesses and simplicities with him. He was approaching seventeen, 
a grave and slender lad, trustful, honest, honorable, a creature to love and cling to, and he was incredibly bashful. He was with us a good while, but he could never conquer that peculiarity. He could not be at ease in the presence of any woman, not even in my good and gentle mother's, and as to speaking to any girl, it was wholly impossible. He sat perfectly still one day. There were ladies chatting in the room, while a wasp up his leg stabbed him cruelly a dozen times, and all the sign he gave was a slight wince for each stab and the tear of torture in his eye. He was too bashful to move. It is to this kind that untoward things happen. My sister gave a candy pull on a winter's night. I was too young to be of the company, and Jim was too diffident. I was sent up to bed early, and Jim followed of his own motion. His room was in the new part of the house, and his window looked out on the roof of the L. Annex. That roof was six inches deep in snow, and the snow had an ice crust upon it which was as slick as glass. Out of the comb of the roof projected a short chimney, a common resort for sentimental cats on moonlight nights, and this was a moonlight night. Down at the eaves, below the chimney, a canopy of dead vines spread away to some posts, making a cozy shelter, and after an hour or two the rollicking crowd of young ladies and gentlemen grouped themselves in its shade, with their saucers of liquid and piping hot candy disposed about them on the frozen ground to cool. There was joyous chafing and joking and laughter, peal upon peal of it. About this time a couple of old disreputable tomcats got up on the chimney and started a heated argument about something. Also about this time I gave up trying to get to sleep and went visiting to Jim's room. He was awake and fuming about the cats and their intolerable yowling. I asked him, mockingly, why he didn't climb out and drive them away. He was nettled, and said over boldly that for two cents he would. It was a rash remark, and was probably repented of before it was fairly out of his mouth, but it was too late. He was committed. I knew him, and I knew he would rather break his neck than back down if I egged him on judiciously. Oh, of, of course you would. Who's doubting it? It galled him, and he burst out with sharp irritation. Maybe you doubt it. I? Oh, no, I shouldn't think of such a thing. You are always doing wonderful things with your mouth. He was in a passion now. He snatched on his yarn socks and began to raise the window, saying in a voice quivering with anger, You think I doesn't, you do. Think what you blame, please. I don't care what you think. I'll show you. The window made him rage. It wouldn't stay up. I said, Never mind, I'll hold it. Indeed, I would have done anything to help. I was only a boy and was already in a radiant heaven of anticipation. He climbed carefully out, clung to the window-sill until his feet were safely placed, then began to pick his perilous way on all fours along the glassy comb, a foot and a hand on each side of it. I believe I enjoy it now as much as I did then, yet it is nearly fifty years ago. The frosty breeze flapped his short shirt about his lean legs, the crystal roof shone like polished marble in the intense glory of the moon. The unconscious cats sat erect upon the chimney, 
alertly watching each other, lashing their tails and pouring out their hollow grievances, and slowly and cautiously Jim crept on, flapping as he went, the gay and frolicsome young creatures under the vine canopy unaware, and outraging these solemnities with their misplaced laughter. Every time Jim slipped I had a hope, but always on he crept and disappointed it. At last he was within reaching distance. He paused, raised himself carefully up, measured his distance deliberately, then made a frantic grab at the nearest cat, and missed it. Of course he lost his balance. His heels flew up, he struck on his back, and like a rocket he darted down the roof, feet first, crashed through the dead vines, and landed in a sitting position in fourteen saucers of red-hot candy in the midst of all that party, and dressed as he was. This lad who could not look a girl in the face with his clothes on. There was a wild scramble and a storm of shrieks, and Jim fled up the stairs, dripping broken crockery all the way. The incident was ended, but I was not done with it yet, though I supposed I was. Eighteen or twenty years later I arrived in New York from California, and by that time I had failed in all my other undertakings, and had stumbled into literature without intending it. This was early in 1867. I was offered a large sum to write something for the Sunday Mercury, and I answered with the tale of Jim Wolf and the Cats. I also collected the money for it, twenty-five dollars. It seemed overpay, but I did not say anything about that, for I was not so scrupulous then as I am now. A year or two later Jim Wolf and the Cats appeared in a Tennessee paper in a new dress as to spelling. It was masquerading in a southern dialect. The appropriator of the tale had a wide reputation in the West and was exceedingly popular. Deservedly so, I think. He wrote some of the breeziest and funniest things I have ever read, and did his work with distinguished ease and fluency. His name has passed out of my memory. A couple of years went by, then the original story cropped up again and went floating around in the original spelling and with my name to it. Soon first one paper and then another fell upon me vigorously for stealing Jim Wolf and the Cats from the Tennessee Man. I got a merciless basting, but I did not mind it. It's all in the game. Besides, I had learned, a good while before that, that it is not wise to keep the fires going under a slander unless you can get some large advantage out of keeping it alive. Few slanders can stand the wear of silence. But I was not done with Jim and the cats yet. In 1873 I was lecturing in London in the Queen's Concert Rooms, Hanover Square, and living at the Langham Hotel, Portland Place. I had no domestic household on that side of the water, and no official household except George Dolby, lecture agent, and Charles Warren Stoddard, the Californian poet, now professor of English literature in the Roman Catholic University, Washington. Ostensibly, Stoddard was my private secretary. In reality, he was merely my comrade. I hired him in order to have his company. As secretary, there was nothing for him to do except to scrapbook the daily reports of the great trial of the Tickborn claimant for perjury. But he made a sufficient job out of that, for the reports filled 
six columns a day, and he usually postponed the scrapbooking until Sunday. Then he had forty-two columns to cut out and paste in, a proper labor for Hercules. He did his work well, but if he had been older and feebler it would have killed him once a week. Without doubt he does his literary lectures well, but also, without doubt, he prepares them fifteen minutes before he is due on his platform, and thus gets into them a freshness and sparkle which they might lack if they underwent the stalling process of overstudy. He was good company when he was awake. He was refined, sensitive, charming, gentle, generous, honest himself, and unsuspicious of other people's honesty, and I think he was the purest male I have known in mind and speech. George Dolby was something of a contrast to him, but the two were very friendly and sociable together, nevertheless. Dolby was large and ruddy, full of life and strength and spirits, a tireless and energetic talker, and always overflowing with good nature and bursting with jollity. It was a choice and satisfactory menagerie, this pensive poet and this gladsome gorilla. An indelicate story was a sharp distress to Stoddard. Dolby told him twenty-five a day. Dolby always came home with us after the lecture and entertained Stoddard till midnight. Me too. After he left I walked the floor and talked, and Stoddard went to sleep on the sofa. I hired him for company. Dolby had been agent for concerts and theaters and Charles Dickens and all sorts of shows and attractions for many years. He had known the human being in many aspects, and he didn't much believe in him. But the poet did. The waifs and estrays found a friend in Stoddard. Dolby tried to persuade him that he was dispensing his charities unworthily, but he was never able to succeed. One night a young American got access to Stoddard at the concert rooms and told him a moving tale. He said he was living on the Surrey side, and for some strange reason his remittances had failed to arrive from home. He had no money. He was out of employment and friendless. His girl wife and his new baby were actually suffering for food. For the love of heaven, could he lend him a sovereign until his remittance should resume? Stoddard was deeply touched and gave him a sovereign on my account. Dolby scoffed, but Stoddard stood his ground. Each told me his story later in the evening, and I backed Stoddard's judgment. Dolby said we were women in disguise, and not a sane kind of woman either. The next week the young man came again. His wife was ill with the pleurisy. The baby had the bots or something. I am not sure of the name of the disease. The doctor and the drugs had eaten up the money. The poor little family were starving. If Stoddard, in the kindness of his heart, could only spare him another sovereign, etc., etc., Stoddard was much moved and spared him a sovereign for me. Dolby was outraged. He spoke up and said to the customer, Now, young man, you are going to the hotel with us and state your case to the other member of the family. If you don't make him believe in you, I shan't honor this poet's drafts in your interest any longer, for I don't believe in you myself. The young man was quite willing. I found no fault in him. On the contrary, I believed in him at once, and was solicitous to heal the wounds inflicted by Dolby's too frank incredulity. Therefore, I did everything I could think of to cheer him up and entertain him, 
and make him feel at home and comfortable. I spun many yarns, among others the tale of Jim Wolf and the Cats. Learning that he had done something in a small way in literature, I offered to try to find a market for him in that line. His face lighted joyfully at that, and he said that if I could only sell a small manuscript to Tom Hood's annual for him, it would be the happiest event of his sad life, and he would hold me in grateful remembrance always. That was a most pleasant night for three of us, but Dolby was disgusted and sarcastic. Next week the baby died. Meantime, I had spoken to Tom Hood and gained his sympathy. The young man had sent his manuscript to him, and the very day the child died the money for the manuscript came, three guineas. The young man came with a poor little strip of crepe around his arm and thanked me, and said that nothing could have been more timely than that money, and that his poor little wife was grateful beyond words for the service I had rendered. He wept, and, in fact, Stoddard and I wept with him, which was but natural. Also, Dolby wept. At least he wiped his eyes and wrung out his handkerchief and sobbed stertorously and made other exaggerated shows of grief. Stoddard and I were ashamed of Dolby and tried to make the young man understand that he meant no harm. It was only his way. The young man said sadly that he was not minding it. His grief was too deep for other hurts, that he was only thinking of the funeral and the heavy expenses, which we cut that short and told him not to trouble about it, leave it all to us. Send the bills to Mr. Dolby, and, yes, said Dolby, with a mock tremor in his voice, send them to me, and I will pay them. What are you going? You must not go alone in your worn and broken condition. Mr. Stoddard and I will go with you. Come, Stoddard, we will comfort the bereaved mamma and get a lock of the baby's hair. It was shocking. We were ashamed of him again, and said so. But he was not disturbed. He said, Oh, I know this kind. The woods are full of them. I'll make this offer. If he will show me his family, I will give him twenty pounds. Come. The young man said he would not remain to be insulted, and he said good night and took his hat. But Dolby said, he would go with him and stay by him until he found the family. Stoddard went along to soothe the young man and modify Dolby. They drove across the river and all over Southwark, but did not find the family. At last the young man confessed that there wasn't any. The thing he sold to Tom Hood's annual for three guineas was Jim Wolf and the Cats and he did not put my name to it. So that small tale was sold three times. I am selling it again now. It is one of the best properties I have come across. End of section 12. Playing Bear, Herrings, Jim Wolf and the Cats. Written about 1898. Section 13 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. McFarlane. Written about 1898. When I was turned twenty, I wandered to Cincinnati and was there several months. Our boarding house crew was made up of commonplace people of various ages and sexes. They were full of bustle frivolity, chatter, and the joy of life, and were good-natured, clean-minded, and well-meaning. But they were oppressively uninteresting for all of that, with one exception. This was McFarlane, a Scotchman. 
He was forty years old, just double my age, but we were opposite in most ways and comrades from the start. I always spent my evenings by the wood fire in his room, listening in comfort to his tireless talk and to the dulled complainings of the winter storms until the clock struck ten. At that hour he grilled a smoked herring, after the fashion of an earlier friend in Philadelphia, the Englishman Sumner. His herring was his nightcap, and my signal to go. He was six feet high and rather lank, a serious and sincere man. He had no humor, nor any comprehension of it. He had a sort of smile whose office was to express his good nature, but if I ever heard him laugh, the memory of it is gone from me. He was intimate with no one in the house but me, though he was courteous and pleasant to all. He had two or three dozen weighty books, philosophies, histories, and scientific works, and at the head of this procession were his Bible and his dictionary. After his herring he always read two or three hours in bed. Diligent talker as he was, he seldom said anything about himself. To ask him a personal question gave him no offense, nor the asker any information. He merely turned the matter aside and flowed placidly on about other things. He told me once that he had had hardly any schooling, and that such learning as he had he had picked up for himself. That was his whole biographical revelation, I believe. Whether he was bachelor, widower, or grass-widower remained his own secret. His clothes were cheap, but neat, and caretakingly preserved. Ours was a cheap boarding-house. He left the house at six mornings, and returned to it toward six evenings. His hands were not soft, so I reasoned that he worked at some mechanical calling ten hours a day for humble wages, but I never knew. As a rule, technicalities of a man's vocation and figures and metaphors drawn from it slip out in his talk and reveal his trade, but if this ever happened in Macfarlane's case I was none the wiser, although I was constantly on the watch during half a year for those very betrayals. It was mere curiosity, for I didn't care what his trade was, but I wanted to detect it, in true detective fashion, and was annoyed because I couldn't do it. I think he was a remarkable man to be able to keep the shop out of his talk all that time. There was another noteworthy feature about him. He seemed to know his dictionary from beginning to end. He claimed that he did. He was frankly proud of this accomplishment, and said I would not find it possible to challenge him with an English word which he could not promptly spell and define. I lost much time trying to hunt up a word which would beat him, but those weeks were spent in vain, and I finally gave it up which made him so proud and happy that I wished I had surrendered earlier. He seemed to be as familiar with his Bible as he was with his dictionary. It was easy to see that he considered himself a philosopher and a thinker. His talk always ran upon grave and large questions, and I must do him the justice to say that his heart and his conscience were in his talk, and that there was no appearance of reasoning and arguing for the vain pleasure of hearing himself do it. Of course his thinking and reasoning and philosophizing were those of a but partly taught and wholly untrained mind, yet he hit by accident upon some curious and striking things. For instance, 
The time was the early part of 1856, fourteen or fifteen years before Mr. Darwin's Descent of Man startled the world, yet here was Macfarlane talking the same idea to me, there in the boarding-house in Cincinnati. The same general idea, but with difference. Macfarlane considered that the animal life in the world was developed in the course of eons of time from a few microscopic seed germs, or perhaps one microscopic seed germ deposited upon the globe by the Creator in the dawn of time, and that this development was progressive upon an ascending scale toward ultimate perfection until man was reached, and that, then, the progressive scheme broke pitifully down, and went to wreck and ruin. He said that man's heart was the only bad heart in the animal kingdom, that man was the only animal capable of feeling malice, envy, vindictiveness, revengefulness, hatred, selfishness, the only animal that loved drunkenness, almost the only animal that could endure personal uncleanliness and a filthy habitation, the sole animal in whom was fully developed the base instinct called patriotism, the sole animal that robs, persecutes, oppresses, and kills members of his own immediate tribe, the sole animal that steals and enslaves the members of any tribe. He claimed that man's intellect was a brutal addition to him, and degraded him to a rank far below the plane of the other animals, and that there was never a man who did not use his intellect daily all his life to advantage himself at other people's expense. The divinest divine reduced his domestics to humble servitude under him by advantage of his superior intellect, and those servants in turn were above a still lower grade of people, by force of brains, that were still a little better than theirs. End of section 13. Macfarlane. Written about 1898. Section 14 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Old Lecture Days in Boston, written in 1898. Nasby and others of Redpath's Lecture Bureau. I remember Petroleum Vesuvius Nasby, Locke, very well. When the Civil War began, he was on the staff of the Toledo Blade, an old and prosperous and popular weekly newspaper. He let fly a Nasby letter, and it made a fine strike. He was famous at once. He followed up his new lead and gave the Copperheads and the Democratic Party a most admirable hammering every week, and his letters were copied everywhere, from the Atlantic to the Pacific and read and laughed over by everybody, at least everybody except particularly dull and prejudiced Democrats and Copperheads. For suddenness, Nasby's fame was an explosion. For universality, it was atmospheric. He was soon offered a company. He accepted and was straightway ready to leave for the front but the governor of the state was a wiser man than were the political masters of Kurnor and Petofi, for he refused to sign Nasby's commission and ordered him to stay at home. He said that in the field Nasby would be only one soldier, handling one sword, but at home, with his pen, he was an army, with artillery. Nasby obeyed, and went on writing his electric letters. I saw him first when I was on a visit to Hartford. I think it was three or four years after the war. The opera house was packed and jammed with people to hear him deliver his lecture on 
cussed by Canaan. He had been on the platform with that same lecture and no other during two or three years, and it had passed his lips several hundred times. Yet even now he could not deliver any sentence of it without his manuscript, except the opening one. His appearance on the stage was welcomed with a prodigious burst of applause, but he did not stop to bow or in any other way acknowledge the greeting, but strode straight to the reading desk, spread his portfolio open upon it, and immediately petrified himself into an attitude which he never changed during the hour and a half occupied by his performance, except to turn his leaves, his body bent over the desk, rigidly supported by his left arm as by a stake, the right arm lying across his back. About once in two minutes his right arm swung forward, turned a leaf, then swung to its resting place on his back again, just the action of a machine, and suggestive of one, regular, recurrent, prompt, exact. You might imagine you heard it clash. He was a great burly figure, uncouthly and provincially clothed, and he looked like a simple old farmer. I was all curiosity to hear him begin. He did not keep me waiting. The moment he had crutched himself upon his left arm, lodged his right upon his back, and bent himself over his manuscript, he raised his face slightly, flashed a glance upon the audience, and bellowed this remark in a thundering bull voice. We are all descended from grandfathers. Then he went right on roaring to the end, tearing his ruthless way through the continuous applause and laughter, and taking no sort of account of it. His lecture was a volleying and sustained discharge of bull's-eye hits, with the slave power and its northern apologists for target, and his success was due to his matter, not his manner, for his delivery was destitute of art, unless a tremendous and inspiring earnestness and energy may be called by that name. The moment he had finished his piece he turned his back and marched off the stage with the seeming of being not personally concerned with the applause that was booming behind him. He had the constitution of an ox, and the strength and endurance of a prize-fighter. Express trains were not very plenty in those days. He missed a connection, and in order to meet this Hartford engagement he had traveled two-thirds of a night and a whole day in a cattle-car. It was midwinter. He went from the cattle-car to his reading-desk without dining, yet on the platform his voice was powerful, and he showed no signs of drowsiness or fatigue. He sat up talking and supping with me until after midnight, and then it was I that had to give up, not he. He told me that in his first season he read his Cussed by Canaan twenty-five nights a month for nine successive months. No other lecturer ever matched that record, I imagine. He said that as one result of repeating his lecture two hundred and twenty-five nights straight along, he was able to say its opening sentence without glancing at his manuscript, and sometimes even did it, when in a daring mood. And there was another result. He reached home the day after his long campaign, and was sitting by the fire in the evening, musing, when the clock broke into his reverie by striking eight. Habit is habit, and before he realized where he was he had thundered out, We are all descended from grandfathers. 
I began as a lecturer in 1866 in California and Nevada. In 1867 lectured in New York once and in the Mississippi Valley a few times. In 1868 made the whole western circuit and in the two or three following seasons added the eastern circuit to my route. We had to bring out a new lecture every season, now Nasby with the rest, and exposed it in the star course, Boston, for a first verdict before an audience of 2,500 in the old music hall, for it was by that verdict that all the lyceums in the country determined the lecture's commercial value. The campaign did not really begin in Boston, but in the towns around. We did not appear in Boston until we had rehearsed about a month in those towns, and made all the necessary corrections and revisings. This system gathered the whole tribe together in the city early in October, and we had a lazy and sociable time there for several weeks. We lived at Young's Hotel. We spent the days in Redpath's bureau, smoking and talking shop, and early in the evenings we scattered out among the towns and made them indicate the good and poor things in the new lectures. The country audience is the difficult audience. A passage which it will approve with a ripple will bring a crash in the city. A fair success in the country means a triumph in the city. And so, when we finally stepped on to the great stage at the music hall, we already had the verdict in our pocket. But sometimes lecturers who were new to the business did not know the value of trying it on the dog, and these were apt to come to the music hall with an untried product. There was one case of this kind which made some of us very anxious when we saw the advertisement. Di Cordova, humorist, he was the man we were troubled about. I think he had another name, but I have forgotten what it was. He had been printing some dismally humorous things in the magazines. They had met with a deal of favor and given him a pretty wide name, and now he suddenly came poaching upon our preserve and took us by surprise. Several of us felt pretty unwell too unwell to lecture. We got outlying engagements postponed and remained in town. We took front seats in one of the great galleries, Nasby, Billings, and I, and waited. The house was full. When de Cordova came on, he was received with what we regarded as a quite overdone and almost indecent volume of welcome. I think we were not jealous, nor even envious, but it made us sick anyway. When I found he was going to read a humorous story from manuscript, I felt better and hopeful, but still anxious. He had a Dickens arrangement of tall gallows frame adorned with upholsteries, and he stood behind it under its overhead row of hidden lights. The whole thing had a quite stylish look and was rather impressive. The audience was so sure that he was going to be funny that they took a dozen of his first utterances on trust and laughed cordially, so cordially indeed that it was very hard for us to bear, and we felt very much disheartened. Still I tried to believe he would fail, for I saw that he didn't know how to read. Presently the laughter began to relax, then it began to shrink in area, 
and next to lose spontaneity, and next to show gaps between. The gaps widened. They widened more, more yet, still more. It was getting to be almost all gaps and silence with that untrained and unlively voice droning through them. Then the house sat dead and emotionless for a whole ten minutes. We drew a deep sigh. It ought to have been a sigh of pity for a defeated fellow craftsman, but it was not, for we were mean and selfish, like all the human race, and it was a sigh of satisfaction to see our unoffending brother fail. He was laboring now and distressed. He constantly mopped his face with his handkerchief, and his voice and his manner became a humble appeal for compassion, for help, for charity, and it was a pathetic thing to see. But the house remained cold and still, and gazed at him curiously and wonderingly. There was a great clock on the wall, high up. Presently the general gaze forsook the reader and fixed itself upon the clock face. We knew by dismal experience what that meant. We knew what was going to happen, but it was plain that the reader had not been warned and was ignorant. It was approaching nine now, half the house watching the clock, the reader laboring on. At five minutes to nine, twelve hundred people rose with one impulse and swept like a wave down the aisles toward the doors. The reader was like a person stricken with a paralysis. He stood choking and gasping for a few minutes, gazing in a white horror at that retreat. Then he turned drearily away and wandered from the stage with the groping and uncertain step of one who walks in his sleep. The management were to blame. They should have told him that the last suburban cars left at nine, and that half the house would rise and go then, no matter who might be speaking from the platform. I think de Cordova did not appear again in public. End of section 14. Old Lecture Days in Boston. Nasby and others of Redpath's Lecture Bureau. Written in 1898. Section 15 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Ralph Keeler. Written about 1898. He was a Californian. I probably knew him in San Francisco in the early days, about 1865, when I was a newspaper reporter. And Bret Hart, Ambrose Bierce, Charles Warren Stoddard, and Prentice Mulford were doing young literary work for Mr. Joe Lawrence's weekly periodical, The Golden Era. At any rate, I knew him in Boston a few years later, where he comraded with Howells, Aldridge, Boyle O'Reilly, and James T. Fields, and was greatly liked by them. I say he comraded with them, and that is the proper term, though he would not have given the relationship so familiar a name himself, for he was the modestest young fellow that ever was, and looked humbly up to those distinguished men from his lowly obscurity, and was boyishly grateful for the friendly notice they took of him, and frankly grateful for it. And when he got a smile and a nod from Mr. Emerson and Mr. Whittier and Holmes and Lowell and Longfellow, his happiness was the prettiest thing in the world to see. He was not more than twenty-four at this time, 
the native sweetness of his disposition had not been marred by cares and disappointments he was buoyant and hopeful and simple-hearted and full of the most engaging and unexacting little literary ambitions whomsoever he met became his friend and by some natural and unexplained impulse took him under protection he probably never had a home or a boyhood he had wandered to california as a little chap from somewhere or other and had cheerfully achieved his bread in various humble callings educating himself as he went along and having a good and satisfactory time about his various industries was clog dancing in a nigger show when he was about twenty years old he scraped together eighty-five dollars in greenbacks worth about half that sum in gold and on this capital he made the tour of europe and published an account of his travels in the atlantic monthly when he was about twenty-two he wrote a novel called gloverson and his silent partners and not only that but found a publisher for it but that was not really a surprising thing in his case for not even a publisher is hard-hearted enough to be able to say no to some people and ralph was one of those people his gratitude for a favor granted him was so simple and sincere and so eloquent and touching that a publisher would recognize that if there was no money in the book there was still a profit to be had out of it beyond the value of money and above money's reach there was no money in that book not a single penny but ralph keeler always spoke of his publisher as other people speak of divinities the publisher lost two or three hundred dollars on the book of course and knew he would lose it when he made the venture but he got much more than the worth of it back in the author's adoring admiration of him ralph had little or nothing to do and he often went out with me to the small lecture towns in the neighborhood of boston these lay within an hour of town and we usually started at six or thereabouts and returned to the city in the morning it took about a month to do these boston annexes and that was the easiest and pleasantest month of the four or five which constituted the lecture season the lyceum system was in full flower in those days and james redpath's bureau in school street boston had the management of it throughout the northern states and canada redpath farmed out the lectures in groups of six or eight to the lyceums all over the country at an average of about one hundred dollars a night for each lecture his commission was ten per cent each lecture appeared about a hundred and ten nights in the season there were a number of good drawing names in his list henry ward beecher anna dickinson john b goff horace greeley wendell phillips petroleum v nasby josh billings hayes the arctic explorer vincent the english astronomer parsons irish orator agassiz et al he had in his list twenty or thirty men and women of light consequence and limited reputation who wrought for fees ranging from twenty-five dollars to fifty dollars their names have perished long ago nothing but art could find them a chance on the platform redpath furnished that art all the lyceums wanted the big guns and wanted them yearningly longingly strenuously 
Redpath granted their prayers on this condition, for each house filler allotted them they must hire several of his house emptiers. This arrangement permitted the Lyceums to get through alive for a few years, but in the end it killed them all and abolished the lecture business. Beecher, Goff, Nasby, and Anna Dickinson were the only lecturers who knew their own value and exacted it. In towns their fee was $200 and $250, in cities $400. The Lyceum always got a profit out of these four, weather permitting, but generally lost it again on the house emptiers. There were two women who should have been house emptiers, Olive Logan and Kate Field, but during a season or two they were not. They charged one hundred dollars and were recognized house fillers for certainly two years. After that they were capable emptiers and were presently shelved. Kate Field had made a wide spasmodic notoriety in 1867 by some letters which she sent from Boston by telegraph to the Tribune about Dickens' readings there in the beginning of his triumphant American tour. These letters were a frenzy of praise, praise which approached idolatry, and this was the right and welcome key to strike, for the country was itself in a frenzy of enthusiasm about Dickens. Then the idea of telegraphing a newspaper letter was new and astonishing, and the wonder of it was in everyone's mouth. Kate Field became a celebrity at once. By and by she went on the platform, but two or three years had elapsed and her subject, Dickens, had now lost its freshness and its interest. For a while people went to see her because of her name, but her lecture was poor and her delivery repellently artificial. Consequently, when the country's desire to look at her had been appeased, the platform forsook her. She was a good creature, and the acquisition of a perishable and fleeting notoriety was the disaster of her life. To her it was infinitely precious, and she tried hard in various ways during more than a quarter of a century to keep a semblance of life in it, but her efforts were but moderately successful. She died in the Sandwich Islands, regretted by her friends and forgotten of the world. Olive Logan's notoriety grew out of only the initiated knew what. Apparently it was a manufactured notoriety, not an earned one. She did write and publish little things in newspapers and obscure periodicals, but there was no talent in them and nothing resembling it. In a century they would not have made her known. Her name was really built up out of newspaper paragraphs set afloat by her husband, who was a small-salaried minor journalist. During a year or two this kind of paragraphing was persistent. One could seldom pick up a newspaper without encountering it. It is said that Olive Logan has taken a cottage at Nahant and will spend the summer there. Olive Logan has set her face decidedly against the adoption of the short skirt for afternoon wear. The report that Olive Logan will spend the coming winter in Paris is premature. She has not yet made up her mind. Olive Logan was present at Wallach's on Saturday evening and was outspoken in her approval of the new piece. Olive Logan has so far recovered from her alarming illness 
that if she continues to improve her physicians will cease from issuing bulletins to-morrow the result of this daily advertising was very curious olive logan's name was so familiar to the simple public as was that of any celebrity of the time and people talked with interest about her doings and movements and gravely discussed her opinions now and then an ignorant person from the backwoods would proceed to inform himself and then there were surprises in store for all concerned who is olive logan the listeners were astonished to find that they couldn't answer the question it had never occurred to them to inquire into the matter what has she done the listeners were dumb again they didn't know they hadn't inquired well then how does she come to be celebrated oh it's about something i don't know what i never inquired but i supposed everybody knew for entertainment i often asked these questions myself of people who were glibly talking about that celebrity and her doings and sayings the questioned were surprised to find that they had been taking this fame wholly on trust and had no idea who olive logan was or what she had done if anything on the strength of this oddly created notoriety olive logan went on the platform and for at least two seasons the united states flocked to the lecture halls to look at her she was merely a name and some rich and costly clothes and neither of these properties had any lasting quality though for a while they were able to command a fee of one hundred dollars a night she dropped out of the memories of men a quarter of a century ago ralph keeler was pleasant company on my lecture flights out of boston and we had plenty of good talks and smokes in our rooms after the committee had escorted us to the inn and made their good night there was always a committee and they wore a silk badge of office they received us at the station and drove us to the lecture hall they sat in a row of chairs behind me on the stage minstrel fashion and in the earliest days their chief used to introduce me to the audience but these introductions were so grossly flattering that they made me ashamed and so i began my talk at a heavy disadvantage it was a stupid custom there was no occasion for the introduction the introducer was almost always an ass and his prepared speech a jumble of vulgar compliments and dreary effort to be funny therefore after the first season i always introduced myself using of course a burlesque of the time-worn introduction this change was not popular with committee chairmen to stand up grandly before a great audience of his townsmen and make his little devilish speech was the joy of his life and to have that joy taken from him was almost more than he could bear my introduction of myself was a most efficient starter for a while then it failed it had to be carefully and painstakingly worded and very earnestly spoken in order that all strangers present might be deceived into the supposition that i was only the introducer and not the lecturer also that the flow of overdone compliments might sicken those strangers then when the end was reached and the remark casually dropped that i was the lecturer and had been talking about myself 
the effect was very satisfactory but it was a good card for only a little while as i have said for the newspapers printed it and after that i could not make it go since the house knew what was coming and retained its emotions next i tried an introduction taken from my californian experiences it was gravely made by a slouching and awkward big miner in the village of red dog the house very much against his will forced him to ascend the platform and introduce me he stood thinking a moment then said i don't know anything about this man at least i know only two things one is he hasn't been in the penitentiary and the other is after a pause and almost sadly i don't know why that worked well for a while then the newspapers printed it and took the juice out of it and after that i gave up introductions altogether now and then keeler and i had a mild little adventure but none which couldn't be forgotten without much of a strain once we arrived late at a town and found no committee in waiting and no sleighs on the stand we struck up a street in the gay moonlight found a tide of people flowing along judged it was on its way to the lecture hall a correct guess and joined it at the hall i tried to press in but was stopped by the ticket taker ticket please i bent over and whispered it's all right i am the lecturer he closed one eye impressively and said loud enough for all the crowd to hear no you don't three of you got in up to now but the next lecturer that goes in here tonight pays of course we paid it was the least embarrassing way out of the trouble the very next morning keeler had an adventure about eleven o'clock i was sitting in my room reading the paper when he burst into the place all a-tremble with excitement and said come with me quick what is it what's happened don't wait to talk come with me we tramped briskly up the main street three or four blocks neither of us speaking both of us excited i in a sort of panic of apprehension and horrid curiosity then we plunged into a building and down through the middle of it to the farther end keeler stopped put out his hand and said look i looked but saw nothing except a row of books what is it keeler he said in a kind of joyous ecstasy keep on looking to the right farther farther to the right there see it gloverson and his silent partners and there it was sure enough this is a library understand public library and they've got it his eyes his face his attitude his gestures his whole being spoke his delight his pride his happiness it never occurred to me to laugh a supreme joy like that moves one the other way i was stirred almost to the crying point to see so perfect a happiness he knew all about the book for he had been cross-examining the librarian it had been in the library two years and the record showed that it had been taken out three times and read too said keeler see the leaves are all cut moreover the book had been bought not given it's on the record i think gloverson was published in san francisco other copies had been sold no doubt but this present sale was the only one keeler was certain of 
it seems unbelievable that the sale of an edition of one book could give an author this immeasurable peace and contentment but i was there and i saw it afterward keeler went out to ohio and hunted out one of osawatomie brown's brothers on his farm and took down in longhand his narrative of his adventures in escaping from virginia after the tragedy of eighteen fifty nine the most admirable piece of reporting i make no doubt that was ever done by a man destitute of a knowledge of shorthand writing it was published in the atlantic monthly and i made three attempts to read it but was frightened off each time before i could finish the tale was so vivid and so real that i seemed to be living those adventures myself and sharing their intolerable perils and the torture of it was so sharp that i was never able to follow the story to the end by and by the tribune commissioned keeler to go to cuba and report the facts of an outrage or an insult of some sort which the spanish authorities had been perpetrating upon us according to their well-worn habit and custom he sailed from new york in the steamer and was last seen alive the night before the vessel reached havana it was said that he had not made a secret of his mission but had talked about it freely in his frank and innocent way there were some spanish military men on board it may be that he was not flung into the sea still the belief was general that that was what had happened end of section fifteen ralph keeler written about eighteen ninety eight section sixteen of mark twain's autobiography this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman with help from ed henry and carla chapel of vienna beauties of the german language written in eighteen ninety eight vienna february third lectured for the benefit of a charity last night in the bursendorfer saal just as i was going on the platform a messenger delivered to me an envelope with my name on it and this written under it please read one of these to-night enclosed were a couple of newspaper clippings two versions of an anecdote one german the other english i was minded to try the german one on those people just to see what would happen but my courage weakened when i noticed the formidable look of the closing word and i gave it up a pity too for it ought to read well on the platform and get an encore that or a brickbat there is never any telling what a new audience will do their tastes are capricious the point of this anecdote is a justifiable jibe at the german long word and is not as much of an exaggeration as one might think the german long word is not a legitimate construction but an ignoble artificiality a sham it has no recognition by the dictionary and is not found there it is made by jumbling a lot of words into one in a quite unnecessary way it is a lazy device of the vulgar and a crime against the language nothing can be gained no valuable amount of space saved by jumbling the following words together on a visiting card mrs smith widow of the late commander-in-chief of the police department yet a german widow can persuade herself to do it without much trouble mrs late commander-in-chief of the police department's widow smith this is the english version of the anecdote a dresden paper the weidmann which thinks that there are kangaroos in south africa 
says the hottentots hottentotten put them in cages kotter provided with covers lattengitter to protect them from the rain the cages are therefore called lattengitter wetterkotter and the imprisoned kangaroo lattengitter wetterkotter beutelratter one day an assassin attentator was arrested who had killed a hottentot woman hottentottenmutter the mother of two stupid and stuttering children in stratertortel this woman in the german language is entitled hottentottenstrottertrottelmutter and her assassin takes the name hottentottenstrottermutter attentator the murderer was confined in a kangaroo's cage beutelratten lattengitter wetterkotter whence a few days later he escaped but fortunately he was recaptured by a hottentot who presented himself at the mayor's office with beaming face i have captured the beutelratter said he which one said the mayor we have several the attentater lattengitter wetterkotter beutelratter which attentater are you talking about about the hottentotten strotter trottel mutter attentator then why don't you say at once the hottentotten strottel mutter attentator lattengitter wetterkotter beutelratter end of section sixteen beauties of the german language section seventeen of mark twain's autobiography this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. A Viennese Procession, written Sunday, June 26, 1898, Carlton Leutgeben. I went in the eight o'clock train to Vienna to see the procession. It was a stroke of luck, for at the last moment I was feeling lazy and was minded not to go but when i reached the station five minutes late the train was still there a couple of friends were there also and so i went at leasing half an hour out we changed to a very long train and left for vienna with every seat occupied that was no sign that this was a great day for these people are not critical about shows they turn out for anything that comes along. Half an hour later we were driving into the city. No particular bustle anywhere. Indeed, less than is usual on an Austrian Sunday. Bunting flying and a decoration here and there, a quite frequent thing in this jubilee year. But as we passed the American embassy, I saw a couple of our flags out, and the minister and his men-servants arranging to have another one added. This woke me up. It seemed to indicate that something really beyond the common was to the fore. As we neared the bridge, which connects the first Pizirk with the third, a pronounced and growing life and stir were noticeable and when we entered the wide square where the schwarzenberg palace is there was something resembling a jam as far as we could see down the broad avenue of the park ring both sides of it were packed with people in their holiday clothes our cab worked its way across the square and then flew down empty streets all the way to liebenberggasse number seven the dwelling we were aiming for. It stands on the corner of that street and the park ring, and its balconies command a mile stretch of the latter avenue. By a trifle after nine we were in the shade of the awnings of the first-floor balcony with a dozen other guests and ready for the procession. Ready, but it would not start for an hour yet, and would not reach us for half an hour afterward. As to numbers, it would be a large matter, for by report it would march twenty-five thousand strong. 
But it isn't numbers that make the interest of a procession. I have seen a vast number of long processions which didn't pay. It is clothes that make a procession. Where you have those of the right pattern, you can do without length. Two or three months ago I saw one with the emperor and an archbishop in it, and the archbishop was being carried along under a canopied arrangement and had his skull-cap on, and the venerable emperor was following him on foot and bareheaded. Even if that had been the entire procession, it would have paid. I am old now, and may never be an emperor at all, at least in this world. I have been disappointed so many times that I am growing more and more doubtful and resigned every year, but if it ever should happen, the procession will have a fresh start for the archbishop for he will walk. The wait on the balcony was not dull. There was the spacious avenue stretching into the distance, right and left, to look at, with its double wall of massed humanity, an eager and excited lot, broiling in the sun, and a comforting spectacle to contemplate from the shade. That is, on our side of the street they were in the sun, but not on the other side, where the park is, there was dense shade there. They were good-natured people, but they gave the policemen plenty of trouble, for they were constantly surging into the roadway and being hustled back again. They were in fine spirits, yet it was said that the most of them had been waiting there in the jam three or four hours, and two-thirds of them were women and girls. At last a mounted policeman came galloping down the road in solitary state, a first sign that pretty soon the show would begin. After five minutes he was followed by a man on a decorated bicycle. Next a marshal's assistant sped by on a polished and shiny black horse, Five minutes later, distant strains of music. Five more, and far up the street, the head of the procession twinkles into view. That was a procession. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. According to my understanding, it was to be composed of shooting-match clubs from all over the Austrian Empire with a club or two from France and Germany as guests. What I had in my imagination was twenty-five thousand men in sober dress, drifting monotonously by, with rifles slung to their backs, a New York target excursion on a large scale. In my fancy I could see the colored brothers toting the ice-pails and targets, and swabbing off perspiration. But this was a different matter. One of the most engaging spectacles in the world is a Wagner opera force marching on to the stage, with its music braying and its banners flying. This was that spectacle infinitely magnified, and with the glories of the sun upon it, and a countless multitude of excited witnesses to wave the handkerchiefs and do the hurrahing. It was grand and beautiful and sumptuous, and no tinsel, no shams, no tin armor, no cotton velvet, no make-believe silk, no Birmingham oriental rugs. Everything was what it professed to be. It is the clothes that make a procession, and for these costumes all the centuries were drawn upon, even from times which were already ancient when Kaiser Rudolph himself was alive. There were bodies of spearmen with plain steel casks of a date a thousand years ago, 
other bodies in more ornamental casks of a century or two later and with breastplates added other bodies with chain mail elaborations some armed with crossbows some with the earliest crop of matchlocks still other bodies clothed in the stunningly picturesque plate armor and plumed great helmets of the middle of the sixteenth century and then there were bodies of men-at-arms in the darling velvets of the middle ages and nobles on horseback in the same doublets with huge puffed sleeves wide brigand hats with great plumes and the rich and effective colors old gold black and scarlet deep yellow black and scarlet brown black and scarlet a portly figure clothed like that with a two-handed sword as long as a billiard cue and mounted on a big draught horse finely caparisoned with the sun flooding the splendid colors a figure like that with fifty duplicates marching in his rear is procession enough all by itself yet that was merely a detail all the centuries were passing by passing by in glories of color and multiplicities of strange and quaint and curious and beautiful costumes not to be seen in this world now outside the opera and the picture books and now and then in the midst of this flowing tide of splendors appeared a sharply contrasting note a mounted committee in evening dress swallow-tails white kids and shiny new plug hats and right in their rear perhaps a hundred capering clowns in thunder and lightning dress or a band of silken pages out of ancient times plumed and capped and daggered dainty as rainbows and mincing along in flesh-colored tights and as handy at it too as if they had been born and brought up to it at intervals there was a great platform car bethroned and grandly canopied upholstered in silks carpeted with oriental rugs and freighted with girls clothed in gala costumes there were several military companies dressed in uniforms of various bygone periods among others one dating back a century and a half and another of andreas hoffer's time and region following this latter was a large company of men and women and girls dressed in the society fashions of a period stretching from the directory down to about eighteen forty a thing worth seeing among the prettiest and liveliest and most picturesque costumes in the pageant were those worn by regiments and regiments of peasants from the tyrol and bohemia and everywhere in the empire they are of ancient origin but are still worn to-day i have seen no procession which evoked more enthusiasm than this one brought out it would have made any country deliver its emotions for it was a most stirring sight to see at the end of this year i shall be sixty-three if alive and about the same if dead i have been looking at processions for sixty years and curiously enough all my really wonderful ones have come in the last three years one in india in ninety six the queen's record procession in london last year and now this one as an appeal to the imagination an object lesson synopsizing the might and majesty and spread of the greatest empire the world has seen the queen's procession stands first as a picture for the eye this one beats it and in this regard it even falls no very great way short perhaps of the jaipur pageant and that was a dream of enchantment 
End of section 17. A Viennese procession. Written Sunday, June 26, 1898. Carlton Leutgeben. Section 18 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Comment on Tautology and Grammar, written 1898, Vienna. May 6th. I do not find that the repetition of an important word a few times, say three or four times, in a paragraph troubles my ear if clearness of meaning is best secured thereby. But tautological repetition, which has no justifying object, but merely exposes the fact that the writer's balance at the vocabulary bank has run short, and that he is too lazy to replenish it from the thesaurus, that is another matter. It makes me feel like calling the writer to account. It makes me want to remind him that he is not treating himself and his calling with right respect, and, incidentally, that he is not treating me with proper reverence. At breakfast this morning a member of the family read aloud an interesting review of a new book about Mr. Gladstone, in which the reviewer used the strong adjective delightful thirteen times. Thirteen times is a short review, not a long one. In five of the cases the word was distinctly the right one, the exact one, the best one our language can furnish, therefore it made no discord. But in the remaining cases it was out of tune. It sharped or flatted, one or the other, every time, and was as unpleasantly noticeable as is a false note in music. I looked in the thesaurus, and under a single head I found four words which would replace with true notes the false ones uttered by four of the misused delightfuls. And, of course, if I had hunted under related heads for an hour and made an exhaustive search, I should have found right words to a shade wherewith to replace the remaining delinquents. I suppose we all have our foibles. I like the exact word and clarity of statement, and here and there a touch of good grammar for picturesqueness. But that reviewer cares for only the last mentioned of these things. His grammar is foolishly correct, offensively precise. It flaunts itself in the reader's face all along, and struts, and smirks, and shows off, and is in a dozen ways irritating and disagreeable. To be serious, I write good grammar myself, but not in that spirit, I am thankful to say. That is to say, my grammar is of a high order, though not at the top. Nobody's is. Perfect grammar, persistent, continuous, sustained, is the fourth dimension, so to speak. Many have sought it, but none has found it. Even this reviewer, this purist, with all his godless airs, has made two or three slips. At least I think he has. I am almost sure, by witness of my ear, but cannot be positive, for I know grammar by ear only, not by note, not by the rules. A generation ago I knew the rules, knew them by heart, word for word, though not their meanings, and I still know one of them, the one which says, which says, uh, but, but never mind, it, it will come back to me presently. This reviewer even seems to know, or seems even to know, or seems to know even, how to put the word even in the right place, and the word only too. I do not like that kind of persons. I never knew one of them that came to any good. A person who is as self-righteous as that will do other things. 
I know this because I have noticed it many a time. I would never hesitate to injure that kind of a man if I could. When a man works up his grammar to that altitude, it is a sign. It shows what he will do if he gets a chance. It shows the kind of disposition he has. I have noticed it often. I knew one once that did a lot of things. They stop at nothing. But anyway, this grammatical coxcombs review is interesting, as I said before, and there is one sentence in it which tastes good in the mouth, so perfectly do the last five of its words report a something which we have all felt after sitting long over an absorbing book. The matter referred to is Mr. Gladstone's Boswellized conversations and his felicitous handling of his subject. One facet of the brilliant talker's mind flashes out on us after another till we tire with interest. That is clearly stated. We recognize that feeling. In the morning paper I find a sentence of another breed. There had been no death before the case of Cornelius Lean, which had arisen and terminated in death since the special rules had been drawn up. By the context, I know what it means, but you are without that light, and will be sure to get out of it a meaning which the writer of it was not intending to convey. End of section 18 Comment on Tautology and Grammar, written 1898, Vienna. Section 19 of Mark Twain's Autobiography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. Private History of a Manuscript That Came to Grief, written in 1900. It happened in London not recently, and yet not very many years ago. An acquaintance had proposed to himself a certain labor of love, and when he told me about it I was interested. His idea was to have a fine translation made of the evidence given in the Joan of Arc trials and rehabilitation, and placed before the English-speaking world. A translation had been made and published a great many years before, but had achieved no currency, and in fact was not entitled to any, for it was a piece of mere shoemaker work. But we should have the proper thing now, for this acquaintance of mine was manifestly a Joan enthusiast, and as he had plenty of money, and nothing to do but spend it, I took at par his remark that he had employed the most competent person in Great Britain to open this long-neglected mine and confer its riches upon the public. When he asked me to write an introduction for the work, my pleasure was complete, my vanity satisfied. At this moment, by good fortune, there chanced to fall into my hands a biographical sketch of me of so just and laudatory a character, particularly as concerned one detail, that it gave my spirit great contentment, and also set my head to swelling, I will not deny it, for it contained praises of the very thing which I most loved to hear praised, the good quality of my English. Moreover, they were uttered by four English and American literary experts of high authority. I am as fond of compliments as another, and as hard to satisfy as the average, but these satisfied me. I was as pleased as you would have been if they had been paid to you. It was under the inspiration of that great several-voiced verdict that I set about that introduction for Mr. X's book, and I said to myself that I would put a quality of English into it which would establish the righteousness of that judgment. I said I would treat the subject with the reverence and dignity due it, and would use plain, simple English words, 
and a phrasing undefiled by meretricious artificialities and affectations. I did the work on those lines, and when it was finished I said to myself, very privately, uh, but never mind, I delivered the manuscript to Mr. X, and went home to wait for the praises. On the way I met a friend. Being in a happy glow over this pleasant matter, I could not keep my secret. I wanted to tell somebody, and I told him. For a moment he stood curiously, measuring me up and down with his eye, without saying anything. Then he burst into a rude, coarse laugh, which hurt me very much. He followed this up by saying, He is going to edit the translations of the trials when it is finished? He? He said he would. Why, what does he know about editing? I don't know, but that is what he said. Do you think he isn't competent? Competent? He is innocent, vain, ignorant, good-hearted, red-headed, and all that. There isn't a better meaning man, but he doesn't know anything about literature, and has no literary training or experience. He can't edit anything. Well, all I know is he is going to try. Indeed he will. He is quite unconscious of his incapacities. He would undertake to edit Shakespeare if invited, and improve him too. The world cannot furnish his match for guileless self-complacency, yet I give you my word he doesn't know enough to come in when it rains. This gentleman's ability to judge was not to be questioned. Therefore, by the time I reached home, I had concluded to ask Mr. X not to edit the translation, but to turn that work over to some expert whose name on the title page would be valuable. Three days later Mr. X brought my introduction to me neatly type-copied. He was in a state of considerable enthusiasm, and said, Really, I find it quite good, quite, I assure you. There was an airy and patronizing complacency about this damp compliment which affected my head, and healthfully checked the swelling which was going on there. I said with cold dignity that I was glad the work had earned his approval. Oh, it has, I assure you, he answered with large cheerfulness. I assure you it quite has. I have gone over it very thoroughly yesterday and uh, last night and today, and I find it quite creditable, quite. I have made a few corrections, that is, suggestions, and do you mean to say that you have ed Oh, nothing of consequence, nothing of consequence, I assure you, he said, patting me on the shoulder and genially smiling. Only a few little things that needed just a mere polishing touch. Uh, nothing of consequence, I assure you. Let me have it back as soon as you can, so that I can pass it on to the printers and let them get to work on it while I am editing the translation. I sat idle and alone a time, thinking grieved thoughts, with the edited introduction unopened in my hand. I could not look at it yet a while. I had no heart for it, for my pride was deeply wounded. It was the only time I had been edited in thirty-two years, except by Mr. Howells, and he did not intrude his help, but furnished it at my request. And now here is a half-stranger, obscure, destitute of literary training, destitute of literary experience, destitute of... But I checked myself there, for that way lay madness. I must seek calm. For my self-respect's sake I must not descend to unrefined personalities. I must keep in mind that this person was innocent of injurious intent, and was honorably trying to do me a service. To feel harshly toward him, speak harshly of him, 
this was not the right Christian spirit. These just thoughts tranquilized me and restored to me my better self, and I opened the introduction at the middle. I will not deny it, my feelings rose to a hundred and four in the shade. The idea that this long-eared animal, this literary kangaroo, this illiterate hostler, with his skull full of axle-grease, this... But I stopped there, for this was not the right Christian spirit. I subjected myself to an hour of calming meditation, then carried the raped introduction to that friend whom I have mentioned above, and showed it to him. He fluttered the leaves over, then broke into another of those ill-bred laughs which are such a mar to him. "'I knew he would,' he said, as if gratified. "'Didn't I tell you he would edit Shakespeare?' "'Yes, I know. But I did not suppose he would edit me.' "'Oh, you didn't. Well, now you see that he is even equal to that. I tell you, there are simply no bounds to that man's irreverence.' "'I realize it now,' I said. "'Well, what are you going to do? Let him put it in his book? Either edited or unedited?' "'Of course not. That is well. You are becoming rational again. But what are your plans? You are not going to stop where you are, are you? You will write him a letter and give him hark from the tomb?' No, I shall write him a letter, but not in that spirit, I trust. Why, shan't you? Because he has meant me a kindness, and I hope I am not the man to reward him for it in that way. The friend looked me over a while, pensively, then said, Mark, I am ashamed of you. This is mere schoolgirl sentimentality. You ought to baste him. You know it yourself. I said I had no such feeling in my heart, and should put nothing of the kind in my letter. I shall point out his errors to him in gentleness, and in the unwounding language of persuasion. Many a literary beginner has been disheartened and defeated by the uncharitable word wantonly uttered. This one shall get none such from me. It is more Christian-like to do a good turn than an ill one, and you ought to encourage me in my attitude, not scoff at it. This man shall not be my enemy. I will make him my lasting and grateful friend. I felt that I was in the right, and I went home and began the letter, and found pleasure and contentment in the labor, for I had the encouragement and support of an approving conscience. The letter will be found in its proper place in this chapter of my autobiography. It follows. The Letter Dear Mr. X, I find on my desk the first two pages of Miss Z's translation, with your emendations marked in them. Thank you for sending them. I have examined the first page of my amended introduction, and will begin now and jot down some notes upon your corrections. If I find any changes which shall not seem to me to be improvements, I will point out my reasons for thinking so. In this way I may chance to be helpful to you, and thus profit you, perhaps, as much as you have desired to profit me. Notes. Section 1. First paragraph. Jeanne d'Arc. This is rather cheaply pedantic, and is not in very good taste. Joan is not known by that name among plain people of our race and tongue. I notice that the name of the deity occurs several times in the brief installment of the trials which you have favored me with, to be consistent, it will be necessary that you strike out God and put in Dieu. Do not neglect this. First line. What is the trouble with at thee? And why 
trial has some uninstructed person deceived you into the notion that there was but one instead of half a dozen amongst wasn't among good enough next half dozen corrections have you failed to perceive that by taking the word both out of its proper place you have made foolishness of the sentence and don't you see that your smug of which has turned that sentence into reporter's english quite why do you intrude that shop-worn favorite of yours where there is nothing useful for it to do can't you rest easy in your literary grave without it next sentence you have made no improvement in it did you change it merely to be changing something second paragraph now you have begun on my punctuation don't you realize that you ought not to intrude your help in a delicate art like that with your limitations and do you think you have added just the right smear of polish to the closing clause of the sentence second paragraph how do you know it was his own sword it could have been a borrowed one i am cautious in matters of history and you should not put statements in my mouth for which you cannot produce vouchers your other corrections are rubbish third paragraph ditto fourth paragraph your word directly is misleading it could be construed to mean at once plain clarity is better than ornate obscurity i note your sensitive marginal remark rather unkind to french feelings referring to moscow indeed i have not been concerning myself about french feelings but only about stating the facts i have said several uncourteous things about the french calling them a nation of ingrates in one place but you have been so busy editing commas and semicolons that you overlooked them and failed to get scared at them the next paragraph ends with a slur at the french but i have reasons for thinking you mistook it for a compliment it is discouraging to try to penetrate a mind like yours you ought to get it out and dance on it that would take some of the rigidity out of it and you ought to use it sometimes that would help if you had done this every now and then along through life it would not have petrified fifth paragraph as far i regard this as your masterpiece you are really perfect in the great art of reducing simple and dignified speech to clumsy and vapid commonplace sixth paragraph you have a singularly fine and aristocratic disrespect for homely and unpretending english every time i use go back you get out your polisher and slick it up to return return is suited only to the drawing-room it is ducal and says itself with a simper and a smirk seventh paragraph permission is ducal ducal and affected her great days were not over they were only half over didn't you know that haven't you read anything at all about joan of arc the truth is you do not pay any attention i told you on my very first page that the public part of her career lasted two years and you have forgotten it already you really must get your mind out and have it repaired you see yourself that it is all caked together eighth paragraph she rode away to assault and capture a stronghold very well but you do not tell us whether she succeeded or not you should not worry the reader with uncertainties like that i will remind you once more that clarity is a good thing in literature an apprentice cannot do better than keep this useful rule in mind closing sentences corrections which are not corrections ninth paragraph known history oh, that word is a polish which is too delicate for me there doesn't seem to be any sense in it 
This would have surprised me last week. Second sentence. It cost me an hour's study before I found out what it meant. I see now that it is intended to mean what it meant before. It really does accomplish its intent, I think, though in a most intricate and slovenly fashion. What was your idea in reframing it? Merely in order that you might add this to your other editorial contributions and be able to say to people that the most of the introduction was your work? I am afraid that that was really your sly and unparliamentary scheme. Certainly we do seem to live in a very wicked world. Closing sentence. There is your empty however again. I cannot think what makes you so flatulent. 2. In captivity. Remainder. It is curious and interesting to notice what an attraction a fussy, mincing, nickel-plated artificial word has for you. This is not well. Third sentence. But she was held to ransom. It wasn't a case of should have been, and it wasn't a case of if it had been offered. It was offered, and also accepted, as the second paragraph shows. You ought never to edit except when awake. Fourth sentence. Why do you wish to change that? It was more than demanded, it was required. Have you no sense of shades of meaning in words? Fifth sentence. Changing it to benefactress takes the dignity out of it. If I had called her a braggart, I suppose you would have polished her into a braggartess, with your curious and random notions about the English tongue. Closing sentence. Sustained is sufficiently nickel-plated to meet the requirements of your disease, I trust. Wholly adds nothing. The sentence means just what it meant before. In the rest of the sentence you sacrifice simplicity to airy fussiness. Second paragraph. It was not blood money, unteachable ass, any more than is the money that buys a house or a horse. It was an ordinary business transaction of the time, and was not dishonorable. With her hands, feet, and neck both chained, etc., the restricted word both cannot be applied to three things, but only to two. Fence, you lifted that word from further along, and with what valuable result? The next sentence, after your doctoring of it, has no meaning. The one succeeding it, after your doctoring of it, refers to nothing, wanders around in space, has no meaning and no reason for existing, and is by a shade or two more demented and twaddlesome than anything hitherto ground out of your strange and interesting editorial mill. Closing sentence. Neither for either. Have you now debauched the grammar to your taste? Third paragraph. It was sound English before you decayed it. Sell it to the museum. Fourth paragraph. I note the compliment you pay yourself, margined opposite the closing sentence, easier translation, but it has two defects. In the first place it is a mistranslation, and in the second place it translates half of the grace out of Joan's remark. Fifth paragraph. Why are you so prejudiced against fact and so indecently fond of fiction. Her generalship was not that of a tried and trained military experience, for she hadn't had any, and no one swore that she had had any. I had stated the facts. You should have reserved your fictions. Note, to be intelligible, that whole paragraph must consist of a single sentence, 
in breaking it up into several you have knocked the sense all out of it eighth paragraph when the flames leapt up and enveloped her frail form is handsome very handsome even elegant but it isn't yours you hooked it out of the costermonger's bride or the fire fiend's foe to take other people's things is not right and god will punish you parched lips how do you know they were why do you make statements which you cannot verify when you have no motive for it but to work in a word which you think is knobby three the rehabilitation their statements were taken down as evidence wonderful if you had failed to mention that particular many persons might have thought they were taken down as entertainment four the riddle of all time i note your marginal remark riddle anglis look in your spelling book we can understand how the genius was created etc by steady and congenial growth we can't understand anything of the kind genius is not created by any farming process it is born you are thinking of potatoes note whenever i say circumstances you change it to environment and you persistently change my that's into witches and my witches into that's this is merely silly you know second paragraph i note your marginal remark to comprehends i suppose someone has told you that repetition is tautology and then has left you to believe that repetition is always tautology but let it go with your limitations one would not be able to teach you how to distinguish between the repetition which isn't tautology and the repetition which is closing sentence your tipsy emendation when straightened up on its legs and examined is found to say this we fail to see her issue thus equipped and we cannot understand why that is to say she did not issue so equipped and you cannot make out why she didn't that is the riddle that defeats you labor at it as you may why if that had happened it wouldn't be a riddle at all except to you but a thing likely to happen to nearly anybody and not matter for astonishment to any intelligent person standing by at the time or later there is a riddle but you have mistaken the nature of it i cannot tell how labor at it as i may and i will try to point it out to you so that you can see some of it we do not fail to see her issue so equipped we do see her that is the whole marvel mystery riddle that she an ignorant country girl sprang upon the world equipped with amazing natural gifts is not the riddle it could have happened to you if you had been someone else but the fact that those talents were instantly and effectively usable without previous training is the mystery which we cannot master the riddle which we cannot solve do you get it third paragraph drunk five as profit and in every case realized the complete fulfillment how do you know she did that there is no testimony to back up that wild assertion i was particular not to claim that all her prophecies came true for that would have been to claim that we have her whole list whereas it is likely that she made some that failed and did not get upon the record people do not record prophecies that failed 
such is not the custom six her character comforted is a good change and quite sane but you are not playing fair you are getting some sane person to help you note when i wrote counseled her advised her that was tautology the two comprehends was a case of repetition which was not tautological but i am sure you will never be able to learn the difference note but she jeanne d'arc when presently she found etc that is the funniest yet and the commonplacest but it isn't original you got it out of how to write literary without any apprenticeship sixpence to the trade retail sevenpence farthing erased passage i note with admiration your marginal remark explaining your objection to it is it warrantable to assert that she bragged is it in good taste it was assuredly foreign to her character i will admit that my small effort at playfulness was not much of a pearl but such as it was i realize that i threw it into the wrong trough seven her face and form you have misunderstood me again i did not mean that the artist had several ideas and one prevailing one i meant that he had only one idea in that same sentence omits and forgets have just the same meaning have you any clear idea then why you made the change is it your notion that gross is an improvement on big perform an improvement on do inquiring an improvement on asking and in such wise an improvement on then or have you merely been seduced by the fine large sounds of those words are you incurably hostile to simplicity of speech and finally do you not see that you have edited all the dignity out of the paragraph and substituted simpering commonplace for it and that your addition at the end is a deliciously flat and funny anticlimax still i note your command in the margin insert this remark and i dutifully obey second paragraph exploited was worth a shilling there you have traded it for a word not worth tuppence apenny and got cheated and serves you right read rightly if it shocks you close of paragraph you have exploited another anticlimax and in the form too of an impudent advertisement of your book it seems to me that for a person of your elegance of language you are curiously lacking in certain other delicacies third paragraph i must reserve my thanks moreover is a parenthesis when interjected in that fashion a parenthesis is evidence that the man who uses it does not know how to write english or is too indolent to take the trouble to do it a parenthesis usually throws the emphasis upon the wrong word and has done it in this instance a man who will wantonly use a parenthesis will steal for these reasons i am unfriendly to the parenthesis when a man puts one into my mouth his life is no longer safe break another lance is a knightly and sumptuous phrase and i honor it for its hoary age and for the faithful service it has done in the prize composition of the schoolgirl but i have ceased from employing it since i got my puberty and must solemnly object to fathering it here and besides it makes me hint that i have broken one of those things before in honor of the maid 
an intimation not justified by the facts. I did not break any lances or other furniture. I only wrote a book about her. Truly yours, Mark Twain. It cost me something to restrain myself and say these smooth and half-flattering things to this immeasurable idiot, but I did it, and have never regretted it, for it is higher and nobler to be kind to even a shad like him than just. If we should deal out justice only in this world, who would escape? No, it is better to be generous, and in the end more profitable, for it gains gratitude for us, and love, and it is far better to have the love of a literary strumpet like this than the reproaches of his wounded spirit. Therefore I am glad I said no harsh things to him, but spared him the same as I would a tapeworm. It is reward enough for me to know that my children will be proud of their father for this when I am gone. I could have said hundreds of unpleasant things about this tadpole, but I did not even feel them. Note, the letter was not sent after all. The temptation was strong, but pity for the victim prevailed. The manuscript was, however, recalled, and later published in Harper's Magazine and in book form as St. Joan of Arc. End of section 19. Private history of a manuscript that came to grief, written in 1900, and the letter and notes.